Well, thank you very much indeed for that introduction. Um, and it's, it's good to be talking to our fellow geological uh, or geoprofessional colleagues uh, in South Africa. Um, you know, in South Africa, to some extent, uh, there's a lot of uh, cooperation between the engineering geologists and the geotechnical engineers, uh, but it's seldom that we have the privilege of, of uh, meeting uh, with the geological fraternity. And it reminds me significantly of what happens in Australia, where they have a single a geomechanics society, uh, which uh, uh, deals with everybody, rock mechanics, uh, uh, in fact, all, all geoprofessionals, rock mechanics, soil mechanics, uh, geotechnical engineers, geologists, uh, you name it, geophysicists, everybody is in the one Australian geomechanics society. So it's nice to be talking to you. Um, what I'm going to be talking to, about today is really uh, about uh, our heritage, uh, what has changed in the last 45 years that I've been in practice, um, what's improved, what hasn't improved, and what challenges we face. So I'd like to start off uh, with our very proud heritage uh, here in South Africa. And this is from a point of view of a practicing technical uh, engineer. And these are people who I've really admired and, and looked up to uh, during the course of my life. Uh, and I've seen them make a enormous contribution. Um, if we take a look at our magnificent country, these are the Kruetzwarberger uh, near Mikey's Rafir. Uh, and uh, we've got, uh, that's between, uh, well, coming up towards Prince Albert. Uh, and uh, if you look at that topography, you would wonder, uh, and think it's a totally impermeable or impenetrable barrier. Yet, between 1981 and, uh, sorry, 1881 and 1888, a period of near, near, near period of seven years, Thomas Bain constructed the Swartberg Pass. Now, if I look at some of our roads in South Africa, particularly the road between uh, Belfast and Mosharadorp, I think they've been working on that for the last seven years and they're still working on it and there's nowhere near completion. So this truly uh, was a remarkable feat. So we can add to our Hall of Fame in here in South Africa, um, Thomas Bain and his father, Andrew Geddes Bain. And Andrew Geddes Bain is credited with the first geological map of South Africa uh, in 1852. If we carry on and we start looking at the mining side and the pure geology side, uh, Hans Marinsky has made an enormous contribution, particularly in the discovery uh, of platinum uh, in South Africa. And from my point of view, Karl Anhauser has also uh, made an enormous contribution uh, to our knowledge, particularly of the basement complex rocks uh, in South Africa. And then we move on to the rock mechanics side and we can add Evert Hook, who together with Ted Brown has produced one of our very well recognized te textbooks uh, on underground excavations. And carrying on further, uh, we start to get to the uh, people who I've met during my lifetime. Um, I've not met any of the others, uh, but Jennings, Brink and Williams have made an enormous contribution uh, to uh, geoprofessionals uh, in South Africa. Uh, Brink with his four volumes of the engineering geology of Southern Africa, and then of course, uh, the Bible of Soil Profiling uh, by Jennings, uh, Brink and Williams. A lot has changed uh, in the past couple of years, and we can be proud of what our construction industry has achieved as well. Looking back to the first deep basements which were constructed in South Africa, this is a basement in 1967, uh, and uh, you can see the amount of shoring, uh, very different to what it is that we do today. Uh, just take a look at the, the style of the motor cars, even one motor car parked right down the bottom of the basement. And this is what it looks like today. This is a, a, one of the biggest excavations uh, in Johannesburg area, this, the excavation for dis the discovery uh, building in Santon taken in 2015. And so we can add some of our geotechnical contractors to our list, our Hall of Fame list, if you wish. 
And I think particularly of Ross Perry Davies, uh, who started up ground engineering as part of LTA, and Ian Bradford, who headed up the Frankie Power Group uh, for a long period of time. Uh, there's also John Everett, who contributed significantly to technical advances uh, at Frankie Pyle. Now, with this very proud heritage which we have as geoprofessionals in South Africa, I want to ask the question, are we doing the best that we can do? I'd like to take you through a couple of case histories dotted all around the country, and these are all projects that I've been personally involved in. Uh, and these case histories are each chosen to illustrate a point. Uh, every single one of them is a case history of a failure, which has occurred for some or other reason. Uh, and they, they're not the biggest and the best case histories that we can dig up, uh, but they're simply there uh, to uh, illustrate the point, as I say. Let's start off. Uh, with a very humble beginning uh, of the construction of mass housing or RDP housing uh, in the Bloemfontein and Kimberley area. And this is clearly a total failure. Um, the photographs taken by Lisa Teron uh, at CUT, Central University of Technology. Uh, and here we have uh, the total underestimation uh, of the amount of heave uh, which has occurred below these houses. Uh, and also bad, uh, incorrect design uh, of the foundations uh, for these houses on this expansive clay profile. And you can see the severe damage which results. Now this has severe economic consequences. If we then move down to the Western Cape, and um, this particular site is situated in Camps Bay. And as the Cape becomes more and more populated, People are pushing further and further up the mountain and developing on slopes which were never intended to be developed. And this is an example of a house in the Barbara Road in Camps Bay, directly below the Twelve Apostles. Uh, and every single one of the houses situated along uh, the uh, ed, ed, upper edge of upslope edge of Barbara Road have all excavated into the hill slope. And the houses below have filled uh, on along the boundary, along the downslope boundary. And the result is a total change in the topography and a weakening of that already pseudo stable uh, colluvial slope. Uh, and when this excavation, which was formed uh, on, on the upslope side of Barbara Road, uh, it started to move much of the hill slope. In fact, five properties were involved, the property on which the excavation took place uh, the two properties above uh, and two properties below. And you can see the severity of the movement. Uh, this house on the, on, on the left, this triple story house, is being completely pushed uh, across the, base, the basement uh, parking area uh, of that house. Oh, Photographs here come from Mike von Veringen. We then move slightly up the coast uh, to um, the uh, Humansdorp area, uh, and uh, here we can see a site uh, which was for a magistrate's office. Uh, in fact, sorry, this is Pettenberg Bay, a magistrate's office in Pettenberg Bay, uh, and it was investigated fairly, fairly thoroughly. Uh, but during the investigation, uh, it was found uh, that the rock head was far deeper than originally anticipated. It turned out not to be on the Peninsula Formation sandstones, uh, but on the Cretaceous. And there, uh, the uh, method of excavation uh, was incapable of reaching the rockhead. A recommendation was made that rotary core drilling should be carried out, uh, but that recommendation was ignored by the client, uh, and they proceeded with the development uh, on the basis uh, of uh, piled foundations to an assumed depth. The piles which were used were ductile, ductile, iron, uh, ductile cast iron piles, uh, which are driven into the ground. The net result was the cost of the piling on this site increased threefold as a result uh, of the client's failure 
to adhere to the advice of the geotechnical engineer that, that rotary core drilling should be undertaken. We then move a little bit down the coast again to, to the Mossel Bay area. Uh, and here uh, we have an example of a housing project constructed on a reasonably steep slope, nothing, nothing spectacular, uh, but note that there is a dam in the background. And coming out of that dam uh, is a, a, a discharge channel, uh, which has become eroded. And the undermining of the toe of the slope by erosion in the discharge channel, channel has destabilized much of the slope. And you can see here, we've got houses uh, which are being totally moved off their foundations. We then move up to something uh, closer to Johannesburg. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the Latabo power station, which was constructed in 1982, where that's roughly when construction started. I was privileged to, to design the piles uh, for the chimneys uh, for this uh, particular power station. Uh, and it was discovered uh, after one year in break uh, that the piles below the cooling water duct had settled relative to the blinding, even before any load had been applied to the piles. Uh, of course, that wasn't the case. What had really happened is the blinding had come up and the piles themselves had stayed put. And that was the discovery of uh, the enormous amount of heave which occurred on this particular site. Uh, when we constructed the, uh, the chimney foundations, uh, the, the piles which went to a depth of about 30 meters were isolated from the surrounding soil to a depth of 15 meters uh, using casings and uh, bitumen slip coating. Uh, and we left a 300 millimeter gap below the underside of the pile caps, uh, thinking that this would certainly be sufficient to absorb all the heave. All the heave. Uh, well, in uh, sort of mid-2000s, uh, uh, sort of middle of 2000, uh, about 2005 it was, um, Eskom came back to us and told us that they had been checking the gaps below the foundations and our 300 gap had closed totally and we had to mine out a further one meter of material uh, below the underside of the power caps uh, for those chimneys. The reason now is fairly well known. Um, this is an aerial view where we have the uh, Vol Dam in the background, uh, the Vol River which snakes around here, does a large meander and then comes down past Fernand. Uh, going off towards Funderbell Park. Uh, and here you can see uh, the uh, power station situated on the Vol River alluviums uh, and on residual siltstones, uh, which extend uh, down to a depth uh, of about 20 meters or more. And the real cause of this was the fact that the entire site was covered by a blue gum plantation, which resulted, to des of des resulted in desiccation of the soils uh, down to depths uh, in excess of 30 meters. Um, now, there was precedent for this because there was a similar incident which, incident, incident which occurred at Pilkington's uh, in Springs, uh, where severe heave was recorded uh, due to the felling of exotic trees. We now move up to the south of Joburg uh, to a, a, a fairly tragic uh, event. Uh, where in Mayersdal in 2014, a homeowner decided to raise his uh, um, outside patio uh, by, a, by a floor in, to get a better view of the Clip River Valley below. And in doing so, um, they'd completed the construction of the suspended slab and were busy with the plastering of the underside of the slab when the entire slab collapsed. Uh, and it turned out uh, that changes had been made during the design uh, and uh, the uh, chimney for the barbecue area, which was, a which was fundamental to the support of the slab, had been demolished. And one of the foundations had actually been founded uh, on underlying brickwork. Uh, and uh, the, the combination of those two factors caused the entire slab to collapse. Unfortunately, there were tragic consequences and a number of workers were killed. We now move up to Rand Park Ridge, and uh, this is a, 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 was a court case which uh, played out in the Johannesburg uh, High Court, uh, and it was a, a very luxurious house uh, with a view which stretched all the way to the Mahalisburg. 
This house was constructed immediately adjacent to a fabric reinforced retaining wall, uh, which was about six or eight meters high. Uh, that's just a cross section through the house. And you can see that there's the fabric reinforced retaining wall, eight meters high uh, and five meters of full material below the side of the house. Uh, the house was founded on piles, but unfortunately, as we now know very well, fabric, reinforce, fabric reinforcement creeps and we had lateral movement to the fill material, uh, which caused severe distress to the house. Moving up to the Pretoria area, and this is a project which was constructed uh, on a street called Farmer's Folly. And uh, due to a change in the construction program, or the sequence of construction, um, it was a site where, sorry, it was a site where a number of office blocks were being constructed on a single site. And due to a problem with services, there was a change in the sequencing of the construction. Uh, and one of the upper blocks was constructed prior to completing uh, a block on a lower terrace. This is in the Pretoria series shales, which everybody knows, uh, dip towards the north and form unstable cut slopes on the south side of the excavation. Well, all went well until they started to trim back this bank in order to construct the retaining wall, which would retain that slope. Uh, and um, they had a failure along the dip planes, uh, which caused the structure to collapse. We now move to Central Santon, uh, and uh, this is an excavation in Central Santon uh, where the investigation was done uh, using an auger rig uh, in the granites. And the auger rig penetrated to a depth of about 16 meters uh, and uh, a maximum depth of about 16 meters. Uh, and by extrapolation, uh, it was inferred uh, that that would be the level of the rockhead around the perimeter of the excavation. Now, obviously, investigations in built up areas are difficult uh, because you're working prior to the demolition of the existing buildings and you need to work around them. So extrapolation is quite common. Well, it turned out when they got down to 16 meters with a lateral support system designed to support 16 meters of soil uh, that they found uh, that they had in places around the excavation, uh, a soil profile which extended down to the full 32 meter depth of the excavation. As a result, uh, the excavation had to be backfilled around the perimeter and additional longer anchors uh, were installed at a significant increase in the cost. If we just go across the road, just uh, to the north of the Santon station, uh, there's another site there uh, where again, an investigation was done with an auger rig. Uh, this, uh, it was a 14, uh, the investigation was an auger rig and a 14 meter deep basement excavation was formed uh, with the intention that the building would be founded on rock at the base of the excavation. Well, when we got down to the bottom of the excavation, uh, it was found that the um, granites in the area were extensively intruded by diabase, and you can see that in some of these photographs. Uh, and in places we had to go down as deep as four meters uh, below the intended founding level, uh, just to find suitable founding material for this multi-story building. At the end of the day, uh, we had 1,200 cubic meters of mass concrete was placed below the foundations of the structure. Um, and just in case the geologists are feeling left out and we're only talking about the, the faults of geotechnical enge engineers, uh, let's take a look at the Majuba uh, power station and the colliery which was intended uh, to supply coal to the Majuba power station. Well, once the colliery was opened up, it was discovered that the coal seams were fragmented by uh, diabase dikes and that the mechanical mining equipment, which was intended to be used uh, in that particular coal mine, could not be economically employed. And the result is, according to the Mail and Guardian, that 42,000 tons of coal is trucked into that power station per day. Now, that's why I'm asking this. With our proud heritage, of geotechnical and geological uh, activity uh, in South Africa. Is this the best that we can do? I ask myself the question, why? Why is this happening? 
Well, if we try and establish the root causes of all these problems, and we divide them up into a couple of simple categories, we start off with no investigation at all, inadequate investigation, um, a problem not recognized. In other words, it was just wasn't, the problem wasn't even thought about, uh, or alternatively poor design uh, of the structures themselves. And finally, lack of knowledge. And we start categorizing each of these. And you can see how I've categorized them. Uh, the the, the um, uh, heave in the, in the Bloemfontein area, inadequate investigation, poor design of foundations. Camp space site, no investigation whatsoever. And the problem of global instability of that colluvial hill slope was not recognized. Um, the um, problem in Plettenberg Bay Magistrates Court or Magistrates Officers, uh, inadequate investigation and the client failing to heed the advice uh, of the geotechnical engineer. Uh, the Mossel Bay la landslip there, inadequate investigation and also the problem caused by the excavation of the tow not recognized. Uh, Latabo Power Station, um, well, well investigated, uh, but inadequate uh, investigation uh, of the desiccation of the clays caused by the blue gum trees, and that problem was not recognized. Um, the Mayersdal problem, no investigation, uh, and also poor design or poor control over the, co over the construction. Uh, here we, uh, with the uh, Rand Park Ridge home, uh, the problem was not recognized that the retaining wall would creep uh, and the design of the piles could not provide lateral stability and the design of the retaining wall uh, did, not, uh, did not ensure the absence of lateral movement. Um, here, the, the problem was really a change in the sequence of construction of the Farmers Folly Project. Uh, and so they didn't realize that changing the sequence of construction uh, would cause a problem uh, of this nature. Um, it, with the uh, basement in Santon, uh, where the 32 meter basement had to be re-engineered uh, at a depth of 16 meters, that's inadequate investigation. Uh, the same with the uh, 1,200 cubic meters of mass concrete, uh, also just plain and simply inadequate investigation. Um, the Majuba, Col uh, Majuba Colliery, uh, inadequate investigation and the problem of the Dolorite dikes, uh, just not recognized. So if we categorize all those and sum summarize them, you will see that they are all due to things which could have been prevented. Lack of knowledge did not play a part. In other words, in all these cases, the knowledge required to prevent the failures existed, but not the will or the resources to apply that knowledge. I think this is one of the problems which we are facing uh, is that uh, there is a, an attempt uh, by developers uh, and project managers uh, to maximize the return on the investment uh, without taking into account the potential consequences of not doing the job properly. So let's take a look at some of the changes uh, which have occurred. Uh, and I'm going to talk about that again a little bit later, uh, but let's just took, uh, take a look at, at some changes. And I start with a quote which is, the more things change, the more they remain the same. And uh, you, you'd be excused for thinking that this came, came from Bon Jovi in 2010. However, it actually came from a French writer, Jean-Baptiste Carr, uh, in 1849. He was the first person who penned those words. If we take a look at what's happened in the field of geology and geotechnical engineering and engineering geology, we compare the two maps of the West Rand. There we were talking about the Fentersdorp series. We now talk about the Fentersdorp supergroup. Different colors on the maps, but the same geology. Take the gray Lurie, or the gray now known as the gray go away bird. Different names, but the same bird. If we look at methods of testing to determine the stiffness of soil, here we've got a massive scale plate load test uh, uh, conducted in Botswana for a proposed power station. Uh, and compare that uh, to the small strain stiffness measurements, uh, which can be undertaken uh, using CSW testing. So different tests, 
with the same parameters. Uh, looking at the analysis of, of, of retaining walls, whereas previously it would have been done by simple earth pressure theory methods, we're now able to do finite element analyses. Different analyses, same structure. In basement excavations, you've seen both of these before. Different methods, but exactly the same principles for retaining the sidewalls of the excavations. If we look at, at the monitoring of ground movement, different methods with the same type of observations. This is satellite infra interferometry uh, on the right-hand side. Um, the determination of rock types and detection of minerals within rocks, different methods, uh, but the same minerals. Sorry, apologies for the spelling over there. So there have been a lot of changes which have taken place, but we need to ask ourselves, have we changed for the better or have we lost out on some things during, along the way? And you also need to ask, with all these changes, with all these more modern methods that we have, do we still understand the fundamentals? And this applies particularly to finite element modeling or numerical analysis, uh, where uh, there is a tendency to blindly believe what comes out of the analysis, uh, rather than trying to uh, understand the fundamentals of what is going on with the structure. So let's take a look at some of the challenges uh, which are facing the profession. And the first thing which I'd like to look at uh, is education uh, and specialization. If we take a look at the uh, two streams which uh, produce uh, geoprofessionals within South Africa, uh, you can either come from a geology background, and typically your primary degree would be a BSc in honors in geology or engineering geology, or you can come from an engineering background uh, where your typical degree would be a BSc engineering uh, or a BEng degree. And there is an entire spectrum of geoprofessionals uh, which are involved in this exciting field that we're working, ranging from people who are dealing with mineralogy, sedimentology, geochronology, geochemistry, sort of on the pure science side, and then coming through the applied sciences uh, like mining geology, field geology, geophysics, seismology, geohydrology, uh, engineering geology, and then going all the way through here uh, to the engineering sciences of geotechnical engineering, environmental geotechnics, tailings engineering, which is becoming very, very big worldwide, uh, and uh, solid waste engineering. Uh, all of these having, uh, during my lifetime, uh, grown out of the geotechnical engineering background. So we've got an entire spectrum of geoprofessionals who are involved uh, in uh, the, the South African uh, geotechnical or geological fraternity. And just a, a note that uh, about 20% of the postgraduate students at Stellenbosch University uh, in, uh, of geotechnical postgraduate students at Stellenbosch University come from a geological background. So there is a significant movement of people who start studying geology wanting to move uh, into engineering. I'm not seeing it in the other direction, but I'm certainly seeing it moving, move, seeing students wishing to move from geology into engineering. Now let's take a look at that. Um, both, both engineering and geology uh, have uh, the building blocks uh, for, for those two uh, professions uh, are uh, the physical sciences, chemistry, physics, and mathematics. And it's how we combine these blocks that determines where we fit into the spectrum of geo, uh, geoprofessionals uh, and uh, the work which we are competent to perform. So if we take a look at the definition of competence, competence is made up starting with education, training, contextual knowledge, experience, and finally registration. Now that comes from um, uh, the, uh, many of our national standards. And I've just chosen one of the definitions 
uh, from uh, SAMS 10400B uh, and where they define a competent person as a person who is qualified by virtue of education, training, experience and contextual knowledge. And in other parts of SAMS 10400, uh, you'll find that they do refer to particular categories of registration as well. So while we come from a, a similar uh, backgrounds, or we, we have a similar background in the physical sciences, uh, engineers and geologists and, geotech and, and um, uh, engineering geologists uh, have a different combination uh, of these building blocks. Uh, and as a result, have different education, training, knowledge, experience, uh, and registration. Now, I want to just draw your attention to the fact that engineers cannot register as natural scientists and vice versa. So if you have a basic degree in engineering, you cannot go and register as a, a, with, with SATMASP uh, as, a, as an engineering geologist, even though you might have picked up a lot of knowledge and experience in geology along the way. And uh, here just to caution that we all need to work within our area of competence. Now that might sound strange because uh, you might think as a, a geologist or as an as a, uh, engineering geologist that you have a, a really thorough understanding of many engineering principles. And I might think as a geotechnical engineer uh, that I too know a little bit about geology. Uh, but really at the end of the day, you get caught out by what you do not realize you do not know. You get caught out by what you do not realize you do not know. And it really is your first degree uh, that lays the background for the knowledge which you acquire. It lays the background for you to be able to understand uh, and, uh, and analyze the experiences uh, which you have later in life. And so the first degree, your first degree does matter. Now here, um, I need to draw your attention to something which has happened fairly recently. Uh, and there's been discussion between the engineering geologists and the geotechnical engineers in the past. Uh, and that is uh, the publication uh, of X's identification of engineering works uh, regulation. And this was promulgated to my very great surprise on the 26th of March, uh, uh, 2021. Um, and it has been published with out an exemptions clause. Now, originally, when we were drafting these, um, uh, these uh, uh, regulations, the identification of engineering work regulations, uh, as, as long ago as, I think we started in about 2012 or something like that, uh, we had an exemptions clause uh, which exempted people from other professions uh, undertaking work which encroached on the work of the engineering profession, um, provided they were doing so within this field of competence and according to the rules of their registration. That exemption clause has been removed and has been replaced uh, by what they call the definition of overlaps. And the overlaps are contained in the appendices to the regulations. Now, uh, um, the, uh, in, uh, the SATNASP uh, is probably going to have to look at these very carefully uh, if they have not done so already. But having said that, engineering geology and geotechnical engineering, in my mind, are opposite sides of the same coin. They are different, but they are inseparable. And we just need to look at the combination of Jennings, Brink, and Williams. There we have an engineer, uh, uh, engineer academic and very practical person. We have Tony, uh, uh, Tony Brink, uh, who was, uh, predominantly a, a practical uh, engineering geologist, but also an academic, and Tony Williams, an engineer uh, and a researcher. And these two joined together uh, to produce uh, some very, very good work uh, in South Africa, notably our Jennings Brink and Williams method of soil profiling. And from our experience, the best results are achieved by working together as a team and combining our individual specialist skills. Um, Jones of Wagner uh, has grown from a geotechnical department when I joined the company, probably of about four or five people, 
uh, we now probably employ somewhere in the region of 40 uh, geo professionals. Uh, and in, in the um, geotechnical engineering side of Jones of Arden, in other words, not taking tailings and, and waste management into account, uh, we probably have an even mix uh, between geotechnical engineers uh, and engineering geologists. And uh, that is what we find to be optimal. The next um, topic which I'd like to tackle uh, is unemployment. And uh, this is a, a slide which was uh, taken from Reuters. Uh, and you can, you can read it. Please hire a grad, a grad, honors in mining and geology, a CV in something or other, and a telephone number. But seriously, Unemployment in South Africa is a major problem. Uh, we had an unemployment rate of 32.5% uh, in January 2021. And if we take a look, uh, these are statistics from uh, the uh, uh, first quarter of 2019, so they, they're not quite up to date, but it's the, the most recent that I could find. The unemployment rate uh, among 15 to 24 year olds is 55%. Now that's enormous. So we're not absorbing uh, the, uh, the people who are coming through schools or th coming through universities. And you'll see that the unemployment rate is actually lowest uh, among graduates, but a large number of graduates still remain unemployed. And at the end, at first quarter of 2021, in other words, the beginning of this year, there were more than 150,000 graduates who were unemployed. This comes from Stats SA. Now, if we take a look at education worldwide and just see how many degrees have been awarded. In 2014, which is the latest statistics that I could get, uh, there were 22 million degrees and first degrees which were awarded. And 7.5 million of these degrees uh, were in science and engineering. And it is estimated uh, that there will be 300 million degree holders in the, in, in, in the world uh, by 2030. And if we take a look at the, uh, at the countries which are producing the most degrees uh, in science and engineering, uh, you'll see China leading the way uh, and, and sorry, China and India leading the way, uh, and then followed by the EU, United States, uh, and uh, the, um, uh, the Eastern countries, and all other countries combined, Brazil features a 2%, all other com countries combined uh, produce a further 18% of graduates. Now let's take a look at doctoral degrees. In other words, going all the way uh, to uh, taking a, uh, getting a PhD or a DNG or whatever else it might be. Uh, and you'll see that in 2014 as well, 220,000 doctoral degrees uh, were awarded worldwide. That's 2.9% of all graduates are carrying on uh, to do a, 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 a doctoral, doctoral degree. And what are the challenges uh, that this uh, brings to us? Graduates are battling to find employment. I, I get emails virtually every day from people who are uh, studying at Stellenbosch University, begging me to find them some form of employment so that they can get experience and enter the labor market. And many of these graduates are actually electing to do postgraduate studies as an alternative to entering the labor market. And they are doing so without any work experience. And so they're not getting the full benefit of their postgraduate studies because they're studying in a field in which they have no uh, background. We're also seeing an increase in the number of startup practices where you'll find people with, no, uh, uh, with very limited experience going off and starting their own practices simply unable to be employed. And uh, this is, this is a, a great difficulty because uh, they would often be one or two men bands or women bands, which do not have uh, the necessary um, uh, mentoring, uh, which is absolutely essential. Um, in fact, we're finding that mentoring in the workplace is a significant problem. 
when you have industry liaison meetings at the University of Stellenbosch uh, with members from industry, uh, one of the things that they complain about is that the graduates are coming out of university and they're actually unable to produce a, a, a saleable work. Uh, and part of the problem here is really mentoring. You can't produce graduates uh, which can enter the marketplace and immediately uh, be productive and profitable. The mentoring has to take place in the workplace. And in fact, the best mentoring that you can have is the mentoring of your colleagues. So if you're in a startup practice which only has one or two members, uh, the mentoring process doesn't take place. Then we're experiencing significant loss of skills to other professions, namely insurance, banking, economics, even the legal profession. Uh, and then, of course, as we all know, uh, loss of skills uh, to other countries. If we look at competition and the procurement of work, uh, this is probably where a number of the problems which I described earlier on in this presentation, this is where a number of these problems lie. Uh, we've seen significant changes in procurement procedures uh, in the 40 years or 45 years that I've been in practice. Uh, we, we are see, seeing failure to adhere to established norms. We, are, we, we seem to be forgetting uh, about what the standards say and the specifications say we ought to be doing under certain circumstances. And one of the big problems that we face is a lack of pro procurement and adjudication skills. In other words, the people who are asking for the work to be done, the people who are putting out the tenders, particularly within the public sector, and then have the task of adjudicating those tenders, lack the skills uh, to be able to do so uh, correctly. So let's just take a look at change in procurement procedures. In the good old days, um, all of our work was negotiated and it was based plain and simply on value for money. Very seldom would we put in a tender. Uh, yes, we would put in a proposal which would make a proposal for a scope of work and an associated price. Now, that has totally changed. And in current times, cost is king. Uh, and quality counts for nothing. Reputation, standing within the industry uh, is really discounted totally. Uh, and if you put in the lowest price tender, um, particularly in, in, in public service uh, projects, uh, you will probably get the job. Now, I'd like to tell you a story over here about the good old days. Uh, I can recall, um, you know, I work for the company, or I did, I've, I've retired from the company, but I still consult with the company, Jones and Wagner. And uh, Winston Jones uh, came into one of our partners' meetings and he said, uh, I must apologize to you, my partners. I have spent so many hours working on a proposal uh, and we did not get the job. And I am volunteering uh, to pay back the cost that has been expended on preparing that proposal. Now, can you believe it? Nowadays, we we're, we're, we're spend perhaps 15% of our time putting in proposals which we do not, uh, which we, uh, and the work is not awarded to us. But at, the, at that stage, it was unheard of. If you'd gone to the trouble of preparing a proposal, uh, you obviously had a good expectation of being awarded the work. Let's just look at the failure to adhere to established norms. And I want to return to this problem in the free state with these houses. And I want to ask the question, with SAN 632 in place, how can this happen? Now, SAN 632 is the code of practice or the, or the South African National Standard, which deals uh, with the geotechnical investigation uh, of townships. How can something like this happen when we have a standard which lays down exactly what needs to be done and that includes the identification of problem soils? Well, SAN 632 requires identification of problem soil conditions during the phase one investigation and during the installation of services. So it's, a, it's, it's very clear that this problem ought to have been picked up uh, during the township development phase. But then we have another body which comes into the picture and that's the NHPRC. And that requires a soil classification for each individual home. In other words, the site of each individual home, the soil needs to be classified. And what we find is happening uh, is that the township developer is paying for the investigation at township establishment stage. And any increase in cost results in a loss of profit to the developer. And so the developer is obviously motivated 
by trying to spend as little as possible to meet, if you wish to call it, the, the, the normally meet the, the, the requirements of SAN 632, just sufficient to get it through the local authority and if necessary, get it through the Council for Geoscience. But then we come to the other end of the scale, we have an individual homeowner who might be developing a house of 60 square meters in a, in a, in a sub-economic housing area. And that person has to pay out of their own pocket for the classification of the individual stand. And in that case, increased cost means no money for school uniforms. So there's pressure on them to do the minimum amount of investigation possible. And the difficulty which we have is that the problem should have been detected and defined in total during the 632 investigation, saying the township investigation, uh, uh, investigation uh, and the, uh, uh, the classification of individual stands should simply be a confirmation uh, of the uh, problem or the conditions on that particular site. So the intention of the regulation has been thwarted. Let's just illustrate this one. And let's, let's take a township, um, de uh, township development investigation. And we have two consultants, ge uh, geological, geotechnical consultants, uh, who submit a price. Consultant one uh, submits a price based on the TLB investigation, uh, where the soil conditions are investigated uh, to a depth of three meters. And here we have a typical free state profile with windblown sands uh, overlying medium expensive clays probably derived from the uh, decomposition of the of the Karoo sediments. You have consultant two who knows a thing or two about the area, who knows the depth of the profile and the problems which it could cause, uh, and he submits a price based on an order investigation. Consultant one, the cost of each in, in investi investigation point, in other words, each trial hole would be about a thousand rand per hole. Consultant two, the cost of an order investigation uh, we're looking at about 5,000 rand per hole. You can guess who's going to get the job. However, if you look at the effect of this, if you use this information to predict the heave, you predict 19 millimeters heave based on a three meter depth uh, of profile, and it would be suitable for split construction. Whereas if you did the investigation properly, you would actually be predicting 35 millimeters of heave just with a medium expansive profile and stiffened rafts would be required. So here we can very clearly see the effect of competition uh, and the absence of procurement and adjudication skills uh, within the market. Let's take a look at research. Just some um, uh, statistics which I, I dug up for the Tazagi oration, which I did a couple of years ago. Uh, and you, you want to look at the number of uh, peer reviewed scholarly articles which have been produced and it reached 50 million uh, by 2009 and just coming down to the bottom of the page well let's look at 2015 Elsevier who's one of the publishing houses produced 400,000 manuscripts in 2015 alone in 2015 there were 18,850 articles on geotechnical engineering and engineering geology and there are 292 geotechnical and engineering and engineering ge ge geological uh, journals uh, in existence, and that was in 2015. The result of this is a total overload. We, we cannot keep up with the amount of information which has been produced. And this is partly because uh, of the policy which we have in academia at the moment, that you either publish or perish. Um, you have to publish in order to get funding, uh, and if you don't publish, uh, you're not going to get promoted and uh, your, your institution is going to languish. I'm, I'm editor of the editor in chief of the, uh, the Journal of the South African Institution of Civil Engineers. Uh, and I want to tell you that we publish only 8% uh, of the papers which are submitted to us. And in fact, um, somewhere in the, in the, in the region of I, I would imagine somewhere in the region of 85% of, of the papers are rejected out of hand without even going to, uh, to a refereeing process. And that gives you a, 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 just a, a sense uh, of the desperation that there is worldwide uh, to publish. A lot of our pub uh, papers are coming from places like Iraq, Iran, 
uh, India, China, uh, and yeah, the enormous number of papers from, from, from those particular countries. And we only publish about 8% of the papers which we receive. Then I'd like to ask the question regarding research. What has happened to the National Building Research Institute? Why, when it had such a strong uh, research team looking at expansive clays and coming up with new methods and improved methods of predicting heave, are we still using the Fundamava method, which was uh, devised in 1963, uh, 1964 uh, for heave prediction? The reason is plain and simple economics. The National Building Research Institute is demise, uh, and or we certainly it's not a force within the market anymore. Uh, and the Fundamental method probably provides the cheapest method uh, of determining the potential expansiveness of a soil profile. We now turn to our regulatory environment, and I just want to look at a couple of the problems which we have. Our local authorities, uh, we have an absence of skills. Uh, and what we find is in the approval of uh, plans for development, uh, the local authority will hide behind the signature of a competent person. So as soon as a competent person has been appointed, they produce a report or signed a drawing, the local authority will wash their hands of the problem and say, if anything goes wrong, the competent person is to blame. And we're finding that very often the local authorities are unaware of the existence and the extent of geohazards in their area, even something as basic as the presence of dolomite. For example, there's a lot of development which is going on in the southern half of Johannesburg, where the local authority is permitting that development to go ahead without any dolomitic stability investigation. And the plain and simple reason is that they do not know exactly where the limits of the dolomite are. And so that's, that's a major problem. Uh, and bear in mind uh, that according to uh, the national building regulations, uh, it is the local authority who is obliged to advise the developer of the presence of, of known presence of, uh, uh, of geohazards. Uh, and in that case is obliged to, uh, so it requires the, the, uh, the developer uh, to carry out a geotechnical investigation. We have another problem that the local authorities are unable to adjudicate competence. Uh, and this applies particularly to Dolomite uh, D4 type uh, developments, uh, where you require a competence level four uh, geoprofessional. And as a result of that, they're passing the responsibility for uh, the uh, adjudication of competence uh, onto SACNAS and onto EXA. Well, SACNAS has got the, the act together, uh, whereas EXA says, uh, not our problem. Uh, we do not uh, certify competence, uh, we register professionals, and so it's not our problem. Then we have a, a problem with uh, the failure to follow procedures, and I think this applies particularly to township development applications, uh, where they are accepting uh, investigations for township developments which are not assessing the full extent of the problem. For example, investigating a deep expansive soil profile to a depth of only three, uh, three meters because that's the reach of a TLB. Then failing to exercise control over development in the areas. In other words, allowing developments to carry on which are not in accordance with the approved plans or allowing things to happen uh, which could have serious consequences uh, in the areas and just turning a blind eye to it. Uh, for example, let's take the failure of the Mobeni Reservoir uh, in Durban. Uh, now, this is the reservoir in the background. Uh, it's a covered reservoir, uh, and it has uh, um, a very interesting construction uh, where the sides of the reservoir are, are, are this kind of folded plate uh, design. Uh, and founded on the Berea Red Sands, which are erodible uh, and also tend to collapse uh, when they become wet. Uh, and it is strongly suspected uh, that the formation of uncontrolled excavation in the area below the reservoir led to movement of the slope and failure uh, of that reservoir. Now, I can't pronounce this as a definite cause of failure, but it is one of the causes of failure that is certainly being considered. Now, the city council turns out, or the, it was, they, they were aware uh, that this excavation was taking place and yet did nothing about it. The Bureau of Standards, 
Well, many of you may not know that the Bureau was actually placed under administration in 2018 uh, due to poor performance uh, and uh, making a, a loss year after year. They have a chronic shortage or alternatively turnover of standard, uh, standards editors to the point where changes have been proposed to standards which just require simple editing of the standard uh, and they are not taking place timelessly as a result of a shortage of standards editors. <coughs> Excuse me. They are now planning to retench, retain, retrench 170 staff members. They're not able to do the work which they've got, but they're now planning to retrench staff members in order to preserve uh, profitability. They rely on the profession to produce standards, and yet they are not prepared to pay at all or even acknowledge the contribution of the profession in the standards they produce. And we're finding significant delays in the production and adoption of standards. For example, the uh, modification of the, or the, the adoption of the Eurocode uh, for the design of concrete structures uh, and the um, writing of a national application document uh, has now been in place uh, for somewhere around about seven years. And we still have no resolution uh, from the Bureau of Standards as to the procedures which need to be followed. And I'm finding that they are actually more interested in their own internal procedures uh, than the needs of industry. So at the moment, I, I'm, I'm very disillusioned with the Bureau of Standards. And the as a result of this, they're rapidly losing the support of the profession. We, we put out the SANS 1936, which is the Dolomite standard uh, for comment by the committee, uh, and uh, we did not receive sufficient votes uh, to approve the, the SANS 1936 uh, as a committee draft. So they, they're losing the support of the profession. The profession is just not, not prepared to work with them anymore. Let's look at the Engineering Council of South Africa. This CEO was suspended in June 2021. No details have been given as to why the suspension took place. Uh, but very importantly, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, that they've recently published the identification of engineering work regulations, which deal with overlaps in the built environment professionals, but not with the natural scientific professions. And so I think that it's, it's incumbent upon SACNASP uh, to actually review that document very, very carefully uh, and to make certain that their complementary document, which they are also required to produce uh, on the identification of work for, for various disciplines within the natural scientific profession, makes allowance uh, for people like engineering geologists uh, to do work uh, which overlaps uh, with the engineering profession. But let's take a look at uh, some uh, solutions which we can look at. As far as education employment is concerned, uh, on the education side, I really think we need to stop dumbing down our secondary and tertiary uh, uh, criteria, uh, uh, curricula. Uh, we, we, we need to be uh, teaching sciences uh, at, 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 at their fundamental level rather than teaching things like life skills. That's my personal opinion. Because it is only when you have a, funda a good understanding of the fundamentals that underlie the profession or, or, or the, 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 the work that you are going to be doing uh, that you could actually build on those fundamentals. If you don't have the fundamentals, you've got no foundation on which to build. Uh, I firmly believe that we ought to be teaching geology to geotechnical engineering students that ought to be done at an undergraduate level. We're not trying to make them geologists, but we want to give them an appreciation of the fundamentals of geology. We need to involve more practitioners uh, in tertiary education. And this is what I'm doing at the moment with my involvement at the University of Stellenbosch, uh, is coming in and bring a practical aspect uh, to uh, tertiary education institutions. Um, then we need to continue cooperation between engineering geologists and geotechnical engineers. Uh, and I think that this has worked extremely well in the past. Uh, and uh, as I think I've got at the bottom of the slide, uh, we've really got to take our hats off to to decide uh, to the geological society and to the geotechnical division uh, for the cooperation uh, which they have uh, amongst themselves and, and the good working relationship uh, which many of us have with our other geoprofessional colleagues. We've got to encourage participation by young professionals. Uh, the geotechnical division is very good at this. Uh, they have a very, very young and dynamic committee 
uh, and so congratulations to them over there. And uh, as far as employment goes, uh, there are there's work which is crying out to be done. I mean, just simply look at our roads. There is so much work that needs to be done. There's, there's work which needs to be done in building new power infrastructure, in building new water infrastructure. And so we ought to be saving our infrastructure rather than saving institutions like South Africa anyways. As far as competition and procurement is concerned, well, I've said this before, SACNAS needs to look at the IDO, uh, IDOW regulations if they've not already done so. Um, we need to try and get the correct skills into local authorities and state-owned enterprises for them to be able to uh, procure uh, investigations, geotechnical investigations, to specify them, uh, to, to manage the tender process uh, and to adjudicate the tenders correctly uh, and to, to meet the other obligations like the, the ensuring that works are constructed uh, in accordance with uh, the approved plans. And here, I think that uh, we, we've got a, a, a role we can play. And that role is to inform and equip uh, those that are charged with procuring the geotechnical investigations. And how can we do this? Well, the first is that we need to make people aware uh, of the risks of not doing a proper geotechnical or engineering geological evaluation. And so we need to engage with the our fellow professionals in the built environment, like property developers, like project managers, like structural engineers, quantity surveyors, and local government officials. We engage with all of these, these, these stakeholders who are not part of the geotechnical profession. We need to publish case histories of inadequate sub, uh, site investigation and its effects. And we need to increase the awareness uh, of norms for site investigation uh, and, uh, and standards. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, increase awareness of norms by site investigation standards uh, and also the requirements of the legislation. Then as far as equip is concerned, that was inform. I said we need to inform and equip. As far as equip is concerned, we need to make it easy to do the right thing. And by that I mean we need to provide people with the necessary tools to issue a sensible tender document uh, and also to adjudicate or provide a yardstick against which to adjudicate uh, the tenders which are received. And I think we can do that by compiling minimum requirements for site investigations. Uh, and uh, these can be in the form of a standard specification. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, if you are uh, producing a contract document for the construction of a road, you do not go and produce a specification for the base course material. That specification already exists in SABS 1200, and you simply need to refer to SABS 1200. Well, we need to get a similar set of standard specifications for geotechnical investigations for different types of structures. They can range from basement excavations to house foundations, the townships, whatever that might be. But if we can produce a standard set of specifications which a procurement officer can simply reference and require compliance uh, with those uh, specifications, that would help. As far as the regulatory environment is concerned, we need to sort out the silly spat which is happening between the NHBRC, uh, the local authorities and EXA uh, with regard to development on Dolomite D4 sites. There is some progress, but it is, it is very, very slow. Uh, we need to get uh, the latest revision of SANS 1936 for development of Dolomite, la Dolomite land uh, finalized without further delay. Uh, we need to try and keep the South African Bureau of Standards accountable. They've got to realize that they can't just plain and simply rely on the profession without acknowledging or accommodating the requirements of the profession. Um, and we need to possibly consider uh, the independent production of codes of practice, like we've done for the uh, SIC Geotechnical Division uh, Site Investigation Code of Practice, that completely bypass the Bureau of Standards. And I think that this is going to start happening uh, more and more. And I say that advisedly because I, I chair two committees on, on for the South African Bureau of Standards, two technical committees, uh, but I think that it's going to happen, it's inevitable. And I must just say that uh, there are some local authorities and some uh, state-owned ent entities that are doing well. And here, uh, congratulations to the Chwani and the Kuruleni Metropoles uh, with the work which they do on Dolomites. I, I think they are keeping up better than many of the others uh, and also uh, the Council for Geosites. 
Um, look, there are many problems, but I, I, I think that these institutions are really trying their best. As far as research and funding is concerned, uh, we need to encourage cooperation be between researchers and industry. Now we're seeing that happening in certain, in certain sectors, uh, particularly Central University of Technology working very, very closely with soils investigation, uh, uh, sorry, uh, soils testing laboratories uh, and Pretoria University working closely with the industry uh, in things like uh, detecting early detection of leakage from pipes, you know, all of this sort of thing. Uh, it's, uh, that's real good research is when it's done in response to the needs of industry and in conjunction with the industry. We need to facilitate the application of research findings in practice. And here the, the learned institutions like uh, the Geotechnical Division and SIAG uh, can play a role. And as far as publishing is concerned, uh, we need to publish in order to provide knowledge, publish to enlighten, not to survive. Uh, and certainly that's what we're trying to do uh, with the South African journals. So let's just sum up in two slides. What do I think are the biggest advances that I have seen during the past 45 years that I've been in practice? I think personal computing is certainly one of them. I mean, at the time when I, I started doing any computing at all, we were still using mainframes with punch cards. Um, electronic communication, no doubt, has re revolutionized everything. And we can't imagine life without emails at the moment. Numerical analysis has undergone significant development and, and, and improvement uh, since the very rudimentary linear elastic, uh, perfectly plastic type uh, uh, finer element programs that we were using in the past. Remote sensing and imaging, I mean, just think about Google Earth, think about satellite imagery, how this has changed our professions. Surveying has been re revolutionized by GPS. I mean, you, uh, you can do as much with the GPS nowadays as what we used to be able to do with a with the theodolite and the level. Critical state soil mechanics, uh, very much a, a, a important development, particularly in the tailings industries. And we mustn't overlook uh, the, uh, the changes which have occurred in our understanding of soil mechanics in the past 45 years as a result of critical state soil mechanics. And geophysics, I think all of you will agree with me, that uh, our geophysical capabilities uh, have uh, improved significantly. What do I think of the next big steps? The next, the, the next advances which are going to take place within perhaps the next 30 years. Well, I think that remote sensing and imagery is going to continue to improve with more and more development or more and more adventures into space. Uh, I think that this is inevitable. Uh, and in the same way as what uh, things like Google Earth and, and satellite interferometry have come into, into common use at the moment, uh, I think that uh, there are still going to be significant developments in that field. Um, big data is something which is also going to come more into play, uh, helping us to uh, better understand uh, the, relations, the relationships between various parameters uh, which we use uh, in our geotechnical calculations. And then I think that there's still going to be enormous strides uh, in geophysics uh, and particularly probing technologies where we're looking at, at, at um, cone penetration testing, for example, which can de detect in situ, can detect various minerals and trace elements and density measurements, uh, uh, seismic wave velocity measurements. Uh, all of this can now be done uh, with uh, multi-channel uh, receivers uh, and uh, various ad, um, modules which are added onto uh, uh, CPT test uh, apparatus. Um, artificial intelligence, maybe. Um, we are seeing more and more artificial intelligence being applied uh, in all the engineering sciences. Uh, but at the moment, uh, my feeling is that uh, people are still experimenting with it and uh, attempting to do uh, more with it than their data uh, is uh, capable of supporting. In other words, they have too little data in order to be able to train the models uh, and uh, to be able to make any decent progress. So I don't think that it's, that really is going to come into the fore, uh, but I might be surprised. So that's all I have to say to you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention. Great, Peter, thanks so much for that. Um, we have a couple of minutes for questions. I also uh, just wanna also comment on that, uh, Peter, fantastic presentation and um, I'm 100% behind you when you speak about having this better communication and connectivity between 
the engineering sciences and the geological sciences. Um, and I've actually stolen a slide from, from your presentation. I hope you don't mind that I'll be showing later this afternoon when I do my presentation. Um, this is, you know, this is something that I'm very passionate about getting this better working flow between these different fields. They are so intimately connected, especially in the hydrogeological field. Um, and yeah, I'm very excited to present that this afternoon. And before we move on to our next speaker, there's just one question from Xavier um, that I am going to read out, uh, Peter. So he says, dear Prof, what do you think the effect of the years of fees must fall? And then currently our attempts at blended online learning will have on the employability of those graduates. And do you think we can find a solution? No, I'm unmuted. Okay. Uh, Xavier, thanks for that question. Um, I, I, I really can't comment on, on, on the fees must fall. Uh, because it hasn't affected us uh, as significantly at postgraduate level as what has affected undergraduate level. Um, look, I think there is an expectation uh, uh, among many people that if they complete their matric, they are entitled to university education. Uh, and I, I don't think that's necessarily the case, because if we adopt the same attitude as what's been adopted in, in secondary education, in other words, high school, um, that uh, we, we are almost obliged to pass people uh, it's going to have a disastrous effect on, on, on the uh, value of our primary degrees. But let me just uh, talk about the online learning, because that's something which we've been looking at uh, very carefully in the past uh, two years, uh, where online learning has become uh, pretty much uh, uh, standard. Uh, and if, if we're talking about online courses uh, and uh, courses being presented with videos, um, I've been asking my postgraduate students uh, about their, their reaction to these courses. Uh, and many of them say that they prefer the online learning platform, particularly where it has been recorded, uh, because it enables them to go back and revise what the lecturers said at a later stage. Uh, and so uh, the, the, the preference uh, is, even for some very practically orientated courses, the preference of the students is for online learning. I don't know what effect it'll have on employability, but uh, we're, we're seeing that the students actually prefer it. Great, thanks for that, Peter. Um, if I could just ask you to um, perhaps answer a couple of the comments and questions in the chat before you leave today, that will be great. Um, and let's move on to our next speaker. Tony's gonna to be talking to us about soil profiling for engineering purposes. And I'm gonna hand it right over to you, Tony. All right. Um, good. Okay. I'm going to run through very briefly a lecture that normally takes me about four hours, and I'm going to try and compress it into 45 minutes. So please uh, forgive me if I, I seem to um, screen through some of these slides, um, but I will try and uh, focus on the things that I think are important and are perhaps different from, from uh, what we would, um, what, what you as geologists. Might, might have uh, seen before. Okay, so please let me first of all um, start out by saying that you are, uh, this lecture obviously is not going to make you an expert. Um, you, you, you won't walk out of here and, and go and do a, a geotechnical profile with any confidence. Hopefully though it will give you an introduction to how we see soils and describe them and how we differentiate between soil and, and rock. Okay, and, and please uh, bear in mind that the experience that I emphasize is not just about how to do the profiling, but also with respect to the safety um, that, that uh, is needed to enter a test pit and enter the ground to, to record the profile. And please do note that we get into the ground to record a profile. Um, this is not a sort of remote sensing uh, application. Very briefly then, um, the geological uh, cycle, you're probably all familiar with it. We are focused very much on the uh, upper portion of, of that cycle, uh, which is the weathering product of the, the rocks, the sedimentary metamorphic and igneous rocks. Um, and we look at the materials that are produced from that weathering process, from the mass wasting uh, and erosion transportation and deposition, 
as well as the pedogenic materials that uh, develop within the uh, soil profile and sometimes within the weathered rock profile too. Very importantly for us, the identification of geology, uh, what underlies our site, really, really important. Um, in fact, uh, Tony Brink that, that Peter mentioned earlier, uh, the father of engineering geology as we re regard him, um, has produced the four, four volumes on the engineering geology of South Africa. And that's very much focused on linking geotechnical properties of soils and rock to the underlying geology. But we note that the weathering environment, climate and geomorphology uh, affect that quite dramatically. Just a, a quick one, you'll hear me referring to the uh, Vinet N value occasionally. Um, Vinet was an engineer working at the CSR back in the 1960s and was very much in working in road uh, um, and materials development. And he uh, looked at, went and took all the weather stations in South Africa, ratioed the precipitation and, evapor and evaporation, um, plotted all of these and realized that in fact, uh, if he contoured them, you could come up with uh, a, a nice way of, of differentiating between our arid and humid areas. So where N is greater than five, um, we are, uh, those are our arid areas. You can see that very much from the slide in less than five, uh, of course, that, that those are our more humid areas and we get different profiles uh, within those areas. So it's worth bearing that in mind. Um, uh, please note that, of course, historically, that line has shifted uh, 100, uh, 200, 3,000 years ago, that line would have been elsewhere. That's roughly where it is now. I'm going to look at the components of a soil profile um, and uh, describe each of those roughly because that's what we try and uh, seek when we are down in the ground, uh, looking, looking at the soil and describing it. So we have a transported soil horizon at the top, the pebble marker, I'll talk about that a little bit more just now. And then the material uh, in the lower part of the uh, profile, which is um, developed from the weathering of the underlying geology. So that hasn't moved um, at all. Uh, and that's broken into two horizons, the completely weathered rock, uh, which might be as in this case, a completely weathered uh, northosite. Uh, but it is still a soil, um, and above that, a residual anorthosite, um, which uh, we, we as ascribe to the underlying anorthosite, but is still a soil and quite different from the, the material just below it. The transported soil horizon is usually recently deposited, geologically very recently deposited, um, and unconsolidated. It probably hasn't had too much material on top of it in the past. So it hasn't been compressed um, to any great degree, it might have been affected by desiccation uh, and wetting up processes. But other than that, not much uh, consolidation would have taken place. The nature of the soil um, that, that you find in the transported horizon depends on its origin. What did it come from? Did it come from a uh, a norite, or did it come from a granite, did it come from a, the weathering of a, a quartzite, a sandstone, um, what weathering processes has it been through, and then critically, the agent of transport. Um, as you will know from geological studies, the transporting agent sorts uh, materials to a greater or lesser degree, and thereby um, uh, affects that transported horizon quite dramatically. So the transporting agent uh, determines the name of our transported horizon. Uh, Aeolian soils from wind, water would be alluvium, sheet wash, gully wash. Um, uh, gravity would give us our colluvial soils, which uh, we usually break down into hill wash being the typical, being the finer sands and, and silts and clays, and talus being the uh, gravel horizons. Um, we also have a category which uh, we call soils of mixed origin. Um, and, and I usually claim that those, those when we use, when we give a horizon the, the title of soil of mixed origin, it's because we don't really know where the heck it came from. So we just put this nice little blanket name in there. But in fact, it's uh, usually regarded as a mix of the two soils. Um, 
but it is a category on its own. The pebble marker uh, uh, is, is within in the engineering or geotechnical fraternity, a fairly famous horizon. Tony Brink at virtually every conference used to stand up at some point and give us a little lecture on, on the pebble marker and its importance. Uh, he, he was along with um, Tony Williams and uh, Jeremiah Jennings, one, <laughs> one of the people who um, described this. It is the layer of gravel or decomposed gravel, which uh, lies at the base of the transported horizon. And it's widely regarded as being the layer of gravel that is left behind at the end of an erosion process. So you have erosion, um, everything gets removed, a layer of gravel is left behind on the rock surface and then deposition takes place above that and that gives us our transported horizon. There are alternative descriptions, um, uh, uh, um, sorry, um, ideas as to how that uh, gravel horizon comes to be. In some cases, we know, for example, that biotic action migrates gravel from the surface downwards, and it may well be that that gravel uh, horizon represents the, the base of the biotic action. Wh however, importantly for us, it is uh, a, usually an indication that the soil behavior will change. Um, and then for the environmentalists in particular, those of us looking at um, uh, pollution, it's a zone of free drainage, so water might migrate upwards or, or, or downwards, uh, hits that uh, gravel layer and then migrates sideways. So for us, the, the pebble marker is often a very important horizon. If it's thick enough, it's quite often a good founding horizon as well. Often associated with the pebble marker, we find our pedogenic horizons. Now, those are well studied in and within Southern Africa, in fact, within a lot of Africa and elsewhere around the world. These materials are used extensively in construction of roads, um, pavements, um, uh, quite ferricretes uh, uh, and laterites, uh, sometimes used to build um, uh, structures as well. So we find the ferricretes or laterites of the iron oxides, uh, soils um, and rocks cemented by iron oxides, calcrete, calcium carbonate, silcrete is the silica oxide. And then within South Africa, a rather unique um, uh, material found mostly on the West Coast, but I believe also further north, um, Dorbank. Uh, some else known elsewhere perhaps in the world as Duripan. Um, Vinet's end value is particularly useful for us in terms of predicting where this, uh, these pentagenic soils are going to be found. So where N is less than five, um, humid environment, we generally get ferricretes. Uh, where N is greater than five in the arid environments, we get calcretes. Where it's less than five and in a saline environment, we get the silcretes uh, and door banks. Um, I'm not going to dwell on, on the um, nature of these uh, pedogenic horizons, but they vary a great de deal from merely being a powder present in the profile all the way through to a, a hard pan layer that actually um, uh, is rock-like and in fact uh, uh, has to be described as a rock. It may even reach medium hard rock or hard rock in terms of its classification. Um, Right, our residual or completely weathered horizon. Um, the two layers that I noted at the bottom, this soil type is very much dependent on the parent uh, rock and the environment of weathering. Okay, so in our arid areas, um, we invariably find uh, sandy or gravelly soils and they're usually thin. So if you are up there, um, in Kuruman, uh, out in uh, Pusmusberg, those northern Cape areas, and you dig test bits, you'll often find rock or pedocretes uh, very close to surface, outcropping very thin soil horizons above them, unless you have the very thick windblown uh, sands overlying the rock. In the humid area, the type of soil that uh, develops is very, very dependent on the parent rock. So our basic and argillaceous rocks usually develop clay and silt. The acid and arenaceous rocks usually develop sandy soils. There are exceptions to this. I'm not going to go into that at this stage, but that would be typically the case. 
So uh, just to give an example, the norites around uh, Rustenburg give us those very thick, uh, three meter thick black clays, uh, which are highly expansive and notorious for the problems that they uh, create in that part of the world. Um, here in, in uh, Midrand, we find underland, the area underlain by uh, granites and, and uh, very much a sandy soil profile. Right, the differentiation between the residual soil and the completely weathered horizon. So our residual uh, rock would be, um, well, let me start at the bottom rather, our completely weathered rock. So completely weathered norite, completely weathered granite, completely weathered shale, you would still see evidence of the parent rock structure. So it looks very much like the rock that it originated from. You might be able to see the microstructures, the grain structure still present, where it's a coarse grain granite, coarse grain norite. Um, you would see bedding, uh, you would still see the joint planes um, and so on. The residual horizon above that has or no longer has those um, uh, that structure evidence. So all the micro and macro structure has been destroyed, mostly by biotic action or self mulching, um, uh, as as in the case of the active clays. I mentioned the black clays uh, or the, the cotton clays or the turf that uh, people find in the Rustenburg area. Those are so. Uh, active that they self mulch they turn themselves over but in uh, many other areas biotic action especially by termites um, turns the soil over and destroys that um, that structure altogether so just to go back to what i was um, uh, raising uh, what i've described is our transported horizon this is a profile that's taken um, uh, in close to uh, Everest South Mine up uh, towards Leidenberg, um, uh, Mashi as it is now, and uh, the, the areas underlain by norites and the northersites around that mine. So we probably have a residual anorthosite here. Uh, sorry. Jump back a bit. So there's our transported horizon. That's almost certainly a combination of, of hill wash. We're in a hilly area. It's been washed down from the higher lying area, but nevertheless, a fairly sandy soil. The clay has been uh, removed from it. Uh, the pebble marker underlying it, you can see quite clearly. Um, and then the two uh, horizons derived from the weathering of the rock. I do want to just point out here that the uh, boundaries between these upper horizons are quite often fairly linear and easy to, to pick out. The boundary between the residual anorthosite and the uh, completely weathered anorthosite uh, is a lot less um, uh, regular. And that's because the, the termite action, biotic action might follow, uh, for example, uh, joints, uh, shear zones uh, that go down into the underlying rock as these little creatures migrate down and look for water, et cetera. So that's a, an uneven boundary and uh, worth noting in your profile when you are dealing with it. Please note that there will be variations. Yeah, this is a picture taken not too far away from the previous one, also uh, underlain by a northersite. I'm afraid there's a dust covering from uh, above, but just through it, you can see the very white, um, uh, completely weathered anorthosite. Uh, a magnetite gravel layer at the top and virtually no other transported soil uh, present. So, so very little residual in the site. The, the completely weathered horizon continues almost the, all the way up to the pebble marker. So you're not always going to find all those horizons, um, but uh, try and bear them in mind when you are describing the soils. I'm very briefly going to run through some of the um, the problem soils that we deal with. Uh, the, the one problem that is absent from this slide is dolomite, but we'll be talking about that uh, at the end of today. Um, it is a unique and rather uh, difficult problem, but any problem soil conference has always addressed dolomite as part of the problem soils. So collapsible soils 
are uh, notorious. They, they um, in the Johannesburg area in particular, uh, Rosebank uh, is, is, has very thick collapsible soils present. And some of you might remember that when the Gau train um, were tunneling was underway, a sinkhole developed um, uh, 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 and uh, as the soil at the top collapsed into the um, tunnel down below, um, and that was was through the the, the collapsible um, soil that overlay the the tunnel. Um, these are soils that have a uh, are essentially sandy soils where the sand grains are held apart by silt and clay, and they, they are highly voided. Um, in between these little silt and clay, clay bridges and the, the sand particles. Um, and they quite often appear fairly to be fairly strong. Um, and there's many a, a civil engineer who's walked onto site or structural engineer. In fact, usually the structural engineers are the ones to blame. Walk onto site, dug his heel into the bottom of the foundation and said, oh, this is really good hard stuff. You can cast the concrete and years later, um, something saturates that ground and the, the soil literally collapses. And this is a phenomenon that takes place very, very rapidly. Um, a leaking tap next to a foundation that has not been properly um, uh, constructed to deal with, with a collapsible soil uh, might result in, in huge cracks developing in the house literally overnight. Um, so it's, it's a big problem. It is not the worst problem in the country, but uh, I'll deal with that shortly. We can recognize this in the profile, both from a pinhole structure, which is sometimes evident. Uh, if you look at the, the, the sand very closely, um, the, the, the soil profile, preferably uh, with, with a hand lens, um, you might see the pinholing that's evident you will note that it has low density because of all the high void space that's in there. Um, the, the, uh, when you take a sample out, you will notice that it feels lighter than you would expect. Um, the other telltale is that as soon as you wet that uh, profile up, it drops in consistency. It becomes very soft, so soft that quite often you can push your finger into it. Um, and if you remold that soil, it will remold to a smaller volume. We normally check that uh, we have a, uh, if, if this is a collapsible sand by subjecting a block sample uh, or an undisturbed sample to a test in the laboratory where it gets loaded, it gets uh, saturated, and we see how much that soil consolidates uh, during saturation. Um, the biggest problem uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, geotechnically in this country is expansive clays. It is, uh, I, I know from a presentation done by Dave Buttrick some years back that expansive clays cause more damage to structures than anything else, including dolomite. Um, dolomites are highly emotive sub subject, but expansive clays have done an enormous amount of damage. Um, the, the expansive clays uh, basically heave or shrink uh, as you add or sub subtract water from the profile. We look for, and I'll talk a little bit more about this just now, a shattered and slick inside its structure. Um, and the clay mineralogy is usually non-kaolin, okay, illite and montmorillonite uh, clays in particular. So if you're seeing a very white clay soil, uh, 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 rich in kaolin, you probably don't have a problem, um, except, and, and uh, I, I just want to reference Peter Day's um, talk earlier on, he mentioned the Tarba power station. When I started out in, in uh, the geotechnical industry, I um, worked on the Tarba power station because the very first job that I worked on. And the soils there are mostly kaolinitic, but, they um, were desiccated by the blue gum trees and resulted in a significant amount of heave taking place once the blue gum trees had been chopped out and the moisture content recovered uh, and, and the soil surface heaved by as much as 80 millimeters in places. When we tested it, it went as high as 200 millimeters. So um, yeah, be, be very careful. Desiccation changes properties. 
core stones, the third one that I want to tackle. These are, are the, the rocks that are left behind during the weathering process. Uh, they may be um, as a result of, of the, the jointing structure that's within the uh, rock mass that allows uh, the weathering front to move inwards from the joints, um, but doesn't quite complete the, the weathering process in the center of the block. And so we left with this round boulder. It may also be due to a change in mineralogy, it's slightly less, uh, so, sorry, slightly more resistant um, uh, miner mineralogy, re resistant to, to weathering might result in these, these uh, core stones being left behind. They are invariably associated with igneous rocks, um, again, this is a norite uh, that's weathered, um, but we find them in the granites as well. In fact, in most of the igneous um, uh, uh, rock types, uh, less so in the sedimentary and metamorphic, but some people have told me they have seen them there. Personally, I haven't. They are a problem for us because as you can imagine, if you placed a foundation uh, at this level here, it would be sitting on a hard boulder over there and very soft soils over here and you would then end up with a uh, very high differential settlement. Some of these core stones can be enormous. And of course that uh, creates problems for um, excavation. If you've dug a test pit close by and you find nice soft soil and you tell your engineers that uh, they can go and excavate all of this with a 30 ton excavator, no problem. And they then hit some monster like this and they have to blast. Well, you can imagine that the costs go up enormously. So looking for core stones or evidence of them is really important. Okay, I'm gonna really run very, very quickly through how, to, how we record a profile and how we see it, how we uh, describe soils uh, in the engineering or geotechnical fraternity. So uh, the one point I want to make here is that the soil pro profile is a really important assessment of uh, the site. Quite often we do no further testing. We just give our recommendations based on what we've seen in the profile. But if we do further testing, whether it's in situ or whether it's um, in the laboratory, the type of test that we do is going to be determined by the, uh, the, the, the record uh, in the profile. Right, the, what I'm going to be uh, describing to you is based very much on the, the Bible of soil profiling in South Africa, Jennings, Brink and Williams. Um, there is a standard SANS 633, which is applicable to Dolomite, uh, which describes how to profile as well. And we are looking at producing a forthcoming standard, um, which can, can uh, take this um, Jennings, Brink and Williams standard and, and uh, include some of the international um, standards uh, and modify it slightly. However, we are not, uh, as far as I can see, going to change um, the Jennings, Brink and William uh, profiling methodology substantially. Uh, we refer to it as the MCC SSO system and we record moisture, color, consistency, structure, soil texture and origin. I'll run through this very briefly. I, I do want to say though that I've looked at standards from around the world, New Zealand, uh, Europe, um, Britain, the United States, and I believe the South African standard is, is actually pretty good. Um, and we certainly, in the little group that's looking at revising this, I don't believe we're gonna need to change it all that much. Moisture is um, really important for us to, to, to record. We do have to bear in mind though that the moisture content in our soil profile changes with time. So it might be moist or uh, very moist now. Um, in a couple of years time, it may be dry because we are running through um, a, a drought. Nevertheless, it's important for us to record it, um, especially if, if um, the engineers are gonna come in and comp compact those soils. They want the soil to be uh, moist because that's where they get their maximum compaction. So they're either going to have to dry it out or, or wet it up depending on, on um, what is uh, what they want to do with it. Uh, we record the color. Um, I, I try and say to people don't get too fussed about color. However, some companies, some uh, groups require very precise definitions, in which case maybe use the Berlin or Munsell charts, um, which give you colors. 
uh, in rather weird descriptions, dusky green, which looks very gray to me, but in any case, that's the way it is. Um, secondary color gets described as well, speckling, mottling, blotching, streaking, staining, etc. cetera. Um, now, consistency is uh, one, one of the really important things for us to describe. And I, I just want to dwell on this for a couple of minutes because the, in the geotechnical world, the change from rock to soil is based on strength, okay? So the transition from rock to soil is dependent on the uniaxial compressive strength of the material. So a soil is regarded as material which has a uniaxial compressive strength of less than one MPA. In some textbooks, you'll see 0.75 MPA. Um, hopefully we'll reach an agreement within the industry soon and, uh, and, and button that one down. But in that range, 750 kPa to 1 MPa is our transition from soil to rock. Now, this can be substantially different from normal geological uh, descriptions. Um, so for example, a geologist uh, in exploration working on a mine uh, may record in his, in his borehole that he has saprolite running from north to 30 meters. Um, and then starts to describe the rock below that. In geotechnical terms, however, a large portion of that saprolite may be moderately or slightly, um, moderately or highly weathered rock, as Lindy will describe a little bit later on. And that um, uh, may, from a geotechnical perspective, still be a really good horizon. And in fact, we're dealing with this on one of the mine sites at the moment, where the geologist determined um, that the, the profile was, was weathered down to 30 meters. And based on that, a number of decisions were made um, uh, at an early stage in, in the layout of the mine, et cetera, um, as to, to what kind of um, uh, excavation would be needed to get down into the underlying um, uh, mine or the new mine. Now, when we went in there, what was described as the weathered zone is actually, from our perspective, a really competent rock zone, medium hard rock, soft rock. It's not even approaching soil. So for us, that differentiation uh, is really important. Soil is our low strength, less than one MPA um, uh, material, and rock is everything higher than that even though it may have been completely oxidized and therefore relegated to uh, the, that global term saprolite. All right, when we're describing consistency, uh, we don't describe it in terms of strength. We, we, we describe it as consistency. We use the pick and our fingers and our fingernails and whatever other tool we can come, come up with to, to, to look at. Um, describing the consistency. We break the consistency description into two different categories, non-cohesive and cohesive. So our clay and sandy soils. So our sandy soils, we describe with these descriptors, again, uh, as for many of the other descriptors, a category of five, um, very loose, loose, medium dense, dense, and very dense. For the cohesive soils, very soft, soft, firm, stiff, and very stiff. Please note that when you get to that very stiff and very de dense category, it becomes really quite difficult to differentiate between uh, very stiff and, and very soft rock, for example. And you may need to rely on in-situ testing and, and laboratory testing to uh, 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 differentiate between the two. Um, so that's, that's an area that um, one needs to uh, uh, be wary of. Otherwise, most of these uh, categories are quite easy to determine, but I do recommend that you work with an experienced practitioner before you try and um, categorize these. Just bear in mind that all of us are different in weight and strength. So I might be able to push a sharp pick in quite easily to 30, 40 millimeters. Somebody who is much lighter than me might find that uh, they would only push it into 10, 20 millimeters but it's the same soil. So you need to kind of calibrate uh, your, your strength and, and, and weight as it were with uh, an experienced practitioner's assessment. Structure, we, um, 
have a number of categories. The two important ones for us are pinholing. I described that a little bit earlier. That might indicate the presence of, of uh, collapsible sands. And then the shattered, micro shattered and slick and sided um, categories. These are, are indicative of highly expansive clays. And what happens with the highly expansive clays is that as they expand and contract through the years, they developed shear planes within them. And it's those shear planes that give the clays, especially if they're slightly on the dry side, they give it an almost gravelly appearance. When you start breaking the clay out, it breaks out along these polished planes. Um, and uh, these are the shear surfaces that are, are remnant that develop with the seasonal movement of, uh, within these clays as they move and shear themselves in order to accommodate uh, the moisture change, the content changing. Um, the the soil texture, basically the, the size of the sands, gravels and silts, these are, are generally quite easy to de determine. The boundary between sand and gravel being two millimeters, that's quite easy to remember. I call this the two six system. Um, it was, I think, bizarrely developed by the United States um, uh, uh, Army uh, guys. Um, I say bizarrely because uh, they don't normally work in millimeters in the, in the United States. It's usually inches. But um, it's very useful for us, and it seems to be pretty much a worldwide standard now. Um, please note that the coarse and medium sand you can observe with the naked eye. You can actually see it. Fine sand, you can only observe with a hand lens. You can't see it with the naked eye. And for that reason, a lot of people uh, make the mistake of describing fine sand as silt. Um, uh, so it takes some experience to um, get, get that boundary right as well. Um, and clay, of course, sticky, soapy material, um, usually fairly easy to determine. If we have gravels present, then they are class supported or matrix supported. Uh, we describe them as such. I'll give you an example just now. Um, and that's very much uh, the way you would describe a conglomerate. So you would describe the gravel itself, a hard, um, hard uh, uh, clast, uh, and then you would describe the matrix separately as a, as a clay or a sand. All right, we attempt to describe the, de to determine the origin of these horizons. Is it a residual uh, norite, a residual anorthosite? Is it uh, aeolian, um, alluvial? And please note that there is some importance attached to that because an alluvial uh, clay, for example, is usually the very worst kind of clay. Um, they, the the uh, waterborne, clays are often worse than uh, any other. So, so it's useful to get the, the origin. These are some of the examples, um, slightly moist, dark grayish brown, stiff, micro shattered and slick and sided sandy clay, alluvium. Um, I'm not gonna run through all of these. Uh, you will be able to look at them at your leisure, I'm sure. Uh, that's a gravel horizon, so matrix supported, medium and fine subrounded quartz gravel in a matrix of moist orange brown intact salty sand. We get that in overall consistency. We, it's very difficult to use the methodology that uh, I mentioned earlier to, to get the consistency because the gravel clasts get in the way of you pushing uh, the pick into the, 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 or your finger for that matter, into the material. So one has to try and make a rough overall assessment uh, based on pulling and, and, and uh, pressurizing the, the, the soil as best you can, or, or the gravel as best you can. Um, we separate the layers based on uh, changes in moisture content, changes in consistency, uh, changes in soil texture, obviously, and then changes in origin always. Um, but those are the important uh, separating uh, factors. So uh, you might find, for example, as I did out in uh, near Khanyesa, out in the Northwest province, uh, very thick um, Aeolian sands there with a collapsible grain structure. The upper meter was, uh, was moist, they'd had good rains. 
and the consistency was was very very low um it was uh, very very uh, soft but uh, as we got below the uh, the the migrating the downwards migrating waterfront uh the consistent consistency changed dramatically to dense um so the dry soil were, appeared to be uh, so much better same horizon but a change in consistency due due to a change in moisture so we record two different profiles for each of those layers um water inflow I, I cannot stress uh, how important it is to enough how important it is to record this. Um, virtually all geotechnical problems are associated with uh, changes in moisture content, um, either the material wetting up or drying out. Uh, and so the presence of the water table, uh, how much is running into the um, the ground, and and um, whether it's likely to be a perched water table or the actual underlying water table are really uh, important to to record and certainly any contractor who's coming to put in uh, foundations is going to need to know whether they are going to deal with with um, with water in the in the foundation excavations that's a, a an example of what a soil profile would look like. I'm afraid I still have old terminology in here. The reworked residual andesite would now be termed residual andesite. Um, but otherwise, that would be a typical geotechnical profile, uh, separating out the horizons, giving a legend, locating all the samples that we've taken on the one side, and noting where the uh, water inflow is present uh, on the side there as well. Um, uh, there would always be notes at the bottom as well about where, when, uh, and who did the excavations. And uh, please record your um, coordinates. These days you use a, a handheld GPS, make a note that it is, and sometimes it might be surveyed in. Please always, always give the map data. Many of the mines you will discover still work in the old Cape coordinate system. And that can put you out by a substantial amount on the ground, uh, as Lindy and I discovered many years back when we were looking at a site uh, down near Barberton. Um, we thought the map was in uh, WGS 84, and we found ourselves uh, completely the wrong side of a tailing stem. Luckily, Lindy picked it up and we corrected it. Um, the last aspect that I want to rip over is that obviously once you get down into the ground, uh, safety becomes an issue. Uh, in many parts of the world, uh, we, people are no longer allowed to get into test pits or, or pits deeper than one and a half meters. Um, and it may well be that at some point in the future, our safety industry is going to prevent us from going down holes as well. We, we still, as, as Peter mentioned earlier, go down auger holes. There is a code of practice for the safety of persons working in small diameter shafts, those are the auger holes, and test pits for geotechnical engineering purposes. You can get that code of practice from uh, SICE's Geotechnical Division website. You can order it. I, if you do work in this industry, please, please get that, uh, get that uh, code of practice. It has been vetted by the legal profession and it adheres to all the uh, standards. Um, when you get onto site, you need your legal appointments, you need all the hazard assessments to be made, um, and you need competent operators who are properly briefed. The only person that I personally know who died was died in a test pit, died in that test pit because it, the operator thought that um, the engineer had left site and he backfilled the pit, uh, not knowing that he was still down in the pit below. So uh, this kind of competency is really important. We no longer work um, with, 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 uh, on our own on site. We always have two people on site to prevent precisely this kind of accident from happening. Um, there are various uh, uh, issues that, that you need to be aware of, uh, especially toxic uh, poisons from waste dumps. Uh, we often work in uh, sites that have been uh, there are old waste dumps and you need to be really really careful 
Uh, if you are working down deep holes, auger holes, then you need harnesses and safety ropes, properly constructed winches and chairs that you're sitting in, competent support staff, and for heaven's sake, don't forget the gas and oxygen deficiency uh, detectors. Right, that's um, the conclusion of my of my uh, lecture. I'm sorry, I really rushed through things. Um, but it's, it's, uh, I hope I've given you some idea uh, of how we profile soils and uh, the approach that we adopt. Tony, thanks so much for that. Um, I'm sorry that you had to rush, but that is perfect timing. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm gonna give you a brief introduction to geotechnical rock classification. I'm no expert in this field, but I have done my fair share of core logging. Just uh, to note, like in um, Tony's um, lecture, this lecture will only give you some background to rock classification. It will not qualify you to profile rock or classify rock mass. You need to spend some time with an experienced geotechnical practitioner before being able to profile on your own. An understanding of rock and rock mass properties is important for tunnel support, slope stability, foundation stability, and rock excavation. Rock material is the term used to describe the intact rock between discontinuities. It might be represented by a hand specimen or a piece of drill core examined in the laboratory. The rock mass is the total in situ medium containing discontinuities such as bedding planes, faults, joints, folds, and other structural features. The geotechnical descriptors that are used should be understood by engineers and contractors and applicable to civil engineering. So some of the rock properties and descriptors that are important in geotechnical ap applications are rock type, strength, discontinuity characterization, weathering, RQD and groundwater conditions. In the description of the rock material, six basic parameters are, for, are of primary importance for the rock engineering purposes. These are color, degree of weathering, fabric, discontinuity spacing, strength, rock name, and in the stratigraphic horizon. Color is the most obvious characteristic. It is basic and useful for everyone. It can be used for correlation purposes. And the color should generally be described when the core is wet and the description of the predominant colors, try to limit it to two so it doesn't get too complicated. This can then be preceded by the shade and you can use a, a color chart. Any secondary color, coloration patterns can be described using this table. An example of color description would be light greenish gray, speckled black and streaked white. The next descriptor is weathering. Either mechanical, ke chemical or biological affects the engineering properties of the rock. So some of the more important effects of weathering on rock is the decrease in strength and density and the increase in deformability and porosity. There is a five-fold classification system. I won't go through these in too much detail, but basically unweathered rock shows no visible signs of alteration. Uh, slightly weathered rock may have some discoloration and um, especially around fractures and the fractures might be stained or discolored and may contain a thin filling or some altered material. Moderately weathered rock will have slight discoloration that extends a little distance from the fracture planes and maybe it'll be part, sort of the greater part of the rock. And the fractures will probably contain some filling and some altered material. Highly weathered rocks will have discoloration throughout the rock. Um, the original texture of the rock has mainly been preserved, but separation of grains is beginning to occur. Completely weathered rock is totally discolored, and it's here at the boundary between a rock and a soil, as Tony highlighted in his, in his lecture. The next descriptor is fabric, and this describes the microstructural and textural features of the rock material. Texture describes the arrangement and size of the individual grains of the minerals that make up the rock. And so the most noticeable textural feature is grain size. And a five-fold classification system is used based on the visual identification using a hand lens, much like you do with the soils. 
Microstructure, various rock types exhibit a definite structure characteristic of their origin. For example, bedding planes and sedimentary rocks, foliations in metamorphic rocks and flow banding in igneous rocks. Um, and this is recorded as a fabric type. The scale of these features is quite variable. So the smaller scale features are considered to be part of the fabric of the rock material. The structural microstructural spacing can be described using this system. It's a two six system, I think Tony brought up. Larger scale features form part of the discontinuity surface pattern of the rock mass. Discontin discontinuities are generally joints, faults and other fractures. And the discontinuity spacing can be described with these terms in an expansion of the previous table. So an example of a fabric description would be along the lines of fine grained, thinly bedded, widely jointed. In rock engineering, the rock material strength plays a dominant role. This influences excavation methods, permissible bearing pressures and tunnel support requirements. And are usually, these are usually directly related to the rock strength. So rock hardness is used as an index test, which provides some measure of rock material strength and is particularly valuable in terms of estimating the field strength. For the lower ranges there, up to medium hard rock, hardness is more readily and easily described in the field. And then the strength can be assessed from visual inspection and simple mechanical tests such as scratching with a knife or striking it with a hammer. An experienced geotechnical practitioner can make a reasonably accurate estimate of the strength from the knowledge of the hardness as well as the rock type. The actual strength would need to be determined by testing like uniaxial compressive strength tests or point low tests. Rock type and stratigraphic horizon. The rock name or type is quite significant in core logging. Not only does it identify the rock, but it also provides sort of an immediate picture of the likely engineering behavior of the rock. For example, it can give information on the strength or predicted joint systems, the presence of bedding planes and sedimentary rocks or weak zones, or it can give information on the abrasiveness of the rock for excavation purposes. Problems posed by construction on or excavation through mudstone, schist, dolerite or granite are quite different. So this gives us a good, a good idea as soon as you identify the rock type. The rock names should generally follow geological practice, and they, but they should be kept simple. You don't need to get too technical. Um, the stratigraphic horizon from which score was taken is often of engineering significance. Um, for example, there's slaking, known slaking in Beaufort mudstones, for example. So it's good to, to include the stratigraphic horizon. It also indicates what other rock types might be anticipated on a site. So when rock is classified in terms of or origin, the standard classification charts for sedimentary rocks and igneous and metamorphic rocks can be used. I'm not going to go through that, you guys are geologists. So. An example of a full primary description of rock would be something like dark grayish green, speckled white, slightly weathered, very fine grained, medium jointed, very hard rock, amygdaloidal andesites, Fentersdorp supergroup, just to give you an example. So additional information required for rocks. In particular, the engineering behavior of a rock mass is often controlled by the discontinuity surfaces which occur within it. So discontinuity frequency or spacing is the most effective feature to convey the effect of the discontinuities on the rock mass behavior. So we describe the spacing in the primary rock mass description like I've just explained, um, but the extent of the joints, their separation, and those factors may control the permeability, while orientation and the fracture filling may be of more significance to shear failure, for example. So a more detailed description of discontinuities is required for individual joint sets, and we'll only look at, and you only end up looking at natural discontinuities. So respective joint sets are distinguished primarily on the basis of their orientation. The two elements of the orientation comprise the, the dip angle and dip directional strike. 
Um, most commonly in boreholes, it is the dip angle alone that is the basis for identifying respective joint sets. And then we use the same spacing classification as for the primary description, this table. And the difference is that the spacing is only relevant then to the discontinuities in each identified set. So you don't consider all the discontinuities together, it's just for each set. The persistence of the various joints can normally be recognized within borehole, can't normally, sorry, be recognized within borehole cause um, as, expo as opposed to an extensive rock outcrop. The best that might be expected in the case of borehole core is, is that the discontinuities can either be continuous or discontinuous. Um, the surface type or joint shape as with persistence, it's not often able to be observed in a, in a borehole. The examples of the shape or large scale roughness would include waviness, curving, straightness. A five-fold system is used to describe the discontinuity surface roughness found in the borehole scale as shown in this table. The next de detail noted is the separation or aperture. It is rare that the details on the joint separation or aperture can be recorded in borehole core, but it is an important element in the assessment of shear strength of the fractures. So the aperture classifications used generally in rock mass are summarized in this table. So a lot of this will have changed um, through disturbance of the, of the core from the drilling process. That's why we can't generally tell within bore, uh, from borehole core. It would really only be useful um, when we're looking at a big rock surface. Wall strength, the next one. Um, we use index tests like we do for the rock hardness to measure the wall strength. Um, it's the same as the, for the primary description of the rock mass. The state of weathering and alteration of the discontinuity walls uh, needs to be described use, and you'll use the weathering classification as shown previously as well. The type and thickness of infill materials should also be recorded. The descriptors used are shown in this table. So for example, um, a description of some infill could be something along the uh, lines of um, surface staining or calcite fill one millimeter thick or 10 millimeters of cemented breccia or stiff clay or whatever it is. And it is recognized that um, the weaker infill materials will often be lost uh, in boreholes because from the effects of the drilling. Um, so you won't be able to actually record the full thickness in a borehole. Okay, rock mass classification. So this is the process of placing a rock mass into groups or classes on defined relationships and assigning a unique number to it based on similar properties. So the behavior of the rock mass can be predicted. Rock mass classification systems allow you to follow a guideline and place the object in an appropriate class. So there are two kinds of rock mass classification systems. There are quantitative systems, for example, RQD, RMR, and Q. And then there's qualitative as well, for example, GSI, the Geological Strength Index. But there are many systems. Some, this table sort of shows some of the more well-known systems. We don't have time to cover them all. So I'll go through, briefly go through the ones mentioned in this previous slide. The first rock mass classification system we will look at is RQD, which stands for Rock Quality Designation. There you go. Uh, Lindy, your yes. sound was off. It's fine. Was off? Sorry, it, it looks like it's actually my connection. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. You need me to go back? No, no, I'm, I'm fine. Thanks. Uh, you can okay. continue. Okay, all right. So looking at um, RQD, 
This was uh, developed to provide a quantitative estimate of rock mass quality, basically from borehole core. The RQD is the total length of solid core pieces, each 10 centimeters or longer, recovered in a drill run, and this is ex expressed as a percentage of that core run. So in this um, example, adding the length of the pieces longer than 10 centimeters divided by the core run gives a percentage of 55%. And 55 gives it a rock quality description of fair from this table. The next um, classification system we'll look at is RMR, which is the rock mass rating. This uses six parameters to classify a rock namely the uniaxial compressive strength of rock material, rock quality designation that I've just been through, spacing of discontinuities, condition of discontinuities, groundwater conditions, and the orientation of discontinuities. This table includes the first five classification parameters. The parameters have different significance for the overall classification of a rock mass. So the different value ranges of the parameters have been assigned based on their importance. So you'll notice that the, the better classification for the condition of joints is 30, whereas the better classification for the strength of the material is only 15. So a higher value represents better rock mass conditions. More detail for um, number four, the uh, discontinuity conditions is given in this table. It gives guidelines for ratings for discontinuity characteristics, including the discontinuity length, the separation, roughness, in full or gouge, and then the weathering of the discontinuities. So looking at the sixth parameter, the orientation of discontinuities, the top table reflects the effect of discontinuity angles with respect to excavation direction. So this gives a description which is then used in the second table. The second table shows the rating adjustment for joint orientations based on the first table. So these, the, in the second table, these are an adjustment, hence the negative values. The RMR classes in this top table give a description for the rock mass based on the RMR value. So we then get a class and it gives a description being very good rock, good rock, fair rock, poor rock, and very poor rock. And the second table then shows estimates of the tunnel stand-up time and the maximal, maximum stable rock span, as well as the rock mass cohesion and friction angle for the rock mass classes. This will all be used in the design um, when excavating the tunnel. Q is the rock mass quality value. This was developed in Norway and it is defined and calculated in this formula. Where RQD is the same as we've discussed previously. JN is the joint set number based on the number of discontinuity sets. JR, the joint roughness number and is based on the roughness of discontinuity surfaces. JA is the joint alteration number to the degree of alteration or weathering and filling of discontinuity surfaces. JW, joint water reduction number, which is related to the pressure and inflow rates of water within discontinuities. SRF, the stress reduction factor, which is given by the presence of shear zones, stress concentrations, squeezing or the swelling of rocks. So the first quotient, RQD over JN, represents the rock mass. It's a measure of sort of the block or wedge size. So the table we use is the same one we've seen already. Get the RQD value and then the joint set number. So this is based on the, uh, the number of joint sets, not direct link, but it's based on that. So if it's uh, the, the number is higher for the worse uh, or for the higher number of joint sets. The second quotient, JR over JA, relates to interblock shear strength. 
It represents the roughness and frictional characteristics of the joint walls or filling materials. So this quotient is weighted in favor of rough, unaltered joints that are in direct contact with each other. So the high values of this quotient represent better mechanical qualities of the rock mass. So here the joint roughness, rough or irregular joints, for example, have a fairly high, um, sorry, sort of have a fairly low value, but and discontinuous joints where it's not throughout the whole rock have a very high joint roughness number. Your lowest being the slick and sided or very planar joints. The joint alteration number, You've got higher values um, when you are looking at uh, clay filled joints and much lower values when they are very tight, um, hard, impermeable joints. The third quotient, JW over SRF, is an empirical factor representing active stress incorporating water pressures and flows, the presence of shear zones and clay bearing rocks, squeezing and swelling rocks, and also the in situ stress state. So JW looks at the water pressures and flows through joints. The more water, uh, sorry, the drier the joint, the higher the number, and the more water flowing through the, flowing through the joint, the lower the number. SRF is a measure of loosening load in the case of an excavation through shear zones and clay bearing rock. Also rock stress in competent rock and any squeezing loads in plastic incompetent rocks. So the third quotient increases with decreasing water pressure and favorable in situ stress ratios. So actually using this, this um, index feature, this Q, to be able to relate it to the stability and support requirements of underground excavations, there is an additional parameter which is called the equivalent dimension or DE. And this dimension is obtained by dividing the span, diam span diameter or wall heights of the excavation by a quantity called the excavation support ratio, ESR. The value of ESR is related to the intended use of the excavation and to the degree of security which is demanded of the support system installed to maintain the stability of the excavation. So as shown here, it's a fairly high number for temporary mine openings and a very low number for railway stations or any public facilities. So there are several graphs like this available that show Q versus the equivalent dimension. And this then gives you an estimated support for the different rock classes. So if you've got a um, very good rock class, you would need, uh, you wouldn't need much support, maybe a little bit of bolting, but if you got an exceptionally poor rock, basically you would want to cast concrete lining. GSI, the geological strength index. This is, this is based on a visual inspection of geological conditions. It's nice because it's very simple, fast and pretty reliable system. Um, it provides a means to quantify both the strength and deformation properties of a rock mass. So there's quite a few of these tables available and they have been modified for different areas, for different rock types, for uh, many different purposes. So you'd have to find one that is suitable for your needs. Here's another example of one that was modified in 2000. And so basically it's best to just find one of these tables that is suitable for your needs. Looks like in my haste to get through this and cover all this, all these topics, I went very quickly. 
Are there any questions? I wanted to ask a couple of questions about the borehole um, classifications. And so one of the problems we had when looking at joint sets in boreholes is that quite often they're not all at exactly the same angle or orientation, but they have similar features. And I just wondered in any of the classifications, is there a acceptable range of orientation that you can group joint sets into? So sort um, of, is it? Hmm. I, yeah, I look, generally, um, probably about sort of, I've often used the range of about 10 degrees. I mean, you can go up to 15, especially if they're very similar. I mean, if you've got um, orientated core, obviously it's much better because in a, you know, in a rock face, it's going to vary slightly. It's never going to be perfectly straight. So in, in borehole core, it's much more difficult to see that. So I, yes, I would allow for a sort of 10 to 15 degree range. So that's okay. Okay, and then thank you. And then my second question was um, the UCS values that are used in the RML calculation. Quite often, I've seen that calculated as as a batch to the laboratory at the beginning of the project, and then and then sort of left as a regional UCS value. Is that is that the best method, or should it be using UCS values for each individual borehole? Um, that's, that's a bit difficult. I would, I would probably go with UCS values. Um, you want to spread through different, uh, the different rocks like, so yes, within a borehole, but also across the site. So, and probably yeah. to keep testing it, not to just do one lot. What what would sorry what would uh, uh, change the UCS value significantly in a particular rock type? Something like an aquifer or the weathering or yeah, weathering weathering in general is going to be the the main factor in that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Pleasure. Again, Lindy, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, it was very informative, and I think it's, as Xavier has mentioned, it's, it's very interesting to see the other side of geosciences, you know, from a geological perspective, um, we, we know about faults and joints and that, um, but we never had the opportunity to go in depth and understand or get a better understanding of how the geotechnical aspects are you know, classified in those terms. So yeah. thank you very much for, for bringing that forward. Um, and I must say it's going to help with my presentation later this afternoon, for sure. <laughs> Lindy, can I just have a question? Yes, please go for it. That's just what I ask. Lindy, uh, <clears throat> how do you handle the, what's called scanline orientation bias? That's the bias of the, the borehole in relation to the joints and RQDs. It's biased towards all the joints going at right angles to the borehole instead of the yeah. joints going parallel to the borehole. Yeah, they never, I mean, you, you, you generally won't get it that that's too much influence because there's never a perfectly straight joint. So often, for example, a 90, uh, a 90 degree joint set you're, you're still going to hit it sometimes within your within your borehole so even if you tend to be to be drilling down next to a 90 degree joint set you're still going to hit it sometimes because they never run perfectly straight so there isn't too much of a it seems to sort of level out is is the idea so is that making sense not really uh, because you you're going to hit Borehole's going at 90 degrees, you're going to yes. hit more often than joints going parallel to the ball. Yes, but that gives you the perfect spacing for the joints. Oh, going parallel. So this is what I was trying to say. So the, um, the, 
the joints sort of going parallel to the ball hole, you will still hit sometimes because they are never perfectly straight. So you will get an idea of them, even if it just skirts just the side of the joint, you still see it there and you can still get your but, spacing. But you only are, see it now and again. That's it. And so those ones are very difficult to give your joint spacing on. But um, so they don't have a huge um, uh, implication onto your RQD in that, in that regard. But most of the time you're looking at those downward pressures anyway. So your, your 90 degree joints, you will get, you will easily be able to get your spacing there for your joint spacing and your RQD measurements. How do you do that? But those, those are the ones that are perpendicular to your, to your bore hole. Yeah, so those, you, those you can do, but the ones going parallel to the bore hole, you don't get a joint spacing there. there. You can't generally get a joint spacing there. You won't so, get it. John, generally in practice, um, you would then, if you have now identified potentially that there are joint space or joint sets that are parallel to your drilling, you then design a new drilling program to, to hit that at a, a, a better angle. So that you yeah. can get that data to get those joint set characteristics. Yeah. Yeah. That's what people have proposed and um, drilling walls in different directions. Yes. But until you can do that, you can't get an accurate RQD or joint spacing. Yeah. So if you want a good, a, a, a good site investigation and you want to get a good RQD value for the rock, you would generally need to do some inclined holes. But John, you must also remember most of these calculations, they all end up being conceptual. Any exploration, you cannot get 100% coverage because then you're basically taking out the entire rock. You have to do statistical analyses and all of that to determine then what that RTD is. It's never going to be the exact value because you cannot... Um, take out the entire rock um, because then you've got nothing left over. So you have to, you start with a, a coarse joint spacing to get an idea of what the situation, you know, what joint sets are possibly there. You then go into further investigations, get in your, your, um, your closer drilling spacing so that, and then obviously drilling at different angles. So it is, it's something that you develop. So you get an official first, say pre-feasibility understanding going into your feasibility. So yes, by looking at one borehole in an area, you can't define what the joint sets are. You can, however, define what the joint sets are in that particular borehole. Um, but you then you, you, you have to have another borehole close by in order to extrapolate between that data. So it's, it's just purely on data density and obviously drilling at a different angle to get all those values. Yeah. So, I hope that's answered your question there, John. No, um, how do you combine it? If you've got RQD measured in a borehole going one direction and another RQD in a borehole going in a different direction, they'll be different. And how do you combine them? There is numerical modeling. Yeah. So, you, you put you these values, that? you put these values into a 3D space. And you are able then to do numerical modeling and extrapolate this in 3D. Um, is there a program available for it? As far um, as I understand, yes, there's several. Yeah. Yes, many. Um, I actually I use them in as it's not a geotechnical program, but I use in Leapfrog Geo. I use the numerical methods there to develop um, numerical ISO shells. Uh, it's obviously it's not used for the geotechnical stability analyses and um, core pressure analyses, and that, but I use it as a conceptual understanding in hydrogeology. But yeah, John, if you would like, we can chat after um, and get a bit more understanding on your side, if you would like. Um, yes, I would love it. Perfect. Um, I see Alan Golding has his hand up. Okay, thank you. Pleasure, thank you. Uh, hi there. Yes, hi. Um, I had, looking at the presentation, you had a, a slide showing how you would do RQD on a ball. 
And I noted that you in, there was a section of core which had a vertical joint or fracture splitting the core in two, but you still included it in the RQD. Is that correct? That's the one. Okay. Now there was a section that L equals 20. Right. So RQD measurements are taken along the center line of the core. So if the joint doesn't necessarily cut the center line, which this one is just off the center line. So you're measuring from that break to that one. See, That's really the convention for RQD. You measure along this, the core axis, the center line of the core. As you can okay. see, the other are done from sort of the center. Oh the center. Yeah. Okay. I, I thought they had to be solid sticks. No, 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 they don't necessarily have to be. That one skirts the side of the joint. So no. Okay. I mean, the Thank you the very joint. much for time. So, just one question on the rock hardness. Oh, there, there. Yeah, it's from Marina. So the, 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 the rock hardness um, is related to the strength. So here the strength um, ranges for the different rock hardnesses given. So these ones you can only determine to get hard rock, very hard rock or extremely hard rock, you need to do lab testing or in situ testing, but these ones you can determine in the field. And then at least it gives you a range of the rock strength on this side. I hope that answers your question. Would rock strength also then not need to take into account ductile versus brittle deformation? Um, I think that, that comes up th through the lab testing. So it would then change um, your, your strength results. Hi, could I chime in here, Kriti? Yes, go for it. Um, I have one quick question. Um, the rock hardness field determination, you may have covered this now, but sorry, I had a work call to take quickly. Um, does that, do these descriptions coincide with Sands 1200D. For, for the excavation stuff, yes. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. Pleasure. All right. Thank you very much. I think we can move on to the next uh, presenter. We've got Willem Menkes, who's going to be presenting the role of engineering geology in land use planning and infrastructure development. Um, thank you, thank you, Camille, and uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, so, so as introduced, I'll uh, just give an overview in terms of uh, engineering geology as it relates to land use planning and, and infrastructure development. Um, so the intention of this presentation is not to, it, uh, I, I didn't make it too technical. I mean, obviously, it's a, it's a, it's a vast subject area uh, with a lot of things to cover, but um, uh, since it seemed like a, a majority of the attendees might not be too familiar with uh, engineering geology uh, specifically, um, I, I tried to just package it uh, such to give a, a appreciation and overview of, of the role of engineering geology in, uh, in these areas. So this is just a, a brief outline, but basically, um, I'll just take us through in terms of you know what what is engineering geology. I think some of the uh, the previous speakers did touch on that um, and and went into a bit of detail in that as well. Um, and then where it fits into uh, typically what we do, uh, and then I'll just maybe go through some examples uh, in terms of where engineering geology features in in the built environment and 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 land development. So, uh, so as, as mentioned earlier today as well, so engineering geology, it's a, a specialized branch in geology. Uh, so uh, people able to register as professional natural scientists on the SACNASP. Um, so basically uh, it's the uh, scientific background of geology then paired with rock and soil mechanics. Um, and, and the purpose of that is to inform site investigation uh, by means of site investigation techniques um, inform the design and construction aspects of, of infrastructure in the built environment um, and then also to provide advice and uh, a guidance in terms of land use planning specifically as it relates to, to geohazards. 
So uh, just on the opposite side of that, as, as Peter also uh, nicely pointed out this morning in terms of geotechnical engineering, so that is a specialist branch of, of, of civil engineering. So they register as, as professional engineers under EXA. Um, and they are typically the ones that then use the geotechnical in, uh, information from the scientific side uh, to, uh, to implement design projects and also to do detailed um, design. So, so other um, uh, professional um, people are also obviously involved in this in terms of your town planners, uh, structural engineers, uh, and then also on the developer side. Um, so, so it's quite a, uh, the whole value chain in terms of construction, um, but usually the geotechnical aspects are right at the beginning uh, and then it's carried throughout the, the process as well. So, so just a, a short definition in terms of what is engineering geology. I think uh, most people attending would have uh, sort of gotten to that to an extent uh, by now. Um, but it's mainly the application of geological science to the engineering practice. Um, so, so as I've mentioned, um, factors affecting um, feasibility of uh, specific infrastructure to be constructed in places, um, hazards and risks associated with operations and maintenance, uh, post-construction as well as during construction. Um, and the main purpose of that is to, uh, to ensure that all the geological factors that might impact on engineering works are adequately recognized and provided for, um, mainly to, um, to avoid risks uh, and, and you know, uh, subsequent damages uh, downstream, uh, as well as to cater for uncertainty, specifically when it comes to the, uh, to the design side of things. Um, so, so I've heard a talk, uh, well, it was actually some time ago now, um, and uh, it was quite interesting. It was an engineer that presented, um, and he indicated that, that typically in structural engineering, uh, specifically, they, they heavily rely on quantitative methods uh, to, you know, do their designs and all of that. Um, so typically, they would work to the accuracy, to the, to the order of three decimal uh, places when they're doing their calculations. Um, but typically um, when you look at, at soil mechanics and also rock mechanics, you are looking at the ranges of accuracy for 150 to 300%. So because of geological heterogeneity and, and uncertainty, um, I mean, the, the discussion on joints that was just uh, uh, um, doing the rounds is a good indication. So obviously using geological principles uh, the whole idea is to to try and, and and minimize uncertainty to the extent that a design can be rationally uh, compiled and then obviously as as uh, uh, construction works continue then uh, geologists are usually involved in that space as well to visually inspect uh, any changes you know once the excavations and things like that start uh, so I, I found this nice diagram. I think it's a good summary of um, some of the branches of geology. I think some of them might have changed, obviously, now over the years. And there's a new uh, emerging branches also uh, coming out. Um, so, so you have your typical traditional uh, mining geology um, in the exploration space um, and also in the mining space. Um, but engineering geology sits here on the side. On this diagram, so typically it looks at the structural geological aspects, uh, mathematics and physics. So it's more the physical properties of materials. Um, however, in the built environment space, um, a lot of these different disciplines of geology to, to various degrees are taken into consideration. Uh, for instance, your hydrogeology, when you look at symmetry sites, for instance, uh, environmental geology, um, Geophysics, it's, it's often used. Uh, also mineralogy and your petography. Um, and then obviously as well, the stratigraphy and, and sedimentology, all those geological processes as well uh, in terms of characterizing a site and, and coming up with uh, a conceptual model that can be used to um, provide design information for the engineers going forward. Um, so this was shown as well uh, earlier today. So um, 
in the 70s and 80s, um, Brink compiled these volumes of the engineering geology of Southern Africa. Um, and, and I'm actually glad here, Peter also mentioned it this morning. And, and as you could see from the presentations, there's a lot of guidelines and norms and standards um, that we currently have available today that we, that we can use uh, to make our work easier. Um, but the principle is, and, and he mentioned that is the, um, the fundamentals of the science uh, mustn't be forgotten because it's, it's quite easy to uh, pick up a guideline or a, uh, a, you know, a standard of sorts and then just sort of following it as a, as a, as a sort of tick box or, or recipe book. Um, so a lot of work has been done over the years in terms of the fundamental aspects of engineering geology and the science of engineering geology. And all of that culminated and led to the development of these, uh, these guidelines and standards that we have today that, that really makes our lives a bit easier. Um, but still the body of knowledge that sits behind these guidelines and standards must definitely not be forgotten. So, so in terms of where engineering geology in the, in the ge and the geotechnical studies uh, fit into, um, so it's pretty much uh, any type of civil or mining related construction uh, in the built environment that you can think of will require geotechnical inputs to, to different levels. Um, so obviously um, taking into consideration the, um, the cost of the development, uh, the risks uh, and uncertainties that, that are associated with that development. So you can appreciate that, for instance, uh, the geotech investigation for an open pit mine will be completely different than, for instance, for low cost housing. Um, the purpose of the investigation, uh, as well as the, the design requirements uh, in terms of the structures that are being um, um, constructed, that, that's all factors that will guide and dictate what level of uh, geotechnical inputs are required uh, in terms of the different uh, infrastructure that's being planned. So typically in the mining, mining space, uh, basically all infrastructure is related with mining. So from the excavations, the tunnels, the pits, uh, shafts, the tailings uh, and waste rock piles, all roads, uh, all of those things do require geotechnical inputs. Um, then in the civil space, all your dams, power stations, bridges, and so forth. Um, then buildings, so any type of building that's contemplated to be constructed, uh, whether it being from low cost housing, all the way through to high rise commercial buildings, um, they would all need geotechnical investigations to be, to be done. Um, and similarly for, for infrastructure and, um, and related facilities. Uh, then another aspect of engineering geology in the built environment uh, is construction materials and the suitability of materials to be used in, in construction. Um, so that's typically for your road layers, uh, railway lines and ballast um, in the cement and, and building industry. So um, pretty much all types of, of construction materials and uh, similar to, to where the links to the geotechnical profession is, there's also links to materials engineering, uh, which is a completely separate field in the space of engineering. Um, that, that also there's a lot of collaboration that, that can and do happen from time to time in that space as well. Um, but mainly from a engineering geology point, we are looking at natural geological materials. Um, so we, we don't usually um, look at uh, engineered materials that much. Uh, then another aspect as well, and this more relates to, to land use aspects is uh, with regards to geohazards, risk management and community safety. Um, so that's typically where your landslides, dolomite land, undermining, uh, things like that come in to, to guide uh, development at a planning, a strategic planning level. Um, and then also in terms of risk management uh, and, and the operations and maintenance of, of that infrastructure. So um, I think I've mentioned these other things, but uh, I think fundamentally it's uh, engineering geology plays a role in uh, risk characterization, as well as trying to reduce uncertainties uh, in ground conditions, specifically in the in the 
um, built environment space in terms of the design and, and construction processes. Um, so then this is just to elaborate a bit more. This is some of the typical sort of legs of engineering geology, if you may, that, that we look at. So I've mentioned resources for construction projects, um, determining the conditions of founding horizons, uh, the ge geomechanical properties of, of those um, materials, as well as, uh, you know, how, how to how the geological conditions on a site can uh, change, have an influence on the contemplated designs. And I'll, I'll show some examples in a minute on what I mean by that. Um, and then obviously we try to, to characterize the lateral extent of the different uh, geological horizons uh, and their properties uh, from, a, from a geotechnical perspective. Um, and then also mitigating geological hazards. So that's the identification of hazards, um, depending on the scale and the purpose as well, and, and also the degree to which it needs to be characterized. Um, and then usually that finds expression to the extent of um, land use planning, uh, policy development uh, in government. Um, so, so that's another uh, aspect of, of engineering geology. Um, to land use development and infrastructure. So, so this is typically, uh, this is not an exhaustive list, um, but this is typically some of the things that we, that we look at. Um, I haven't included everything since some of the subsequent talks will, will touch on uh, more specific aspects. Um, but these are typically what we refer to as problem soils or think that, things that have a, a significant bearing on uh, infrastructure development. So we know about collapsible soils. I think Tony Tony went through that very nicely. Expansive soils. Uh, we also look at uh, dispersive soils. Uh, that's especially you know in terms of uh, erosion, stability of embankments and dams, things like that. Um, shallow groundwater and soft clays, compressible materials, uh, non-durable rock that speaks to the aggregate side and and also geohazards. Um, and then typically your areas where you have excavation difficulty, that's usually a uh, factor that, that significantly <clears throat> uh, increases the, uh, the cost of construction, uh, especially where you have uh, developments that are sensitive to cost. Uh, for instance, low cost housing, uh, you can't be spending a whole lot of money necessarily on, you know, blasting to get services in. Uh, because there's uh, uh, obviously finite resources in that. And then um, I think Lindy also touched on some of these things uh, when we look at uh, strength of materials and bearing capacity, um, specifically for foundation purposes, but then also for stability of, of underground excavations or, uh, you know, embankments and things like that. Um, so other, some, some of the other uh, things we look at, obviously it's a dolomitic and uh, mining related subsidence. Um, to a, a lesser extent in South Africa, paleo seismicity. I know a broad engineering geology and seismology works very closely uh, uh, with one another. Um, although since South Africa is mainly a seismic, um, it's not a, a, a big focus. So the seismology people usually uh, do their own bit, uh, and then that's get they get fed into uh, the ge uh, uh, engineering design aspects. Um, so this is typically some of the problems that we, we try to look at and, and characterize when we uh, contemplating uh, land use and, and infrastructure related uh, aspects. So I'll, I'll just go through a couple of examples uh, in terms of application. Um, so uh, some of the speakers mentioned earlier today, so, so traditionally from a geological point of view, uh, we would look at hard rock geology maps. Uh, so that's a typical one, one in 50,000 geology map of the Belleville area. Um, but when you start considering these rock types um, for a, uh, from a geotechnical perspective, uh, there's quite a number of different factors that you have to take into consideration. So it's not only the, the rock type, but also the uh, weathering properties of that rock, the uh, uh, other factors that might contribute positively or negatively to, to development. Um, and, and that only 
doesn't only cover the hard rock geology, but also the regolith and the, uh, the soil-like overburden um, that's usually not mapped out in detail in, in our 50,000 geology maps. So I've put this in because depending on the scale of the development you are looking at, you know, scale, scale is everything in engineering geology. So you would not typically use, for instance, a 50,000 geotechnical or engineering geological map for designing a foundation for a structure at, a, at the earth level. So this is mainly intended for regional town planning uh, purposes, uh, optimal route selection, you know, to determine uh, as part of the feasibility or pre-feasibility studies, for instance, in infrastructure development, you would want to consider some of the geological factors that might Im uh, impact on development. So uh, you might use uh, typically a 50,000 scale geotechnical map to determine maybe three or four different route options and then on the basis of that select one and then uh, go through the whole process process all the way to construction. Um, so this is just uh, two tables to uh, give an appreciation on some of the geotechnical factors that we do look at uh, when, when from, a, from a land development perspective. Um, so most of them are actually related to, to problem soils. Um, so on the left-hand table, uh, that was the uh, list that was compiled by, by Partridge Wood and Brink in 93, I believe. Um, so typically we look at uh, collapsible soil, seepage, uh, expansive soils and compressible material, erodibility and dispersive soils, then difficulty of excavations, uh, then anything related to, to subsidence, so that's undermined or dolomite land, uh, other geohazards, uh, typically steep slopes, uh, unstable slopes, uh, seismicity and flooding. So those are the typical um, parameters that can impact on development in terms of, of cost and feasibility. Um, and then another aspect of that, that that's also, you know, uh, taken into consideration uh, is typically your permeability of soils. Uh, so that's more related to landfill uh, sites, hazardous waste sites, cemetery sites, uh, things like that. And then also the acidity or the aggressiveness of soil to, to corrosion. So this is a, a different uh, scale then. So this is typically at the, at the earth level or the development scale. Uh, so what you'd find is a developer or a town planner or engineer would come and say, look, we wanna develop specific structure on a stand. Uh, this is what we are planning. Um, then the engineering geologist would have to go and investigate the site and determine is it feasible and, and how must the designs then obviously be adapted or to cater for ground conditions? Uh, so, so this specific site is in, in Polokwane. So they intended on building a seven story structure here. Initially, they wanted to do three basements uh, to the structure as well. Um, but subsequent to the uh, geotech investigation, the designs had to be, uh, had to be changed. So, this is typically, um, you know, at the during the construction stage, you know, when they when they opened up the site, they started with the excavations. Um, all of the uh, borals that were drilled, for instance, on this site, um, it mainly showed um, cocytic gneiss um, in the borals. So the designs were obviously done according to that. Uh, pretty competent rock, strong enough to. Uh, to allow for the for the design that was contemplated at the time, um, but by the stage that construction started, um, everything basically changed. So there was a very very thin band of micaceous gneiss uh, that that cut across the site. So all of the borals that were drilled missed this specific zone. Uh, zone. So there was a uh, we found subsequently there was a, a shear zone uh, cutting across the site. Um, and this caused a lot of problems. There was uh, slope failures of the of the excavations. You can see this block that uh, that came off on the on the left hand side. Uh, a lot of groundwater seepage uh, to the extent that they had to um, start pumping out water, uh, which caused the uh, uh, lowering of the water level on adjacent properties. 
Um, and, and as a result of that, and I think Peter also showed to, to an extent uh, some of the case studies that, that he encountered, but even though site investigations are sometimes you know, done to the best that we can to, to address uncertainty, uh, you still can't cater for everything. So uh, subsequent to this on the specific site, you know, the engineers during the time of construction also had to rethink uh, the design uh, solution for the foundations uh, based on this very, very small feature uh, that was not picked up during the uh, site investigation. Then uh, another um, example is typically your um, hazardous waste site facilities or landfills, cemeteries, things like that. Um, so, so this is usually quite interesting um, investigations in the sense that it's, it's, a, it's a bit more multidisciplinary. Uh, so you'll obviously make use of more geophysics. There's usually a very strong groundwater or hydrogeological study linked to this. Uh, and then um, the geotechnical side of things as well. Uh, so typically, uh, in the same sense, you'd have some, uh, some sort of a conceptual engineering design, uh, which is based on a, on a best case scenario, not necessarily at that point taking into consideration the ground conditions, um, which then have to be investigated to see, is it feasible, what needs to change, um, and what are the implications of the geological aspects to, uh, to the specific development? So in this sense, this is typically what uh, the site looks like on the ground. So uh, on the left-hand side is a, a subsequent to the uh, uh, geotechnical investigation, uh, it was found that there's a, a big east-west trending um, uh, fault cutting across the, the site that was uh, subsequently intruded with a, with a dolerite dike. Um, and that has led to a, to a lot of you know, erosion. The soils are typically dispersive. Uh, you get your slaking uh, mud, mud rocks on top. Um, and that had, had got significant implications in terms of the operations and maintenance of, of, of the specific facility since uh, this, this pretty much cut the site in half. So you can imagine now managing waste uh, across this, uh, you'll have to uh, get some sort of a solution to, to be able to, you know, from a logistics point to, to get material across. Uh, then obviously as well, um, contaminant transportation, what's the implications of that? Um, that also had to be considered. Then from a um, excavation or a earthworks perspective, um, uh, this was a test bit that, that was excavated in, in one of the waste cells. Um, so the engineering design typically um, ideally wanted excavation depths of up to about six meters uh, to be able to, to cater for the life of the facility in terms of our as waste get, get dumped uh, so that they can cap it at the top uh, in, the, in the end of its lifetime. But Subsequent to the, uh, the geotechnical investigation, this is typically what was found in some of the waste cells. So this is about just over half a meter of, uh, of overburden, and then you, then you start hitting bedrock. Um, so for this type of facility, obviously you can't go out and, and blast big amounts of, of areas to just make space for, for waste to be dumped. Um, so the designs also had to be amended in, in that sense. Then also from a um, uh, construction materials perspective, um, so this is typically part of the uh, Karua Supergroup uh, geology in general, um, but a lot of the material, uh, you know, subsequent to lab testing was found not to be adequately suitable for the uh, use in, in constructed clay liners uh, to prevent you know, groundwater seepage uh, or seepage uh, infiltrating the groundwater. So that also had to be reconsidered based on the availability of materials uh, from the engineering side, uh, what other solutions can be found on the specific site, for instance, uh, to, to prevent the uh, lateral movement of seepage into the groundwater. Then more from a, a regional perspective, um, so one of the aspects we, we also look at is your, uh, typically your regional landslide susceptibility mapping. Um, to some extent, it's also a matter of scale. So obviously if you are looking at a 
center line for a national road, you'll you'll go into a lot more detail. Uh, and you, you do you'll do uh, for instance some drilling and lab analyses and and modeling of the slopes. Um, but then also from a from a land use perspective on on that scale, I mean you can't go and do a detailed study on each and every landslide that have ever occurred. Uh, it's it's just going to be too costly. So on a regional scale, that, uh, we typically do susceptibility maps uh, and 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 modeling. So this is a recent landslide happened in in uh, KwaZulu Natal province at the Sangwane Mountains. Um, so you can see here that's the the um, the scar that was left by this landslide. So just for appreciation of scale. Uh, from the crown of the landslide to the runout, that's about 170 meters height difference. So, so it was quite a significant uh, event. And these these sort of events also give some sort of an indication on what you can expect in a uh, on a regional scale uh, when doing this type of work. Um, so obviously, you know, we'll do some geological mapping, uh, look at the uh, the causes of some of these faults uh, to uh, or, or landslides to um, including regional monitoring uh, and modeling. So um, this typical uh, landslide was was mainly um, due to uh, fractures uh, along along fault zones, uh, mainly trending uh, northwest southeast, um, and as a result of of rainwater prolonged rainwater. Um, these uh, planes basically got lubricated and that whole block uh, came down. So this is one of the typical examples. So you might ask, what's the, what's the relevance of this? So um, I've just included some two, two case studies or examples of the implications of this uh, in terms of development and land use. So two notable uh, tropical cyclones that have hit the country. So the one was the Leon Elin cyclone in 2000, uh, the year 2000 in Limpopo. Uh, so the, the effects of that um, cyclone as a result of subsequent landslides uh, caused over a billion rands in infrastructure damage uh, to the province. Uh, you can see obviously there was a lot of fatalities and, and damage to houses as well. Uh, and similarly, the more recent one in April 2019, uh, where cyclone Eloi struck the, the KZN province, um, that also caused a lot of devastation and, and damage. So the damage there was around 650 million just in the Durban, surrounding Durban areas. Um, and then not even to mention the fatalities uh, that went with that. So in terms of geohazards, regional geohazards mapping, this is a very useful tool um, to incorporate into uh, regional town planning, uh, permissible land use, uh, and to give a regional appreciation on which areas to avoid and possibly have subsequent more detailed um, investigations to try and mitigate some of these uh, hazards. So similarly, in terms of dolomitic land, uh, some of the speakers did touch on that uh, earlier as well, and I believe there's a presentation later on dealing specifically with this. Uh, so I'll just touch on it on a, on a high level. Um, but typically in the geotechnical field, we look at dolomitic land, not only from the surface expression of, of the outcrops, um, but also up to uh, 60 or 100 meters depth um, and, uh, below surface, depending on, on the groundwater conditions in the area. Uh, so from a land use and planning perspective as well, this is, this is crucial information uh, to, to make sure, you know, what's the, what were the, the previous stability considerations, available information, um, and also that the due processes when it comes to development are being followed um, because the, the type of geotechnical work that you require on dolomitic sites are obviously quite different than uh, what you do elsewhere on non-dolomitic non regions. Uh, so this is just some examples typically. Um, I know we, we, we are all geologists here, so we have an appreciation of what the dolomitic weathering profiles can typically look like. Um, so we try and characterize the stability characteristics of these different materials, uh, subsurface and their lateral extent, um, and also to, to give recommendations in terms of what would be the most appropriate land use and uh, risk management or mitigation measures uh, 
for the safe development of, of such sites. Um, so traditionally, we would use hydrogeological studies, uh, geophysics, and then also the geotechnical studies. Um, and in the past, I think in the main, we've used uh, gravity geophysics, um, but there are some new considerations to, to re-look at the feasibility of other geophysical techniques um, um, since the technology and the, the processing capabilities in that space have, have quite significantly improved over the last number of years. So this is just another example of that uh, as where uh, uh, dolomite land, uh, then there's a very close relation between uh, policy and bylaw development at a municipal level, the engineering side of things in terms of uh, construction and maintenance, um, as well as the town planning and permissible land use side. And all of that's underpinned by the geological or the geotechnical conditions of a, of a specific site uh, and the management of that site. So typically, you know, uh, engineering geologists would give advice in terms of uh, in the bigger chain of development in, in that specific space, you know, should specific areas be avoided? Should it be um, rehabilitated? Should resettlement take place? Uh, and what are some of the measures that can be incorporated to um, to reduce the likelihood of occurrences of, of sinkholes, for instance, in, in this example. And then similarly to, to undermined land as well. So it's, so it's not only on dolomitic regions, but then also on, on undermined areas. Uh, so this is some work that was done on the uh, southern sides of Johannesburg. Um, where the, all the, the, the old gold mines were. So typically to look at the the risks for undermining uh, as it relates to uh, surface instability. Um, and typically in, in these uh, uh, instances as well, we'd make use of, of geophysics drilling, core drilling, percussion drilling, um, as well as some, some satellite um, imaging techniques. So you can see, I mean, even at surface, the expression of instability is quite evident in this uh, specific development area. So on the basis of this, uh, you know, typically we'd go and we'd zone out to say that no development should take place in specific areas. And then other areas, maybe restricted types of development uh, might be considered. Um, and all of this is based on the scientific study of the, of the different sites uh, that can guide development and, and appropriate use of land. So this is then the, the last example. Uh, I've mentioned uh, construction materials. It's quite a, a significant part of engineering geology as well. Uh, so these are just two examples of uh, uh, some quarries in the KwaZulu-Natal province. Um, so on the, uh, the right-hand side, it's uh, um, typically the dwykatilites that they are exploiting there for uh, construction materials. Um, and then the other one is, is granites, mainly used for the uh, cement industry. Um, so, so typically, one of the, the issues is obviously when you deal with geological heterogeneity is the, uh, the quality of aggregates across a quarry scale or different sources uh, to meet the design requirements of, of a specific project. Um, so, so recently, um, as, as SAIEC, we had a, a, a visit to uh, one of these new bridges, the, the Msikaba bridge that, uh, that Sandral is busy constructing. Um, and it was quite interesting, you know, to, to see the implications of this at a, at, a, at a development scale. So the engineering geologist that, that was responsible for on that project, um, he indicated that originally on the project, for instance, they, uh, they intended on using tillite as a construction material. Um, and that whole bridge, uh, the roadworks, everything that relates around that was was designed using that specific uh, properties of, of the aggregate that was was considered in the concrete mixes, in the base layers and all of that. Um, but by the time, you know, they started exploiting or, or doing more detailed investigations on that material sources, they found that there's just too much uh, heterogeneity in the in the rock mass. So. Um, they ended up having to find alternative material. I, I believe they ended up uh, with a quite a good source of uh, Karua dolorites. Um, but as a result of that, the engineers had to completely redesign the, the structure in terms of the 
the concrete mixes and the weight of the structure and, and all of that. So construction materials, obviously a, a big implication when it comes to, uh, to design works, uh, especially from a, uh, from a design point onwards to construction as well. Okay, I'm not going to go through the details of this, but this is typically some of the aspects we look at from a uh, aggregate suitability uh, perspective. So mainly the, the strength and durability of, of rock types, and then also the chemical properties of that rock, um, because that can also have an implication on, on its, its uses and you know, the, the design lifetime of, of specific uh, infrastructure. Uh, and this is then again, uh, as I've indicated, that matter of scale. So even coming from a, uh, a, a structure or design specific uh, scale, even up to a regional scale. Uh, so on, this is a uh, uh, basically a aggregate potential model that was developed uh, in in, an, in the Mount Aleph area in in, Kwazulu, uh, in the Eastern Cape Province. Um, so typically, you know, there's a lot of factors that we, we can look at and this can also contribute to um, uh, future uh, development of economic infrastructure. So, for instance, um, I believe that the, the total value of the South African road networks currently, the asset is, is uh, sitting around two trillion rands. Um, and in order to, uh, to maintain that asset, uh, a lot of uh, um, funds goes into the sourcing uh, of, of aggregates, you know, for, for repair and maintenance purposes, and then also for new roads that are being constructed. So uh, from a, a, a geoscience perspective, it's also fundamental to know, you know, what, which, which areas are the aggregates, what, what it can be used for, what can't it be used for, uh, as well as then uh, research that can be done in terms of improving aggregates um, uh, for the specific applications. So just in, in conclusion then, um, this is just an, a, a short excerpt from the, um, the SAEC site investigation code of practice document. Um, so, so they state site investigation is a complex scientific process that is vital to any construction project. Uh, inadequate investigation can lead to over-conservatism uh, over in design and or large construction cost overruns. And I think Peter uh, explained some very nice examples this morning in terms of what can go wrong. Um, and then, you know, worst case, as he also mentioned, it can lead to failures during or after construction, resulting in damage to property, consequential damages and even loss of life. And this is typically what we are trying to prevent uh, when, we, when we look at it from an engineering perspective as part of the whole construction value chain uh, to try and reduce uncertainties and, and indicate risks or hazards that might arise so that they can be uh, adequately mitigated or, uh, or accounted for. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Willem. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, very fantastic visual explanation of all of this. So thank you very much for presenting that for us. So we now moving on to the next presentation. This is the, the presentation just before the lunch break. Um, again, it's presented by Lindy Richard, and she's going to introduce all of us to the SAIEG, which is the South African Institute for Engineering and Environmental Geology. So this is basically the GSSA counterpart. Thank you very much, Lindy, go for it. So first, just to sort of give a little um, background about myself. I'm currently president of SAIEG, that is the South African Institute of Engineering and Environmental Geologists. I did a geology degree at WITS and after completing my honours, I got a job working for an engineering geology firm. And I soon found out that geologists with a general geology degree lack an understanding of the engineering properties of soil and rock required for the geotechnical industry. And so to supplement my geology degree, I did some geotechnical engineering courses for non-degree purposes. These were just um, short courses on soil mechanics and material properties, parts of the undergraduate civil engineering degree. 
And so with these and under the mentorship and guidance of many years working under Tony Abair, one of the previous speakers, and I and you'll speak again, I gained the knowledge to be able to work in this field. So the, the real important thing there was the mentorship and how it guided me to be able to work in the geotechnical industry. So uh, Willem has done a very thorough background and um, definition of engineering geology. I just wanted to specifically um, say here that engineering geology is the science devoted to the investigation, study and solution of engineering problems, which may arise as the result of the interaction between geology and the works or activities of man, as well as the prediction and development of measures for the prevention or remediation of geological hazards. So every civil engineering structure interacts with geology in some ways. Town planning and architecture are also affected by geology. And Peter pointed out how these things can go wrong with both the engineering and geological sides. Um, Willem also gave some very good examples um, on this. So just to give you a sort of comparison between geology and engineering, uh, geology is an observational science that describes and classifies pre-existing phenomena in the natural environment, and it analyzes the data collected from this. Whereas engineering is the creation of a new object using materials with known properties. Um, so geology and engineering represent the descriptive versus the analytical side of things. Engineering geology uses observation, experience, intuition and synthesis to, to gain knowledge of geological processes and material properties to create a geological model. And then using engineering parameters, a ground model can be established to, uh, to uh, predict ground behavior for the design. The training required for an engineering geologist is basic geology, including um, mineralogy, petrology, weathering, structural geology, sedimentology, geophysics, geology, and paleontology. In addition, um, an engineering geologist requires to uh, needs to understand the engineering properties of soils and rocks, the principles of engineering geology, hydrology, soil mechanics, rock mechanics, pedology, and then also statistical methods, which, I, which is used in geology anyway. Experience plays a very important role in training, and you'll need experience in formulating models and conclusions from inherently incomplete and imprecise geological data, although those geologists were pretty good at doing that anyway. All around geological, um, knowledge is required, but also an adequate engineering knowledge. We need to be able to communicate geology in engineering terms and also very basic geology for clients to understand. We also need the ability to collaborate with many industries. So the key players in the geotechnical industry in South Africa, and there's a lot of collaboration between these groups. There's uh, SICE, the and specifically the Geotechnical Division, SICE being the South African Institute of Civil Engineering, SIEG, ourselves, uh, SANIA, the South African National Institute for Rock Engineering, which is a lot on the mining side anyway, and GIGSA, the Geosynthetic Interest Group of South Africa. So this is where geosynthetics come, come into play. So obviously I'm from SIEG here, um, and so this is the one I'm sort of focusing on in this talk. So this is a typical field relationship on a large project. You have the client who liaises with the project manager if there is one. And then the site investigation is where we come in. And this enables us, as well as geotechnical engineers, um, do a site investigation. And this enables the engineers to then do a design based on what we retrieve and then possibly more site investigation before a detailed design and then into the construction phase. And often engineering geologists can be involved here, especially on large projects where things can um, change quite quickly. And these professions are represented by these societies. So there's SAIG coming in at the site investigation and also possibly on the um, construction phase, but we are not generally part of the uh, at least detailed design, we might be um, involved in the 
pre-feasibility stage in design. So the legislation that guides geotechnical investigations, um, a couple of these have been mentioned already. Uh, so there's SANS 633, which is soil profiling and percussion borehole logging on dolomite. And I think Tony will cover this um, a little bit later. And there's SAN 634, which I think Peter Day got wrong earlier. He was talking about 632. So it's actually SAN 634, which is geotechnical investigations for township development. And then there's the SANS 1936 parts one to four, which are all guidelines on working on dolomite areas. And then there's the uh, building home building manual from the NHBRC. So in terms of uh, SAPNAS prof professional registration, SAIG um, is, is involved with SAPNAS to look at engineering geology registrations. For the moment, there is no engineering geology class. So most of us are registered as earth scientists. The registrations go through the GSSA, which then get passed on to the groundwater division and SAIG for review specifically for engineering geologists. The SACNASP also controls the registration of level four competent uh, geoprofessionals. This is uh, done according to the SANS regulations where you have to have documented level four competent geoprofessionals. Uh, professional indemnity is required if you practice on your own as an engineering geologist, especially for any work involving the NHBRC or large projects. NHBRC won't um, register you as a competent person uh, if you don't have uh, professional indemnity. So for more information on site, please do visit our website. Um, and for more information on becoming a member, you can find us under membership on our website or you can email membership at site.co.za. There's also a directory on our website of all our members if you are looking for some advice in the geotech industry. Are there any questions? Thank you, Lindy, um, for your overview. It certainly does clarify the differences then between the GSSA and the SAIC. So thank you very much. Uh, we do have some questions in the comments uh, strip. Uh, whether Compert Senai. Yeah, go for it. Hi, Lindy, how are you? I'm good, how are uh, you? I'm also great. Uh, I just wanted to find what are the requirements uh, for someone to to be a member of SAIG? Uh, and uh, let me give you a background about me so that we see if I do qualify as SAIG. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, I went to University of Venda and uh, I did a Bachelor of uh, Earth Science in Mining and Environmental Geology. Uh, and uh, I've been practicing since 2016 uh, as an engineering geologist. Uh, I started um, training with uh, Geopractica and uh, I left them last year and now I'm with the company called Digis Group. Uh, so from uh, 2016, I can say maybe I'm uh, five, four years of experience and, and, and counting. And uh, I've registered with uh, SECNEPS uh, as a professional uh, natural scientist. Uh, so uh, I think uh, I've attended some courses with the uh, psych during my introduction to the engineering geology, uh, which were presented by Mr. Tony. Uh, and I've also done some uh, short courses with the University of uh, Cape Town uh, Foundation Designs, which were presented by uh, Professor Dennis Kalumba and also some other uh, workplace related short courses. So I want to find out from you, uh, based on that, do you think I can qualify to be a member of SAIC? <laughs> okay, so our requirements are a, as it's, well, as it is a geology degree, a four year geology, geology degree, um, and then experience and um, work, working for an engineering geology firm. We are currently finding a lot of people applying um, that are trying to get into the geotech industry without having or get to um, become a member to be an engineering geologist without having any mentorship and stuff. So we're trying to sort of 
restrict people that come in with only a geological degree and so prefer people coming in with a engineering geology degree and those you can get from University of Pretoria or UKZN. The, the big thing there is mentorship and whether you can get to, uh, uh, what did they call them? I've just forgotten the term. Basically two people who are already members of SIEG or the geotech division who can um, vouch for you basically. If they can just tell us that you are competent then we are prepared to look at your application. So, which means that uh, looking at the, at, at, at the qualification from uh, UP or uh, UKZN uh, yeah. cannot uh, disqualify someone if you don't have qualification from UP or UKZN, but you do have the necessary other uh, requirements, such as a uh, four degree and uh, proper mentorship and uh, and, and the other uh, supporting documents which shows that you have uh, been attending some courses along the lines of uh, geotechnical engineering or uh, engineering geology because the only geotechnical engineering which uh, we did at the university was only a, a one module course uh, of uh, it was a semester course of geotechnical engineering which in most cases was was an introduction to, to geotechnical engineering and it didn't specifically maybe cover a broad spectrum of uh, the whole uh, uh, engineering geology spectrum. Yeah, and it, what, what may happen is we may decide it would be best if um, you have an interview or talk with a member of council before we make a decision, um, just to make sure that your engineering geology knowledge is yeah, I, I think I think uh, that's that, that that's proper. That's proper. Uh, okay, uh, I think I'll, I'll be making an application uh, uh, for membership uh, sooner, and maybe we can arrange for that interview and uh, also uh, check other uh, related uh, uh, criteria in which uh, perhaps maybe I can qualify to be a member. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, I can't promise anything, but. Um... <laughs> So it would really have to depend on all those factors. Okay. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Lindy. Pleasure, Olympus. Um, Craig, Craig here from the GSSA. Um, we've detected in the past, and I think it continues to be a bit confusing as to whether engineering geologists or geological engineers should register either, either with SACNAS or, or EXA. And there's a very simple rule of thumb. If you come through with your undergraduate degree, your BSc and your BSc honors, if you come through the engineering faculty with a few geology courses thrown in, you're probably better off going to EXA. If you're, if you're coming through the geology um, uh, curriculum with, with uh, engineering geology or engineering tacked on, you're better off going through, you should be going through SACNASP. Okay. Now within SACNASP, um, there are two earth science fields of practice. There are ge there's a geological field of practice and the earth science field of practice. The earth science field of practice being a little bit broader and incorporating engineering geology, geohydrology, and probably in future there's going to be environmental geology, et cetera. Um, and, it, and, and that's probably the uh, correct field of practice to apply to. Um, we, we have a... A, re a registration committee in the GSSA, and as best as we possibly can, we try and refer the geohydrologists to the uh, groundwater division of the GSSA and the engineering uh, applicants to the SAIEG. Um, sometimes it doesn't always happen, um, and we just work our way through it. Uh, but those those are the those are the basic rules that apply, I think. Um, if anybody has any questions about how the process works in detail, um, come back to me or, or Lindsay, and um, we can we can sort it out. Yeah, thanks, Craig. Yeah, that's that's right. Lindsay, a quick one from my side, ne? Yes. Um, your presentation was mostly touching aspects of engineering geology. Yes. And I, 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 I used to also attend you, do we, do we, do we call them Sayek Thursday um, in Midrand? 
I, but it was a Thursday event that actually happened. And I, I wanted to find more in terms of environmental geology. Is, is the scale the same in terms of um, membership with SIAG? Um, do you hold the same membership as in engineering geology? I have not seen ranks with you guys. And also, environmental geology is quite um, a broad or rather not a narrow path in terms of that in South Africa, we only have two institutions that offer purely environmental geology. And they don't offer it at a four-year level. They start offering it as a specialty on a master's level. And I've just been wondering how does one actually become an environmental engineer with you guys, membership? So, so we don't represent environmental engineers, it's environmental geologists. So the main thing to become a member of SIAG is you need a geology degree and that'll then from there we will register you as an engineering geologist or environmental geologist depending on your on your um field that you're working in from there does that answer your question it partially does but i wanted to understand more what you guys mean when you say environmental geology, environmental, what's your definition of that? How would this, the experience, how does that look like? So, as um, well, you need to be working for an environment. First of all, the geology degree, so it's the geology part, and then you need to be working in the environmental field. And in general, we will need um, someone who will back your application who works in that field. And we do have members that are, are working as environmental geologists. There's a big overlap between engineering and environmental geology in any case. So you can work as both. Um, the, the degrees offered at University of Pretoria and UKZN are specifically called engineering and environmental geology. To, so to become a member, you need two, supporter, two supporters to support your application as an engineering, I mean, an environmental geologist, and you will need a geology degree with some environmental courses or something to show that you uh, have some experience on the environmental side of things. Uh, okay, I, I think it partially gives me an idea. Um, but one concern that we have always had, particularly me and few professionals who come from our side of University of Venda. We have not made any breakthrough with becoming SIAG members. And um, at some point, we even came to a conclusion that perhaps uh, the university or perhaps the organization, it's a university affiliated because in most cases, we'll always hear you guys referencing those two universities. And most of your members are from those two universities. And it, yeah. it was... Just something like that to our side that how do we break through in, in, into becoming members and to date we are still on that battle anyway. Yeah, look, it's because, you know, those are the only two universities that actually offer that degree. So that makes it really simple for us to, to accept people who have that degree. I studied at WITS, um, but I spent five, well, 10 years in the, in the long term, but at least five years working for Tony before I could become an engineering geologist and register as one. Um, Willem also has a similar thing. I think I can't remember where he studied, but he also didn't study at um, University of Pretoria or UKZ. And in fact, to accept Willem, we, we ended up doing an interview with him and read reports that he'd written for us to be satisfied that he was competent as an engineering geologist. Oh, I see there's a hand up or oh, on the education side. Yeah, Hi there. Mm -hmm. Hi there, Lindy, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Hi there, yeah. I was just asking um, about, you know, what about us on the education side? So, you know, we have, for instance, I'm a, I'm a lecturer and um, I'm mostly, my background is, is geology. So sedimentology and geochemistry. Um, and I've been lecturing in, on the environmental side for, for a couple of years now. Um, and, I've, and I've noticed even trying to get into SACNASP um, it's, it's difficult for me. Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, is it the same for if I want to maybe apply for, for, for your organization? Um, what, what solutions are there for us on the education side of these things? 
Yeah, that, that that's a that's a tough one. Um, for one thing, for to become a member, we also require that you are SACNASP registered. Mm. Um, I I don't have a quick and easy answer. I'm afraid I um would have to look it up in our um, constitution and speak to other lecturers that are members and see how they they got there. Yeah. Um, I'm afraid I don't have a quick answer for you, but if you private message me your contact details, I sure, can... no, no problem. I know with uh, with SACNAS, for instance, if you if you haven't been in the mining industry for more than five years, then it doesn't count anymore. So I'm I'm in the position where I used to be in the mining industry and I used to work there, and I worked um, as an environmental uh, practitioner, but then I made this transition to lecturing. Um, and obviously now it's, it's five years later and, and it's just not possible for me to get, to, to, uh, to get into SACNAS because of that. Can so, I, can yeah, I jump in there? I'm part um, of it, it, it should be entirely possible for you to get into SACNAS. It depends a little bit on what your undergraduate degree and transcripts look like mm. uh, and, and what, what curriculum you came through. We yeah. see the occasional um, earth science application uh, from one of two or three universities where they're applying for earth science. But in fact, you look at the course record and, and it's, uh, there's a lot of water science, for example. We see a lot of that. And we refer, we refer those applications to the water science field of practice. Yeah. Um, I mean, my there, is all, there is also an environmental studies field of practice, which we can refer people to. Yeah. But generally speaking, if you came out with a geology degree, even though you're out of the mining industry and in, into the into the into the academic sector, um, that's experience. It shouldn't it yeah. shouldn't be a problem. And with yeah, I mean, an honors I, degree, you need three years experience, not five. Yeah, I mean my 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 background is um, I went honors geology. Uh, I've got an MSc in marine geology, um, and I'm pursuing a PhD now. So. You know, that's, that's it, should, it should be absolutely no, it should be a no brainer. You should be easily registered under earth science or mm. geology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I've just noticed, I mean, my, my application is still pending and it's a year later. Can, can you send uh, an email to myself and Lindiwi and we'll, we'll chase this? Oh, no, thank you. Yeah, definitely. Thanks. Eh? Just one thing I want, I want to note is you can still, um, to practice, you really only need um, your registration with, with SACNASP. You don't have to be a member of SIG, just like um, GSSA is a voluntary organization. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're, not, we're not stopping people from practicing. And that yeah. goes, goes for everybody. If you've got your SACNASP registration, then you, know, you, can, you can practice in that field. You know? That is the advice we give um, to a lot of people who query us about this. Uh, the regulatory bodies first, and the voluntary associations second. Uh, if but you don't need to join them, but it's but definitely the regulatory bodies. Sh you need to be a member of first and foremost. Great, thanks, Lindy, um, and all those who participated with the question. There was one question on the in chat that um, hasn't come up. I'm just scrolling up to get it. Um, Asking whether Comcurt and SIN, SIN, SIN IRE certificates are recognized outside of the mining industry. I don't know if, if you would be able to, or any, any of the participants here, um, I'm actually, I wouldn't know, but um, it's certainly a question to, to find out. Yeah, I'm afraid I, I don't have an answer to that. We don't, necess we don't recognize them. But that doesn't mean to say other industries don't. I don't know. Okay, great. Um, Xavier, your hand's still up. I'm assuming you're, you've asked your questions. So um, thank you very much to our pre uh, presenters. We can now have a lunch break. And so let me just introduce you then. Um, our next speaker for the afternoon session is Professor Jacobs. He's from the University of Pretoria, and he's going to be talking to us about equipment and software advancements in geotechnical investigations, monitoring and modeling. As Nolene mentioned at the beginning of the, the workshop, 
Um, if you want to find out more about the speakers and the abstracts, you can look in your, your digital bag. Okay, over to you, Professor. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity. I will be talking about uh, equipment and software advances, focusing on geotechnical investigations, but especially on monitoring and modeling, maybe a little bit more on the monitoring and modeling side. So what I'm going to present is a brief summary. I'm going to say very little about geotech investigation, but I will then be talking a little bit more about laboratory testing, and I want to uh, cover facilities available in South Africa at the moment. Then I want to speak about uh, new monitoring technologies and sen sensors, and I want to focus especially on unsaturated soils. We have not traditionally had a very strong focus on unsaturated soils, and that is becoming more and more important. Then with all these sensors and things, they need to be able to communicate, and uh, we need to uh, cover the, the communication networks. And then I'm going to speak a little bit about modeling capabilities in terms of uh, physical models and then also numerical models relevant in the geotechnical environment. So in terms of the scope of my presentation, I'm not really going to talk about well-known techniques like that use every day, like trial pitting and drilling, penetration testing, but I'm going to focus more on, on fairly a new, more novel um, capabilities available in this country, mostly available in the country. So in terms of geotechnical investigation, we want to come up with a geological model, and that will mostly comprise of our soil profile, the pore pressure regime, and then the engineering properties of the soils and the profile um, as, as a whole. So we are going to have to do classification tests. Um, it may be necessary to do strength and stiffness tests, permeability tests, and so on. I am going to focus on only really strength testing. It will be laboratory strength testing mostly, and then also some stiffness uh, measurement. And I'm not going to focus, I'm first going to talk about stiffness measurement. So it will be a very brief uh, description of some novel stiffness measurement uh, that was done on how train. So stiffness is important for settlement of our foundations and for the dynamic response, if you have a machine foundation and things like that, that is important for us. And we typically measure stiffness using something like a plate load test or continuous surface wave testing or some other seismic type testing. And in the laboratory, you can measure stiffness in, a, for example, a triaxial cell by, by looking at the, uh, the compression of a sample and working out the, uh, the stiffness from that. And they're also, um, uh, sort of micro seismic techniques available that you can use in the in the laboratory itself. But what I want to talk about is some large scale stiffness measurement that occurred on the Gau train. And I think many of you would have seen these uh, images of, or, or the, you would have driven past the viaduct in Centurion under construction, and you would have seen, that's now more than, yeah, so more than 10 years ago already, these large blocks that were stacked on the pier locations of most of the piers in uh, the uh, Centurion area along Viaduct 5C, as it was called at the time. So what happened here is a thousand ten ton concrete blocks were stacked on every one of these bridge pier positions. I think there were three sets of a thousand blocks manufactured, and it was used as a preload, but also a measurement of the stiffness, quantification of stiffness of the profile as a whole. The problem with the design of the bridge foundations or the pier foundations in Centurion was that if you base your design on conventional stiffness, sorry, I have an issue here with uh, Zoom interfering on my screen. I just want to go back to, okay, should be displaying correctly again. Um, okay, I think that will solve, solve my problem. So. The problem is if you do plate load tests, you will come up with a low stiffness of the components of a residual dolomite profile. If you test the watts and the materials like that, you'll have really low stiffnesses. And how can you justify putting this massive foundation on something that's going to move so much? So it is necessary to quantify the bulk stiffness of the profile. And by stacking these blocks, it was possible to surcharge the ground to about 240 kilopascal over an area 20 by 20 meters and uh, therefore really enabled us to measure the, the stiffness of the profile as a whole. And this is looking at the result. 
So we got settlement increasing as the blocks were stacked. So settlements were monitored along various positions on the footprint of that block of concrete blocks. And um, then settlement leveled off after completion of the stacking and then the blocks were removed afterwards and we saw a bit of, we saw a bit of rebound at the time. The substantial scatter in the results probably as you would, ex would expect even the heterogeneity of the dolomite. But the bottom line is if you back figure stiffnesses, we came up with an average stiffness of 110 megapascal for the bulk profile. Unfortunately, the standard deviation, as you would expect on dolomite, is also massively large. But this value is really high compared to what you would find in the literature published by, for example, Fritz Wagner in his PhD dissertation and things like that, where typical values for what and other components of the dolomite residuum could be 20 megapascal, even softer than that. So the bulk stiffness is much, much bigger. So this demonstrates the application of these very expensive but novel test techniques. Unfortunately, this is not available on your everyday project. Some other monitoring that occurred on that uh, particular uh, trial or some, some of these trials is there were extensometers installed and that enabled the uh, settlement with depth to be assessed. And we know that soil stiffness is not a constant value. If you, if you plot soil stiffness as a function of uh, the strain that you impose, we see this sort of S-shaped curve that I have badly traced there with the red. But uh, we know that if the strains are really small, you get a really substantial stiffness. But if you have uh, substantial or strains, then the stiffness is a lot lower. So we will be testing in this area. And with the extensometers, it was actually possible to distinguish between stiffnesses near the surface where the strains would be large and going further and deeper down into the profile, we could also look at stiffnesses there. And then plotting your, your near stiffness uh, profiles, or so, sorry, near, near surface stiffness profile, we could uh, see that the stiffnesses were much lower where the strains were higher and much higher where the strains were lower, deeper down in the profile. So this just demonstrates um, the use of small, uh, small strain stiffness uh, uh, applications. Then, uh, yeah, you know, this is just a summary of what I said. So, these stiffnesses were higher than what we would have expected in the literature. And what happens is your load is carried by the stiff components, and le that leaves your your soft components largely unloaded. And we can easily underestimate the stiffness of a dolomite profile or a heterogeneous profile if we do not recognize bulk stiffness. So um, I've spoken about then also stiffness degradation with strain as evident from extensometer data. What I want to do next is talk more about laboratory testing and I'm going to focus mostly on triaxial testing. So the photo that I'm showing here is from the Bromadinho tailings dam failure that happened in January of 2019. I'm not going to show you the video because I'm sure all of you have been bombarded with that video multiple times in the last two years. But it raised really, really important questions. And the question is, do we have a risk of liquefaction of our tailings dams in South Africa? All of our, not all, but very many of our tailings dams are constructed as upstream facilities. And they are uh, quite, yeah, it is built from a waterlogged material that needs to dry out, consolidate, desiccate, gain strength. And is it safe? So. You can get liquefaction if you have undrained behavior of tailings. So undrained behavior can give us problematic uh, behavior. So we need to assess whether undrained loading of uh, our tailings dams can occur. And if it occurs, what will be the strength parameters? Now, conventionally, we have designed tailings dams in this country and for the rest, uh, most of the rest of the world using drained analysis. So let's just overview, give an overview on that. The top diagram shows a slope with a failure surface in blue. We divide it up into little slices and we work out the shear strength of the base of the slice using the well-known equation that uh, you can see at the bottom here. So a more Coulomb failure uh, expression for the, the shear strength of the soil and is described by the red line on the side there. So you have your friction angle and your cohesive parameter and you can work out the strength if you know the, the effective stress acting on that uh, base there. 
So that is a drained analysis. The problem is that we need to consider undrained loading and drained and undrained loading are distinctly different. And to consider undrained loading properly, uh, there are various techniques, but a suitable technique would be the use of critical state soil mechanics. Now, I'm not sure that many of you have been trained in critical state soil mechanics. And I just want to give a very brief overview of that. So on the screen, we are looking at a failure envelope. It plots shear stress against effective normal stress. And I think most, most of you would be familiar with that curve there. What we can do is we can just replace shear stress and uh, effective normal stress with what we call strain or stress invariants. It is basically the same thing. It, that is still a shear stress. This is still an effective normal stress. And we just don't use phi as a friction angle. We use another expression for the slope of our critical state line. If we go into critical state soil mechanics, we realize that there, you can add a third dimension to this problem, and that is the dimension of void ratio. So the third axis that I've just added there is our void ratio. And on that uh, gray plane, we can plot our normal consolidation line. And I've just plotted at the undistorted scale on the right top corner as well. So that is uh, in the third dimension. And then we can draw a so-called yield surface over this gray plane that I shaded there. All stress states possible must fall under that yield surface. So you cannot go outside of that yield surface if you go into three dimensions. Now, the critical state line, if you take the red inclined line and you project it, that failure envelope, if you project it over your yield surface, it is going to pro project as that thick red line that I drew. And when soil fails, it will always fail on that line. So failure will ultimately occur on that line. And you can plot the red line in the E versus P dash space on the right top diagram as shown over there. If we now consider what the shear strength would be at a fairly high void ratio where I drew that uh, little blue rectangle, that is now, uh, that blue rectangle represents undrained conditions because it is defined at a specific value of the void ratio. And if you do not allow drainage, you do not allow vo volume change. And if you are interested to find the shear strength on that blue plane, it will be where it intersects the critical state line there. And you can do a couple of projections and um, looking at it from the side. So this is the, the, the Q P dash diagram views this from this side, and you can see that that will be your undrained shear strength. If you now consider undrained shear strength at a different void ratio, then you will set to this void ratio here, and you will have a strength that is going to uh, ultimately touch the failure envelope at that position over there. And you can see that that is quite a substantially higher uh, strength than what we had before. So the point to make with critical state soil mechanics is that the undrained strength of soil is void ratio dependent. So void ratio is really important for undrained behavior. And we need to know the void ratio if we want to understand or model the strength of the material correctly. There's another complication that comes into the picture, and that is the uh, issue of sample preparation. If you take a sample in the triaxial and uh, apparatus, you, uh, you do moist tamping, so you take the material with certain moisture content, compacted to a density, compared to where you try to mimic the process of deposition on a slimes dam, a slurry deposition, so you deposit it into your little mold in the triaxial as a slurry and you allow it to dry out. And once it has gained sufficient strength, you can close up the triaxial cell and load the sample after obviously consolidating it. There's very different, uh, there's a massive difference in behavior between what we saw, uh, see on those two samples. Looking at the moist stamp uh, problem and whether we are drained or undrained is another uh, complication. So if you do an undrained test on a moist stamp, stamp sample, it then tends to do that. So you get an increase in mobilized shear strength. And then after a certain point, the sample becomes unstable. And if you load it further, the mobilized shear strength reduces and the sample can liquefy. If you build a sample as a slurry, your, your undrained stress path also begins to to turn to the left, we call it contractive behavior, 
but then suddenly it turns around and it dilates all the way up the critical state line. So you get completely different behavior depending on whether you have a moist stamp or a slurry deposited sample. So what this allows us to conclude, oh, the other point that I just want to make is this is for an undrained stress path. This is for a drained stress path. For an undrained stress path, the maximum shear resistance will be that value. For a drained stress path, it will be a massively different value. So this is for triaxial testing. So the, the way in which we build our samples have a very large role in the uh, soil properties that we test. Also, whether we test our properties or, or, or our samples drained or undrained also has a massive effect on the behavior that we will observe. So in summary, I can say that tailings behavior depends on our soil strength properties, C and phi, that we all know. It is also void ratio dependent if we look at undrained behavior. It is fabric dependent. How did we build the sample? And did we build it in a way that it represents the actual state in the field? And then it is also dependent on the stress history and current state. So in, if we think of current state, looking at those three dots that I showed on the left-hand side, if your initial soil state or stress state in the soil is close to the critical state line, you need to apply much less load to cause failure compared to where you start with no shear stress on the sample initially. So it has to travel a lot further. So your current stress state also plays a role. So we have so many parameters to consider what would happen. So we have questions such as, how do we prepare the lamp samples? How do we uh, sample uh, samples from the field and be sure that the behavior of those samples will be good? And then, um, so high quality sampling and testing is uh, important. And to answer all these quick questions, we need modern equipment. Now, traditionally in South Africa, our laboratories used to have really old equipment over recent years. We uh, were lucky that a number of our triaxial or geotechnical laboratories invested in new soil test equipment. So our equipment used to be old, many, much of it is still old, but we are playing catch up. So please excuse me if I, I'm going to name throughout my presentation a couple of companies who have contributed to this uh, presentation that I'm giving today by giving uh, slides that I'm going to show. So I am going to know to name a couple of uh, companies, and I hope that you would uh, please forgive me for, I don't want to call it advertising, but to mention some people. So we need to, uh, to quantify critical state properties, and that needs modern equipment. So things that we need to do on our soil samples is we need to locally measure on the sample itself um, strain, strains that develop. We also need to locally measure the load. You cannot measure the load that you apply to the outside on the RAM of the uh, cell because there's a lot of friction potentially between the RAM and the, uh, the, the cell. And we need to measure the pore pressure in the sample. And we may also want to measure the stiffness on the sample with things like bender elements and other techniques. So I've spoken about triaxial apparatus, the triaxial apparatus, but in the slimes dam, you don't have a little cylindrical problem that is loaded in axis symmetry. You actually have a con condition that is completely different. So your mode of shearing in a triaxial is limited to radial symmetry. And it is becoming more and more um, important that we must think about actually applying a, a simple shear to an apparatus or to, to a sample and not uh, uh, shearing it in a triaxial situation. And, I believe that many of our uh, consultants get their work checked by foreign consultants now and the people overseas begin to insist on simple shear testing. It's not direct shear testing as uh, I think most of you would have seen during your undergrad days or as you still see in many laboratories. A simple shear apparatus allows your soil sample, if it looks like that, to be sheared by actually distorting it in this direction. So it applies a pure shear strain on the sample, whereas a shear box test, of course, splits the sample into two blocks like that. So you apply uh, stress on top. This is a direct shear apparatus. This is a simple shear apparatus, which is becoming more and more uh, sought after. So what I want to do is a quick overview of state-of-the-art facilities that I'm aware of in this country. Now, uh, Golder, I can stay, say without any doubt, as the most advanced triaxial 
test laboratory in South Africa, and they invested in this equipment because of the work that they do in the tailings industry. For us to understand or model tailings correctly, we need to measure properties really carefully. At the University of Pretoria, we have a cyclic triaxial uh, cell with uh, unsaturated capability. And we are also in the process of procuring a large diameter triaxial uh, cell with all the necessary pressure uh, controllers and bender elements so that we can measure stiffness on the model, on the sample itself. It will also have unsaturated capability. Then at the University of Johannesburg, there's a cyclic triaxial um, state of the art, and they are also in the process of procuring equipment that can measure the soil water retention curve um, under stress that you can control. So stress dependent soil water retention curve equipment is on order. And at the University of Cape Town, there's a large shear box. To my knowledge, the only one operational in the country. There used to be one at the Department of Water Affairs, but I believe that is not active anymore. So uh, just looking at a few of the slides from Golder, they invested in this equipment to be able to measure the critical state line, critical state properties of the various, uh, especially tailings, seeing that the tailings industry is in such a predicament to show that their tailings dams will be safe under undrained loading. So this is just an example of stress paths that you would observe during testing. Um, some refinements on, on the models that, or the samples that are tested these days, as you can see that they minimize the size of the filter at the bottom of the sample so that they can have a smooth contact at the base of the sample so that you have as close to a frictionless interface there as possible. That is necessary so that you do not get strain localizations and things at your end platen. So they try to, to uh, compensate for that. Then um, I've mentioned that you cannot simply just put a load cell on top of your instrument or cell and measure the load there because of ramp friction. And uh, they use submersible load cells inside the cell. This is just some equipment for moist stamping. They want to uh, measure the critical state line and we find that um, the critical state is, uh, you still measure the same critical state line when you do moist stamping compared to other sample preparation techniques. So with moist stamping, you get a nice liquefaction type failure and it allows us to easier or it is easier to measure the critical state using samples that have been prepared using moist stamping. And another aspect is I've mentioned that undrained shear strength is highly void ratio dependent. And if you do a triaxial test and the sample liquefies, it is really difficult to remove that sample perfectly after the test and weigh and measure the volume of all that material because uh, the sample falls apart completely. So Golder has invested in equipment that allows them to freeze the sample, and then they can very accurately measure that void ratio and uh, link strength to the void ratio in such a way. This is a, just a permeability cell where we have flexible uh, sidewall on the cell. You get preferential flow if you have a rigid uh, edge or, or cylinder in which you do this test, a flexible wall, you can do it in a triaxial cell as well for permeability testing. This is um, the uh, advanced uh, direct simple shear test. So the simple shear test allows the application of a shear stress rather than loading a sample with a ram as in the case of a triaxial. So I'm not going to spend much time on that. Um, so they've got modern consolidometer test uh, equipment. Um, that allows, for example, the permeability of a soil to be determined as a function of the void ratio. And then this is a settlement test. So you can pour your slurries in here. It will settle out in its various fractions. And it is possible for you to take this apart and then sample the various layers and determine their differences in characteristics. This is just a slide showing the unsaturated triaxial equipment at the University of Pretoria it can also do cyclic loading. And uh, so you need a, your air pressure controller and you need water pressure controllers. And a special feature is you need to be sure that you can do very accurate volume measurements. So there, there's a double wall cell with a stress measurement of, sorry, sorry, volume measurements 
taken relative to the inner cell. The pressure on the inner cell is uh, controlled in such a way that the inner cell does not uh, deform, and that allows very accurate volume measurement. So also this, this can also do uh, solvent retention curve testing, and it can do uh, complex stress paths. This is a photo of the equipment at the University of Johannesburg, a full dynamic triaxial system that allows uh, a stress uh, the, or dynamic loading, the effect thereof to be uh, assessed. This is uh, a photo of uh, the row cell equipment. We've got a similar device at the University of Pretoria, and that is just a much more superior test to the old traditional odometer. You can do perfect stress control and you can measure volume changes, which is uh, important. This is the uh, direct shear test apparatus at the uh, University of Cape Town, and that allows for interface testing. So quite often, we need to do interface testing and especially for landfill designs and things like that, where you have a geosynthetic membrane or a juice, a geotextile of some sort in contact with various other materials and you want to know the interface properties. So this is probably the best equipment currently available in the country to uh, measure or do, do the sort of tests. Other testing available in the country includes uh, CPTU, which is our piezo cone tests. There's also seismic CPT tests. There's continuous surface wave testing that allows small strain stiffness to be measured in situ, also stiffness variation. There is now in situ vein shear capability. You all, we also have pressure meter testing, MOSTAP sampling, I'll say something briefly about that. And then I think most of you would be familiar with Shelby tube sampling, which is just a high quality sharpened tube that is pushed into the ground for a recovery of high quality samples. Sampling is easy in clays because when you extract the sample, negative pore pressures are immediately generated to maintain the effective stress in the sample. But we have severe difficulty with silts and sands because you do not get that negative pressure that will hold your sample together. So undisturbed sampling is severely challenging in our tailings dams and other silty and sandy environments. This is just a slide from uh, uh, or showing a seismic cone. So you have the, the CPT penetrating into the ground and you have some seismic source. It could be a shaker or something as simple as a hammer that they can use to eat an anvil. And that will then cause uh, the propagation of a shear wave. And by measuring the shear wave, you can figure out the bulk stiffness of the profile as a whole. And by doing this test at a number of depth locations, you can probably also do inversion analyses to get the individual layer stiffnesses to some degree. This is a MOSTAP sampler. So MOSTAP sampler is basically a penetrometer that is pushed into the ground. And then when, when it gets to the required position, the cone is kept in position and the sleeve around the cone can be advanced further downwards and the sample can be uh, collected and there's a, a sleeve on the inside of this tube to minimize friction between the inside of the tube and the sample so that you can actually recover quite a long sample. I've spoken to some of the contractors doing this and they are very comfortable to get samples out of 700 millimeters. You will see that they mentioned one meter here, but that's pushing it a little bit. But uh, you get a high quality sample, although it will be mechanically quite disturbed you will be able to get quite a reliable indication of the void ratio, which is so important for us when we sample tailings. This is just the automated DCP rig, which is also now available in the country. And that also has samplers attached to it, which allows you to get samples from the ground. In situ vein shear testing, a, a, a tailings deposit is extremely heterogeneous in many cases. So when a new layer is deposited, the coarse material will settle out first and the fine material will follow that. So you have this alternating coarse and fine uh, layering, which can be extremely intense in a tailings dam. And you may be interested to very specifically target specific layers and go and do a vein shear right there. Now it's easy if it's close to the surface, but at some depth you will need a penetrometer to advance your vein shear and then target specific depths. And there is limited capacity to do this work available in the country at the moment. Pressure meter testing. So a pressure meter is basically a cylindrical balloon 
that is inflated in a borrow and it measures the uh, deflection on the side wall. Some method methods measure the deflection separately, but you get the pressure measurement and then the displacement measurement and you can back figure the stiffness. So a very valuable tool. You can also get the undrained shear strength if you are testing undrained materials. So this is also an example of a, a so-called Menard pressure meter. And you can see it comes on a cone there. The membrane will be around the, uh, the shaft here and will be inflated. And by measuring the response to that pressure application, soil properties can be inferred. Then I want to talk about various measurement technologies and sensors. So I'm not going to, to, to read this list. Let's just go through it. I've, uh, I've mentioned before that it's important for us to start thinking about the applications of unsaturated soil mechanics. And I just want to motivate that statement. In 2012, we, uh, the Science Geotechnical Investigation uh, Division organized the site investigation course attended by Professor Chris Clayton, whom I think many of you would know from University of Southampton in the UK, and he actually supervised, we counted the other day, I think about 10 South Africans doing PhDs in geotechnical engineering. And he said, after the conference, there's an elephant in the room. We had all these nice methods of site investigation, but no one thought about unsaturated soils. So unsaturated soil mechanics is important in our country, and I will motivate why that is so. so when we do saturated soil mechanics, in other words, if there's no air in uh, the soil, it's only water and soil, we can relate the strength of the soil and volume changes in the soil to a change in effective stress, that number there. When we do undrained, uh, sorry, unsaturated soil mechanics, we cannot do that anymore. Effective stress does not work to describe strength and volume change anymore. We now need two parameters. The one is a stress-related one, so it's the total stress minus the air pressure. And the other one is our air pressure minus the water pressure. And the water pressure may be negative. We call this term the matrix suction. So if you have these two parameters, it is now possible for you to work out strength and uh, to some extent volume, volume changes as well. So we need a dual uh, set of parameters. Effective stress is not good enough anymore. So we need to be able to measure matrix suction. So why are we interested in unsaturated soil mechanics? So the first reason would be that most of our soils are unsaturated. We need to understand the role of, uh, the role of soil suctions. And um, people would say we can get away with saturated soil mechanics because it is conservative. But uh, we now need to defend these tailings dams that we are building and we are uh, deriving a substantial amount of strength from unsaturated properties. If we ignore that completely, we will theoretically prove that our dams are, <coughs> or excuse me, we will battle to prove that our dams are safe. So we, uh, we cannot always be so conservative. So there's a, a link between ignorance and conservatism. So you don't want to be so conservative that you're becoming completely ignorant. So there, there's a balance and we need to move with the times and learn the new theories and apply it as, as uh, applicable. So the other important thing about unsaturated soil mechanics, because unsaturated soil mechanics is, or soils is a mix of air, water and solids. And that air water interface is affected by climate. So climate change is a very important topic today. We believe that our part of the world is generally getting uh, wetter, uh, sorry, drier, but in Europe, in England, for example, in the United Kingdom, it is definitely getting wetter. And they are beginning to notice failures on rail embankments because of a uh, climate that is wetting up over time. So if you want to assess the effect of climate change on your uh, geotechnical uh, infrastructure, then it is important to consider unsaturated soil mechanics because it allows this effect of climate on suction, which affects stress and strength, to be assessed. So we have at the university here in Pretoria developed what we call the tux tensiometer. And this tensiometer is a piezometer that can measure negative water pressures. It comprises of a uh, little pressure sensor that you'll find in diving watches. 
and uh, we attach to it a high air entry that's a very impervious ceramic so you don't get water through it easily but you need to saturate this so this is all stuck together and it is mounted in this cylindrical uh, stainless steel casing and this whole thing needs to be saturated and it can then measure negative water pressures so this is just a cross section of the instrument and you can see a side view of it here and if you want to test it, it needs to be saturated first, and then you can pull it out of the saturation cell and allow evaporation to occur. And as evaporation occurs from the saturated membrane, negative water pressure will begin, sorry, when, it is satur when water begins to evaporate from the saturated ceramic filter, negative water pressure will begin to generate inside the sensor. And this is our, not a typical result, but this is really the best result that we've measured to date. We managed to measure a suction of minus 1700 kilopascal. And if you read the literature by uh, coming from Imperial College in London and uh, Durham University, places like that, they reckon that their good quality um, high capacity tensiometers are able to get to off the order of 1500 kilopascal. So we are in the right ballpark. Our equipment is up to scratch with what can be bought internationally. What I must just say is if you want to buy a tensiometer from overseas, you will pay up to 1,500 pounds for one, depending on who you are and who you buy it from. And we can make these for less than 500 rand the sensor. So we can now really apply unsaturated soil mechanics because we can measure suctions cheaply. I wanna show you this little video clip to illustrate the sensitivity of these sensors. So we've got one of these sensors in a cylinder of soil on the right hand side so it is buried there in the sand it's in the fine sand so what i'm going to do is to pour a little bit of uh, sand onto this moist sand the dry sand is going to suck up the uh, water and it will by doing that generate a small negative pore pressure and then we are I'm going to add a drop of water and we will see if we can measure it so there's the the water being added and you can see immediately there was a spike in negative pore pressure there and then we add a drop of water and you can see a very clear spike um, i'm not displaying the units here but this is the downward spike is approximately half a kilopascal and the upward spike due to the drop of water is probably probably about a, it's approximately a quarter of a kilopascal so these are minute minute pressures and we can measure them very very clearly okay let's move on to the next point so we know that in soils, you can also get substantially higher suction than what I've shown just now. And um, we also have to use equipment like a dew point hygrometer then. So this is also available at some other laboratories. Um, I'm not going to go into the detail of operation due to lack of time, but this can measure to several hundred megapascal of suction. I think the they rate is a 300 megapascal. So we use this equipment to define what's called a soil water retention curve, which is the relationship between the moisture content, which can be expressed as a degree of saturation, versus suction on the horizontal axis. And um, we have some equipment here at the University of Pretoria to do this. So we are interested to measure the uh, soil water retention curve for that little cylinder of soil that you see. And to do that, we have some of our tensiometers on the bottom of the sample that measures the suction in the sample. This whole thing is standing on a scale so that we can, by allowing evaporation to take place, change the water content. And we can measure the water content because of the fact that it stands on the scale. And then we have six lasers sighting onto this sample so that we can measure volume change. You need all three parameters to be able to get the full soil water retention curve. This is just an illustration of the lasers measuring from the top. And what we have, one of our PhD students also recently added the ability to wet the sample again by using ultrasonic humidifiers to inject moist air in this area. And obviously you have to be very careful that you don't get condensation on your scale because that will affect readings. So um, that en enables wetting and drying cycles to be investigated. And it allows us then to, to trace the full soil water retention curve with the hysteresis that we know occurs and which is, is not easily measured. Some other advances is you can also use photogrammetry to track volume changes. So we have little pixel patches that we track the position of, and by taking photos regularly, 
we can um, measure the volume changes quite accurately. You can also check sample um, of movements across your sample or how the sample contracts by looking at patches like this. And this is just plotting data from that to show how the sample contracted as it was allowed to uh, dry out. Then if you put all the data together, you can come up with a soil water retention curve where we have a plot here of suction versus moisture content. You can express it as a degree of saturation as well. And um, so here at the bottom is the degree of saturation. And you can see that uh, this is a nice continuous measurement of the soil water retention curve compared to some other methods uh, that do not give you this. Then I want to talk a little bit about satellite technology. Um, and this is work done by our colleagues at uh, Wits University. So sources of satellite imagery comes from the Landsat uh, satellites, NASA, the European Space Agency, the Sentinel uh, constellation of satellites, and then uh, something called Planet Scope, which is a commercial um, Installation or a company that you can buy the data from. The first two provide free data, the last one you need to pay for. So, this is the Sentinel data freely available. It's uh, at the resolution of uh, five meet, uh, 10 meters, and we get a new image every about five days. So, the website is listed there. So, this is freely available to anyone, not quite to the resolution of Google Earth, but obviously um, updated at a much more regular interval. This is uh, some Sentinel-2 data where they work out a so-called normalized difference water index. So it works with reflections, uh, green reflection, ultra infrared reflection, and it works out an index that allows water to be observed in uh, quite a lot of clarity. So uh, blue there is uh, presence of water and red is dry. And you can now very nicely monitor what happens over time with a pond on uh, the slime stem. And this is just playing over uh, a record of actually several years. So you can very nicely trace what is going on. The red dots there is, is in patches of reed growth that eventually got covered up. So this will play for a while. Unfortunately, due to lack of time, we need to move on. Then I want to talk about uh, subgrade settlement tracking. So there's D INSAR which stands for Differential Interferometric Synthetic Aperture Radar, a mouthful. And uh, that allows us to measure displacements by satellite really, really accurately. And how it works is the satellites operate with radar. And uh, when it uh, passes over an area, it will take a radar scan of the area. The data will be saved. And when it comes back, it will do another scan. Now, the wavelength of radar is off the order of several centimeters. And what the software will ultimately do is it will compare the data from the first scan to the second scan, and it will work out the phase difference. And because uh, the uh, wavelength is off the order of several centimeters, we can measure to quite uh, to do a few millimeter resolution. So you can come up with really, really accurate um, in high resolution displacement measurement. So few millimeter resolution possible. So this creates a lot of opportunities for us to measure many things like settlement next to a highway and um, even sinkholes. This is some work done by the University of Johannesburg, uh, Professor Maria Ferentino there. And uh, she is interested to monitor settlements in dolomitic areas to see if she can maybe preempt the occurrence of a sinkhole this is the sum of the data that uh, indicates patches where they tracked settlements. And you can see we are talking about 12, 13 millimeters, five millimeters, three millimeters. So extreme accuracy or extremely high resolution rather. Then I want to touch on fiber optic instrumentation. So fiber optic instrumentation provides really high resolution strain measurement, temperature measurement and vibration measurement. So there are two classes, discrete and distributed strain measurement. I'm first going to talk about discrete strain measurement, or first of all, let's just talk about fiber optic cables a little bit. So the business end of a fiber optic cable is a nine micron glass tube of extremely pure glass protected by several layers of cladding. And uh, uh, the, the cost of, of this is really, really minute but it depends on the protection around that glass fiber. So if you have a very thin 
uh, plastic surround, then you may be sitting with what's a seven rand a meter. If you add a little bit more protection, the price will go up to 70 rand a meter or five dollars. And then it can be several hundred rand a meter if you have these very robust, well protected cables. But these cables can act as sensors. So, first of all, thinking of discrete strain measurement, discrete strain measurement um, work on the principle of what's called Bragg gratings. So, you can create uh, patches of imperfections on a fiber optic cable, light and dark patches on photo uh, sensitive fiber optic cables. And when you shine, a light spectrum down a fiber optic cable, the light with a wavelength of this imperfection will be reflected back. So you'll get a certain reflection coming back. And by measuring, if you now strain that fiber, the, the frequency or the wavelength of this spike is going to move to the left and right. And by measuring that change in wavelength, you can very, very accurately measure the uh, the strain in the fiber optic cable. So this is uh, it's temperature sensitive and it is strain sensitive, but it uh, allows very uh, good detection of uh, strain. So I'm not going to go into great detail. There's then also the possibility to do distributed strain for um, uh, distributed strain measurement, where you don't um, only work at distinct locations, but you get a reading along the entire length of the cable. And that works by measuring reflections from imperfections in the fiber optic itself. So there is a reflection, different types of reflections coming back. If you shine a laser light into a fiber optic cable, they talk about Raman, Riley, and Brilliant backscatter. We are specifically interested in Brilliant backscatter because it provides a strain and temperature sensitive parameter. So you can, by measuring the brilliant backscatter in a fiber optic cable, measure the strain at five centimeter intervals over 100 kilometers of fiber optic cable. And you can do so every couple of minutes. So um, the, the discrete measurements allow dynamic measurements, very rapid. But this uh, system, if you measure 100 kilometers of fiber optic cable, will take a bit of time to scan. So it's not that instant or instantaneous. So, I'm going to skip this slide. Uh, this is some of the technicality about the backscatter. This is what the system looks like. You will have a very expensive readout unit, this box, connected to your fiber optic cable, and you will get strain readings coming back from that. An advantage of uh, fiber optic strain measurement is that it is much more elegant than conventional instrumentation. Look at this incredible mess with all the cables coming out of this pile and compare that to this instance where you have one fiber optic cable going down it makes a, a, a turn at the bottom of the pile this is the pile foundation and comes up on the other side and you can have 21 or 22 23 individual strain measurements or a continuous strain measurement down the entire length of your fiber optic cable much cleaner uh, instrumentation solution so what is nice about this is you can measure many kilometers of fiber optic cables and you can embed these fiber optic cables into any concrete structure, into any embankment or anything like that. It is quite cheap. So you can really create smart structures that will tell you what they are experiencing anywhere in the structure. So um, other advantages is that uh, they are not affected by presence of water because it is light and it's not affected by presence of lightning unless you have a metallic surround in your fiber optic cable, that, that will still be uh, affected by uh, lightning. Okay, let's move on to the next. I want to speak a little bit about CT scanning as well. So sometimes we are interested to see what happens inside a sample and you can use uh, CT scanning, micro CT scanning is available at the University of Stellenbosch and at NEXA here at Palindaba. And we have at the University of Pretoria also used our medical and veterinary facilities to take photos or samples to look for voidedness in uh, little samples. So what it allows you to do is to see an isotropic grain arrangement. So if you uh, pour sand into a mold in a certain way, the particles will be orientated in a certain way, and you can see it by using these scanners. This is the equipment from Stellenbosch University. So uh, the nano uh, scanner, there you can see the, uh, the details. This is a result of some scans. 
that they have taken there. So you can really nicely see the individual soil particles. So we get extremely high resolution images. This is an application of looking for barite veins in uh, some rock from the Northern Cape. And this is an example where they look at void space distribution above a certain size in a collapsible soil. And you can very nicely now visualize how your voids are distributed. Other things that people do is they track individual grains and plot their rotation as a function of the axial strain on the sample. So this paper in geotechnique from a few years ago where they actually tracked individual particles and their individual rotations. Then I want to touch on scanning electron microscopy. Um, I think most people are aware of electron microscopes. I don't really want to talk about that. I just want to mention that there's environmental electron microscopes now available that do not require your sample to be placed under a vacuum. So you can actually observe the water in the soil sample. So that is sometimes very useful. And another technique that I want to mention is energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy and or EDS, which allows you to target, for example, that point there and say, what is the mineral composition exactly there? So you can target individual points very precisely and work out exactly what the mineralogical composition is there. Several of our universities do have this facility. Then something which is a bit of a blue sky application, the so-called uh, RTK GPS, it stands for Real-Time Kinematic Global Positioning System. One of our PhD students is playing with this. So he built his own uh, satellite receiver. You can buy GPS chips, uh, chips very cheaply and then uh, make your own uh, GPS receivers. And he actually talks to all four of the GPS satellite constellations available, the USA, uh, China, and, and so on, all of them. And uh, what they do with this is uh, if you want to create a virtual image of part of the world, you need to geo-reference your photogrammetry very accurately. And by attaching this to your, your camera system, it is possible for you to then come up with these fancy digital scans. So what the system comprises of is a, a baseline antenna mounted here at the university at uh, Engineering 4, our new facility on the N4. And then you have a roving satellite antenna that you can move around and the data from both are streamed to the internet in real time. Corrections are applied and they come down to something like 15 or 12 millimeter accuracy. And what they've done with this is just to demonstrate the ability of this to scan. There's a monument on our campus and he actually took his GPS antenna and he positioned it everywhere on this con and, and, and collected the uh, coordinates. And the coordinates were so accurate that you can see how nicely he mapped the uh, a sort of a geometry of this monument compared to a, a LIDAR track. I will say something about LIDAR in a minute as well. So the GPS is so amazing that it can actually give you this sort of resolution. Bit of a toy at the moment, but the use of this will actually be in due referencing photogrammetry for creating things like a digital twin, which I will touch upon in a moment. I will skip this slide. This is this whole story of digital twinning. In many cases, it is of interest for us to have a very high resolution digital replica of reality. This is work from my colleague, Professor Anders Grabe, here at the university, where they actually have, uh, they digitize railway tracks and then st study the movement of ballast, the rock, in great detail. And they do it virtually and uh, in, real, in real life, and then see if they can model this behavior to study degradation on railway lines. Then I want to briefly mention a few monitoring projects. And the first is where we have applied suction measurements on active tailings dams or an active tailings dam. So I'm not going to skip uh, many of the text because I don't have much time. And I'm just going to show you what we have done. So this is the Slimes Dam and we had instruments at three locations that you can see over there. And looking at it in a cross section, we installed potentiometers to measure suction at that depth, that depth, that depth, and then several locations on the beach of the tailings dam. And in addition to that, we monitored volumetric water content. And uh, we, uh, our, our students are very smart and clever with electronics these days. They built their own data loggers that logs the data and 
that sends it with a cell phone link to us back in Pretoria. And uh, this is the data that we have acquired. So top here is pore pressure. Here we have volumetric water content and here we have temperature. And you can very nicely see when there's a new deposition event, what does it do to the suction? What does it do to the volumetric water content at various depths? And what this allows us now is to really study the drying and desiccation process on the beach of tailings dams in great detail. That was not previously possible. Um, the communication protocol, um, they previously used something called SIGFOX, which is just little SMSs. But what we have these days is something called LoRaWAN, it stands for Long Range Wire um, Wireless. Wire, I, I forgot exactly what the, the, the abbreviation, what the abbreviation stands for, but uh, wide area networks, what it stands for. So long range wide area network. It is like having your own Wi-Fi network on your slimes dam. So I'm going to skip this slide and rather focus on that in a few minutes. It is like having your own wireless on your slimes dam. Before I just talk about that, I'm going to talk about uh, just instrumentation work that we place on some of our railway uh, infrastructure. This is now to study climate effects on railway formations. So what our team did is they installed a lot of moisture sensors and pressure sensors and temperature sensors at various layers in a actual railway formation. And then observed that over the seasons and look at what is the effect of uh, rainfall and traffic loading and all factors like that on the suctions, the deformation, and you can even ma then monitor things like climate change effects. So that all these instruments, <coughs> excuse me, installed at different depths that allow this to be uh, studied in great detail. Um, I just wanna show a quick LIDAR application from, from drones. So LIDAR is just uh, light ranging and detection. So it allows you to map infrastructure and take surveys of infrastructure. So the diagram at the bottom shows a very nice scan of uh, the railway infrastructure, the cables and the tracks itself. And this is an example where LIDAR was used to uh, monitor settlement of a slimes dam. And uh, this dam showed severe distress on one of the, uh, the, the Western wall in this case. And by doing a before and after laser, uh, a LIDAR survey, they could identify the uh, area of subsidence very clearly. But also look at how nice the consolidation data from the basin of the slime stem. So you can really nicely see the consolidation in your pool on the actual dam. I just wanna to touch very briefly on fiber optic leak detection. I've spoken about the fact that fiber optic cables can measure temperature and strain, and therefore they can be used in liner systems. If you bury fiber optic grid under a liner system in a slime dam or in a landfill site, and you get a leak, you'll most likely get a change in the temperature as the water or the fluid would uh, run through there. And if you are wetting up a previously dry material, you generate suctions in that material, and those suctions cause strains, and these strains can be detected. And that allows us to use fiber optic cables as a means of leak detection. And we've done some work here at the university doing that on pipelines. And this is an example where we are, we buried a pipeline on our uh, university experimental farm. And then uh, there's a fiber optic, couple of fiber optic cables buried next to it. And then we measure the brilliant frequency shift is that backscatter shift over time. And you can see, we opened up a tap at some point and we let it run for several days. And you can see how it caused a massive deviation in the reflected brilliant backscatter that we observed. Every day you see a massive thermal effect as the, 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 the pipe that we used to, to feed into the leak point here ran above ground. So during the day it would get hot, at night it would cool down again. That's why you see these massive thermal spikes every day. But you can very clearly pick up the uh, amount of, or the, the fact that there's a leak occurring. Fiona, I'm out of my time. Um, yes. Would you like me to conclude? Um, how much longer do you have left for your presentation? I, I can finish it in five minutes, but I'm happy to conclude if it is going to mess up your program. 
I think five minutes is okay as long as it's okay. as long as we can cut it then and then there is a question in the chat. We won't mm -hmm. take any questions, but if you could go into the chat and answer the questions in there afterwards, that would be great. I will do so. Thank you very much for bearing with me. Okay. I'm um, sorry, it's me. Keep going on this. Okay, so I'm not going to speak about this for the moment. I'm also going to skip on this for the moment. But the, this is the application of fiber optic strain measurements in small models at the University of Johannesburg. So this is done by uh, Professor Maria Ferentino. So really interesting work there. The communication networks that I want to talk about uh, very briefly is the following. So I've spoken about the fact that you can have so many sensors. So you can have moisture sensors and deformation sensors and air pollution sensors and really create something at the University of Pretoria here we have um, on our Hillcrest campus, the former proof class or experimental farm. We've got a load of these sensors and they, they talk about the smart campus. So all these things talk to each other, talk to the internet, but you need a communication protocol for these things. And that is the system called LoRaWAN. Wi-Fi is of limited range, Bluetooth is of limited range, Satellite, uh, sorry, 3G, 4G, and 5G cell phone technology is relatively expensive. So there's this LoRaWAN application, it's long range wide area network. And it is like having a wireless network for instruments everywhere on your campus, your farm, um, or whatever infrastructure you are interested to monitor. So uh, it comprises of a, a base station antenna that needs to be mounted somewhere. And you have several kilometers line of sight uh, reception. So you can have something like a moisture probe or something talking to this wirelessly. Data is uploaded to the cloud and you get the data in real time. So um, you can access it on the internet and it is a very valuable technology. There are also um, sort of proprietary radio networks. I think many people will be uh, aware of the piezometers that we can use these days to monitor what happens on slime stamps. And uh, you can get the data in real time on your desk via the internet. Then talk about modeling capabilities. This is software running off graphics processes uh, developed by mechanical engineering here at the University of Pretoria. So it is massively fast because it runs off a graphics processor compared to normal CPUs and it allows every individual particle of the soil to be modeled individually. Um, numerical modeling, there's serious advances in unsaturated capability in many of our software suites. And there is advances in constitutive modeling um, using a model called NOR sand, which is a very good model to model critical site properties of tailings. So, and this is just showing how good the fit of actual lab data to the numerical model is, or the other way around. And this is for drained loading. The previous slide was for undrained loading. Then where you cannot work with uh, numerical modeling, um, you can do physical modeling. And we do that using a geotechnical centrifuge so that we get the stress in the model the same as in real life. And that is important because the stress strain properties of soils uh, are nonlinear. And this is just the centrifuge here at the University of Pretoria. This is an example of sinkhole propagation studies to see how a sinkhole would propagate to the soil surface. And then an interesting one that I want to show you and complete uh, conclude by will be a, a model of a slimes dam that we have recently uh, ran. And this is to model liquefaction failure. So you had a high fluid level. This is looking at the face head on. And you can see that sloughing is beginning to occur at the toe. And this dam is getting progressively more and more unhappy and eventually we got quite a nice flow failure occurring there. So this now allows us to study these tailings down failure mechanisms in a model and do it obviously safety, safely, which you cannot do in real life. Okay, I am not going to read the conclusions, but what I do want to do is, um, I just want to make the point that we are catching up in terms of what is available in this country. And there's a lot of scope for research in the field of especially tailings, the sampling and the testing and the understanding of tailings. And then I want to thank this list of people who contributed material to this presentation. Thank you very much for your kind attention and for allowing me to overrun. Oh, 
Oh, thank you, Professor Jacobs. That was um, so informative and interesting. I'm going to hand you over to Camille, our next speaker. She's also in the committee with the GSSA, and Camille's going to be talking about the 3D hydrostratigraphic modeling and target identification using LeapFrog and geotechnical data. So it's over to you, Camille. Okay, well, um, just to sort of accumulate all of the information that has been shared today, um, I propose that I present um, what I do and how I use geotechnical data in my day-to-day -day work. Um, so just to go over what I'm going to be talking about, I'll first introduce myself and the, the work that I, I'm currently doing. Um, and then what is hydrostratigraphy and how can geotechnical data help with what I do? So my name is Camille Clark. I'm a senior hydrogeologist at Mount Pizolt. Um, and I have a background in very strong in geology. I went up to my MSc in geology and I focus primarily there on basin analysis. Um, due to circumstances at the time, I ended up in the field of hydrogeology. But I was always more interested in the rocks than the water that flowed through them. With my strong background in geology and basin evolution, and with a particular interest in structural geology, my main focus over the past few years has been to develop hydrostratigraphic conceptual models. My reluctance to let go of this passion for rocks and how they formed and changed over time has influenced what information I always include in my assessments. I hungrily grab at all the geological data and not only focus on hydrogeological data that has been presented. So by looking at all this data together in the 3D space, it really starts to open up these connections that, can make, that one can make between the different data sets. So stealing a slide from um, Peter Day from this morning's uh, presentation, he mentioned that you have a lot of the pure sciences, geology, for example, going further into your applied scientists and sciences and want to start looking into the engineering aspects. So my first year of university was actually um, industrial engineering. I then changed to engineering geology and realized that mathematics just wasn't quite right for me. So I ended up in pure geology. During that stage, I took a lot of um, electives. So I looked, I, I did several electives in geomorphology. I loved the paleontology and uh, going into sedimentology, particularly during my master's degree um, and using all that information to discover and understand the evolution of the particular basin I was looking at. I've used this method throughout my career now, and I have the strong belief, and Peter Day, as Peter Day said, the best results are achieved by working together and combining our individual special skills. As many of the presenters have said, I can't go and become a geotechnical engineer, just as the engineer can't come become a geologist. However, there is a very vast overlap of understanding um, that really needs to be used going forward with um, these type of investigations. So what is stratigraphy? So let's look at stratigraphy first of all. It's the classification of different layers and layering of sedimentary deposits in a sedimentary or layered volcanic, layered volcanic rocks. This field is important to understand the geological history and forms the basin, basis for classification of rocks and into distinct units that can be mapped. Now going further, hydrogeology is the area of geology that deals with the distribution and movement of water in the soil and rocks of the Earth's crust. Bringing that together, you get hydrostratigraphy is the classification of subsurface into distinct hydrogeological units, each with a defined aerial extent, thickness, and hydraulic parameters. So I don't only look at 
sandstone, siltstone, mudstone, etc. I can group or split these units up according to the hydro hydraulic parameters. In some instances, for example, granite and gabbro, which won't, <laughs> won't really be in the same setting, would be grouped together as they are both plutonic rocks with very similar hydraulic parameters. We also look at different structures, faults. That in itself is a, a, a individual hydrostratigraphic unit. But now where does this geotechnical data come in? So let's look what we have. We have rock type from the geological data, check. We've got groundwater data, level, quality, storage, transmissivity, check. And faults and dikes from then the structural data. But looking closer, particularly in water stressed areas, we can use the geotechnical data to better understand the hydraulic conditions on the ground. We look at joints and their conditions, foliation including cleavage, um, rock quality designation and recovery, as well as many of the other aspects that have been mentioned previously. Lindy has uh, a lovely explanation of the different geotechnical data that you can um, determine from, from your core. So from a hydrogeological point of view, fractures and discontinuities are amongst the most important geological structures. And most rock processes uh, possess fractures and other discontinuities facilitate storage and movement as well as possibly um, being barriers to water flow. So hydraulic properties of the rock mass are found to vary in relation to complex interplay between in-situ stress, rock matrix properties, fracture characteristics. So it is very important to understand what these features can do to the groundwater movement. So I'm going to go over a case study. Um, to really just show the general methodology I follow when developing this hydrostratigraphic model. Now, I don't go and um, log core as a geotechnical engineer or engineering geologist. Somebody else does that because that is their um, expertise. I take that data and assume that it is correctly logged. Obviously, we always have to make certain assumptions. But I trust that those scientists have made um, the best uh, log of those units. And I use that uh, to create then my 3D model. I first need to get a geological understanding and evolution of and the current in rock stresses of the area. And it is so important to have that understanding and not just see the ground as a layer cake. Um, I, I've been using Leapfrog Geo and I've recently gone over to Leapfrog Works to generate these hydrostratigraphic models and I incorporate all the data that I can possibly get my hands on, exploration data, geotechnical data, um, as well as your groundwater monitoring, etc. Also included geophysics, um, surface mapping, absolutely everything that has a spatial attribute to it. I then bring that geotechnical data in and I create these geotechnical domains based on their potential hyd hydraulic uh, parameters. So this particular project is, was based in the Gansey Belt uh, in Namibia, I mean in Botswana. And um, it's located in the meso to neoproterozoic Gonzi group, meta sedimentary rocks, which form part of the Kalahari copper belt. The Kalahari sands in this area are very thick and extend to around 100 meters below surface. And the groundwater level in the area is also very deep, and it seems to be found at that transition between the sands and the underlying rock. 
Now, bear in mind, these Kalahari sands are quite unconsolidated. Water qualities are extremely poor in this area. Some having uh, total dissolved solids of 14,000 milligrams per liter. And just to put that in perspective, the World Health Organization recommends a maximum of 300 milligrams per liter as potable water, and that is pushing it. Numerous drilling campaigns, specifically for groundwater exploration, um, were conducted in the area. And due to the thick sands, targeting those local structures um, with geophysics was very difficult. And then obviously the complexity of the geology in that area. Luckily, there is regional geophysics, but unfortunately it wasn't accurate enough and the, um, the 3D extrapolation of those faults weren't really possible. So the task was then to determine dewatering requirements for this underground mine and water supply to the mining process. Because this area is such a water stressed area, the mine has to source its water where it is. If there is not enough water, then unfortunately the mining cannot continue. So many of the hydrogeological exploration boreholes were shallow and did not extend much deeper into the fractured rock, um, particularly around the, the mine area. A local leapfrog model had been generated by the client, particularly specifically for resource determination. Um, so it included the resource exploration drilling data. Um, geotechnical data was then also brought in, the geophysics, the regional geophysics, mine plans, et cetera. So thankfully the client had already incorporated much of this data into this local leapfrog model. But with hydrogeology, we have to look at the catchment area and not only um, the area around the, model, uh, around the mine. So in order to extrapolate this data regionally and to define target areas, we needed to get that regional understanding of the area. So looking at the structural evolution of the basin, um, you start off with this extensional basin um, with the deposition of volcanic and sedimentary deposits, typical of this type of regime. So you start there with, um, with volcanic activity, you get, where's my pen? Um, do I have a mouse there? Can you see my mouse? Okay. Um, so you have the, the queer bear formation, which is your volcanic suite, um, going into your coarser sediments, your sandstones, your aronites, conglomerates, because you're starting to get this extensional basin. Um, you're having a lot of erosion taking place, high energy, so you're getting these coarser grained um, units. Then you start to get that um, alternating sandstone, mudstone, as your, your basin then develops, you're starting to get um, deltaic deposits, meandering rivers, etc. cetera. Um, also during this period, you had um, a lot of uh, plants starting to get established. And then this then resulted in some carbonaceous units in between. So the next structural regime then um, changed and resulted in regional folding and subsequent uh, thrust faulting, as you can see here at C and D. Um, the next structural event was again an extensional event, but in a different direction, which ended up shearing and rotating a lot of these units, um, creating plastic and ductile deformation, shear band type S and C structures, pinch and swell that you can see here um, on your last uh, image there, um, F. So these events subsequently resulted in a metamorphism of the succession into the green schist basins. Now, what metamorphism ends up doing to sedimentary rocks and rocks in general is that it reduces the primary porosity. So now the water that was trapped within these units has either been squeezed out um, and or are trapped and aren't able to flow. This surface was then eroded and then covered by those Kalahari sands. This is the, ge the regional geology of the study area um, beneath the Kalahari sands, and it was derived from 
the geophysics surveys that were done, the Aeromag um, and Aeromag anomaly. So you can clearly see how the rocks have been folded and stretched in this area. The older queer bear formation, the group, which is in brown here, um, which is the oldest stratigraphy here, consists of volcanics, which, which hasn't reacted in a ductile manner. Um, so it's become, it's far more rigid than the overlying uh, sedimentary deposits. And it, you can then see these overlying sedimentary deposits acting in a more ductile manner and actually getting stretched um, around these, uh, these larger folds, like Play-Doh. So the mine concession sits primarily on the Dakar formation. However, when developing the hydrostratigraphic model, we need to actually have a look at that catchment area. Besides the magnificent folding and stretching forms here, certain structures are also displayed. We have several anticlines and synclines that are from the first deformation phase. You also then have thrust faults, shear zones um, from the, the later deformation phases, and you also have crew aged dolerite dark drusers. So now let's move on to the different target features that would promote or prohibit groundwater flow. So the features that I generally target, and particularly in this setting, are folds. We need to get an understanding of the rheology of the different units. Um, starting on a regional scale, I'm going to talk then about folds and go through right into joints. So understanding the rheology of the geological units and the differences in rheology, rheology is very useful. So rheology is how a rock will behave when a force is applied to it. So some units, such as the volcanics and coarser grain sedimentary units, have behaved in a more brittle manner under this type of um, compaction, um, under compressional forces. So low grade features and morphism. And this is due really to um, your, your high quartz um, and feldspar content in those rocks. They are more comfortable uh, at higher temperatures. So they don't necessarily um, realign themselves. So they don't foliate. And the rock then tends to break. And you get these extensional and contractional fractures in the fold hinges. So that then is a very good target for groundwater flow. So the mudstones and siltstones, and also the limestones um, units behave in a more ductile manner, creating these decreased potential in groundwater flow. And you can see how your more ductile units are more heavily folded than your, your stronger units here. So the carbonaceous units in the sequence um, are the weakest unit. And as, a as the succession is folded, these weak units have allowed for flexural slip. And it creates these shears along these contacts. And that shearing can result in brecciation in places and opening up the potential for groundwater flow to flow. So this was a very prominent feature in the bronzy bulb situation. And that is one of the features that I want to target. Moving on to uh, your strike slip, your regional strike slip faults here. Um, during the later extensional event, significant strike slip faulting occurred. And I don't only look now at that strike slip fault. There is a lot of structure that is associated with a strike slip fault that can actually provide better indication of groundwater flow. So fractures between the strike slips, such as RP and R shear fractures, were identified. You, um, and then the small scale structures, particularly the extensional T fractures that form perpendicular to the maximum instantaneous stretching axis, those begin to dilate. And when those fractures dilate, it allows for groundwater to flow. So identifying these fractures from the geotechnical data using the dip and strike, um, and also identifying, looking at the geotechnical conditions, such as an open, open joint, closed joint, et cetera, you start to get an understanding of the orientation and dip of these specific structures. 
So now let's get a bit more geotechnical. Our main focus is to define areas of higher permeability, both regionally and locally. So these features are then better characterized by using the geotechnical data. So here you've got a very generic conceptual understanding here. So fluid can travel fast and far along mm -hmm. high permeable pathways, such as faults, red. Um, your pink, your discordances, so um, between the queer bear formation and the uh, uh, overlying um, Dakar formation. So these contacts uh, have a strong rheo rheological contrast, as uh, mentioned before. Now, this was very new to me when I started um, this methodology, FAP, fluid, the, the fluid permeability along the pervasive fold axial planar cleavage. Originally, you would think that the shortest distance between these folds um, would be the best way to flow, or particularly along bedding, but not really, particularly in, met in metamorphosed areas. That primary porosity is gone, but this fold axial planar cleavage it opens up, particularly around the hinge of your folds, and allows for groundwater to flow. So several joint sets were identified here and grouped according to the geological units. Um, so there was a dominant steep east southeast to southeast dipping joint set. Uh, what I was looking for in particular were the, the, the fold actual planar cleavage uh, and joint sets. Also looking at joint roughness, fluid flow is restricted along fractures with a rough surface and is more easily facilitated along smooth walled fractures. Also whether the joint is filled or closed, uh, filled or open. Um, if the joint is obviously filled, there was historically groundwater movements through there, but has since either precipitated, for example, a quartz or calcite vein, or has been filled by more finer clays, et cetera. So this specific area um, had quite a fantastic data set in terms of joint conditions. Also then just touching on rock quality designation, um, as, as Lindy was going through a presentation earlier today showing the calculations and how these um, different characteristics or things are numerically calculated, you can see that RQD isn't always the best, um, the best indication of areas that are considered um, of low quality. You can get areas that bring back a high RQD, but have no groundwater flow whatsoever. So this is very project specific. Um, however, this project, thankfully, um, when, when I looked at the RQDs around 30%, um, so around poor, you get fractured core in the, in the lithology logs, sheared zone, brecciation, um, crushed core, fault zone. So I was, then, I was then happy to look at that RQD and start pulling out areas that had that range of RQD, the 30%. I also looked at um, the deformation intensity values that were provided, the RMM and um, fracture count. All of that information can lead to areas and zones that have potentially high storage capacity. So going, just having a brief overview of then the, the criteria in which I follow to firstly generate this hydrostratigraphic model, but also then to target for groundwater exploration. So stratigraphy, football, you need to obviously look at the football and hanging wall, particularly around the mining area. Um, your stratigraphic contacts, in this case, those carbonaceous units were and were fantastic contacts to, to look for because of that um, flexural slip shearing. The major shear zone um, and the associated faults, also faults from uh, that were derived from the aeromagnetic data. 
and most importantly, intersections of these, where a fault intersects a dike or um, a surface fault, the shear zone intersects one of the stratigraphic contacts, etc. Also bringing in the geotech data, uh, pulled out uh, joint, joints that had a dip between 60 and 80, and then more than 80, and the strike of 89 to 135. So that then is your fold actual planar cleavage. We want to look for deformation intensity more than two. So the values were from one to three. So three being the most deformed. Um, fracture count more than eight. Uh, uh, these fracture counts can go way up to 20, 30. However, um, I wanted to still have uh, a, a decent amount of joints to work with. I also looked at open joint count and RQD. And then the proximity of boreholes that were already drilled that provided water and then the surface faults. So this is a very simple, simplified hydrogeological conceptual model. So this is not the hydrostructographic one yet. Um, so you can see then the geological units here. The different features that I want to point out, you've got the flexural slip um, strike slip faults here. You have that main shear zone that, um, that runs regionally. You have fractures within the sandstone, this massive sandstone, which had a lower, well, a, a stronger rheology than the, uh, the units above. So I want to target then those fracture zones. Um, you have your radial and pier fracture shear fractures from this major shear zone, etc. Then I look at what I'm going to target. So it's not only these, these features as individual features. I also want to look for where these features intersect, because that then can provide even a higher potential for groundwater storage. So let's move to the leapfrog model now. Um, I have got the leapfrog model open, but it's it was done in an earlier version of leapfrog and it's busy updating and I don't know whether it's finished yet, but uh, I do have a view file of it. So we chose a regional boundary based on um, the catchment. So this was a, the regional model, geological model. I then clipped it to the catchment boundary and then using dikes as um, our boundary zones there. I then refined the model to a point where I was able to model in those individual um, units, the carbonaceous shale, the sandstone, etc., and came to this beautifully detailed model here. So this purple and gray here is actually the Kalahari sands and the culcrete um, in that Kalahari sands, which I've been removed to expose that bottom layer. Um, as mentioned before, let's look at the geotech data. So using Leapfrog's numerical model function, I was able to create ISO shells um, that indicated areas with increased occurrence of those particular areas, those particular uh, criteria, sorry. So combining things such as dip and strike, I was able then to get zones that had a lot of fold actual planar cleavage joints. Um, also areas with a high number of open fractures, et cetera. So I just want to go into, let's see if this one's, no, that one's not open yet. So this is just a view file of the model. Um, unfortunately, the, the geology is one set, so I can't um, split up the geology here for you, but this is then the regional model and it is on a very large scale because I work in meters. Um, where our mine is located really in the center here. So I'm going to take the mine, uh, the, the model off to show you then the mine and then those geotechnical features that were modeled. So first of all, that's the, the mine plan at the time. Um, it obviously has changed. Um, there was lots of structural data available from the geophysics anomalies. Um, so you can see your north, northeast, south, west shear zone. So this um, dark, this, this value, this line here represents that major strike slip zone. 
And you can see in this region here, you have a lot of associated structures with it. Um, and then going on to then my ISO shells. So with the geotech data, I created ISO shells for each individual criteria. I then combined those to pull out zones that had those specific criteria. So this particular one is dip and open, uh, open joint as well as strike. So now that's a fit. Then I've got areas that had a high deformation intensity and fracture count. And these are areas with specific dip and strike according to FAP. And this layer was specifically in the sandstone looking for open joints and um, that low RQD. So what's great about this now, once this is generated, um, and I used, statistics based on the, the lithology data and all of that to apply a structural trend to these values. So you can see that they are flattened. Um, but what's great is you can see exactly where we have this high count, um, high fracture count, you have your radial fractures coming through there from the shear zone. So that was really great to see that there's that correlation um, between those fractures uh, and the faults. So just to turn that off quickly. So from this then, we are able then to create these different targets, drilling targets. With this method, we are able to give you the coordinates of a drill, a drill hole, a depth and expected geological units that you're going to be intercepting and predict where we're going to get a water strike. It makes it incredibly useful when planning these drilling, uh, drilling campaigns, determining how much, um, how much uh, casings you're gonna need, what kind of pump you're gonna need uh, in order to pump water from the depths, from that depth, et cetera. Um, and it's proven very, very useful in not only this project, but other ones that I have been working on. So just going back here. Okay. So then I was able to present this to the client with our different target areas. Um, I also then generated uh, prognosis lithology logs to go along with it. And we, we prioritize the boreholes as well according to the criteria. Which criteria will have a more a higher likelihood of um, hitting potential groundwater storage and flow. I was also able to evaluate or what's the word now? Um, use the the mine plan and project those different uh, conditions onto the mine plan. So you can actually see areas that may may have geotechnical issues later on. This of course is purely for indication and it's not a formal geotechnical uh, numerical model. And it is obviously just interpreted based on the, uh, the method that I've shown you here. But it is great to identify potential risk areas and geotechnical, um, geotechnical engineers and rock mechanics can then go focus and have a closer look and do a proper um, geotechnical evaluation. So 10 boreholes were chosen to be drilled for that campaign. Um, the first borehole was dry. <laughs> um, however, looking at that information that we gained from this borehole, uh, I used that to apply to my other targets and adjust them where necessary. Eight boreholes struck significant water, and one borehole that was expected to be dry was dry. So I give myself a 90% success rate there. So I'm pretty happy with that. I've used this technique now several times with some other projects, and it is still uh, a learning curve. And getting that interaction between 
myself as a hydrogeologist and workshopping ideas with engineers, with the geologists, um, with rock engineers to try and get a better understanding of each individual site. And just like all of us, we are all unique. Our mine sites are all unique. So it is, every project is a learning curve and it's, it's just, it is such exciting work. And I hope more people get involved in this. Thank you very much. Okay. I think if there are no questions, just to say thank you very much, Camille, for the really informative talk again. It's great to see the, the data being put into use, having spent the morning sort of looking at the data collection. It's really good to see how it's modeled downstream. So yeah, thank you very much for that. This is it's just really only um, one way to use to use this data. And there's so much more that can be done and extrapolated from these data sets. So um, ensuring that this data is of high quality and that they talk to each other is so important for any um, site investigation. Um, and I see Xavier asked what made me think of using LeapFrog to begin with. Um, so LeapFrog was, came around to South Africa really, I think in early 2000s. Um, and the company I was working for at the time, SRK Consulting, had started to introduce that program in the, in the, geology, the geology department. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, I've got this obsession with geology. I was often in and out of the geology department. Um, and yeah, uh, my boss at the time was also quite interested and we gave it a go and it, it worked incredibly well. Uh, so we haven't stopped using it since. Excellent. So what, was, what was the shift of, of the completing the first borehole? So we noticed that um, specific criteria in that borehole, what we intercepted, um, showed where water would not flow. So for example, we were looking at a quartz vein interception. Um, and when we got to that quartz vein intersection, um, it was bone dry. So I then went back to the other targets that had one had the quartz vein criteria in and I removed it. I was also because I was on site for for those first few boreholes, I was able to go to the core shed and because I did all of this <laughs> at home, you know, um, I hadn't been to site. I would just gotten all this information um, digitally and had put this all together. So when I got to site, I was actually able to go and look at the core, which is very, very important as well. Site work is still so important. Um, and I was actually able to pick up that core and look for myself what these different units looked like, specifically that carbonaceous contact. Um, I also then identified specific mineralogy that occurred in these these faults that were carrying water, because you can look at a, a joint and if there's um, specific min minerals that have been deposited, like um, hematite, for example, um, it shows that there's relatively recent gravel to flow. So I was able then to go back into the data sets um, because I also had the assay data. I was able to go identify these units that had an occurrence of hematite, of calcite, et cetera, and pull those out and included in that interpretation. Oh, thanks very much, Camille. I think we've gone into our tea time break. There is one more question in the in the chat. Uh, I'm not sure if you want to give us a quick answer or we, we should actually break no, for tea and reconvene at three. Hmm? So just to, um, and I think that's an important question. Um, so LeapFrog is not a hydrogeological modeling software. It is primarily a geological modeling software. It does have an extension for hydrogeology. Um, however, it just creates um, either a mod flow um, grid model, so your block model, mod flow or fee flow at the moment. I'm actually not too sure whether they have introduced other modeling programs yet. So it can't run simulations such as uh, mindy watering contaminant flow, but it can then build that, um, that model into a, a fee flow model that can be imported then into fee flow 
and actual, actually run those simulations. So that is essentially what um, I do with these models is after I've done the conceptual model and did the drilling program, we then convert it to that numerical modeling program. We currently use either MindyW or FeeFlow, uh, but we are expanding into the other um, programs just to have that uh, ability. So yeah, as I said, LeapFrog's not for groundwater modeling, but it certainly, we've used it to build those geological models, the hydrogeological models. Okay, thanks very much. I'm gonna stop it there and just okay, say we can you. go for tea. Thank you, Camille, and thank you, uh, Professor Jacobs. Our next speaker, who I really don't need to introduce, is Tony Abair, who's gonna give us a brief overview of the hazards associated with dolomites in South Africa. Um, Tony, I'll hand over to you. Right, great. Thanks very much. Um, so I, I'm going to give you guys a bit of a potted history of, of uh, Dolomite and the hazards and how, how we've kind of uh, fumbled our way forwards in dealing with them. So if we start off just first looking at where exactly this um, bad guy lives, then you will see in this diagram the, that um, the Dolomite is um, located within the Transvaal supergroup for the most part, uh, and a big triangular wedge of it out here in the Northern Cape, um, stretching from uh, ooh, way down south, south of um, uh, Kimberley, right up north to Kuruman and beyond. Uh, at this point, it becomes buried under the um, Kalahari sands. Um, and then uh, we find more of it uh, stretching out uh, around the Transvaal uh, supergroup uh, outcrop area and, of course, around the uh, northern end of the, the Friedefort Dome. So that's the area that we're talking about. Uh, there are, of course, other uh, limestone formations um, down south in the, the Cape, uh, which would be included in uh, the regulations of, of rocks that, that are classified as, as uh, cast, uh, as, as areas in which cast can develop. But this is the area that we'll uh, focus on for sure today. So uh, if we look at the history, um, in the early 1950s, sinkholes and subsidences were developing uh, sort of south of Pretoria, uh, predominantly in the military areas. Um, but because it was military and therefore everything was classified, uh, not much information was released. We didn't, as a profession, I think, know a great deal of it. it the uh, uh, problem was handled mostly by the geological survey. I seem to remember Dr. Pike being involved in that. Um, and the one awful incident that happened in that period was... Uh, a sinkhole that was um, backfilled. In fact, I think it might have been as late as 1960. Uh, during the backfilling of the sinkhole, three laborers working in the bottom of the sinkhole with uh, compactors um, were lost. Uh, they were dragged down when the sinkhole reactivated. And they were the first people to die in a sinkhole. And then uh, in the early 1960s, we... Uh, were hit by this uh, headline, um, December the 12th, 1962, a massive sinkhole uh, opened up at Fentis Post Mine and it swallowed up uh, a, an entire crusher plant. Uh, something like 26 people uh, died uh, in that single event. And as you can see from the photograph there, um, there's no trace of the, the uh, crusher plant and that's uh, some 10 stories high. So. It was a, a monster sinkhole um, that, that uh, swallowed up that, that structure. Shortly thereafter, a couple of years later, this event uh, shocked in, uh, the nation. Um, and a house with a family of five in it was swallowed up in, uh, I think it was Wilbur also, if I remember correctly, out near Coltonville. 
and uh, they that event that sinkhole then grew gradually bigger and bigger through the day, uh, through the um, subsequent days until the house which had uh, been located near the center here uh, was not just the only one destroyed, but you can see the neighboring houses were swallowed up as well. Um, the, what in, kind of intrigued me about this as a student, uh, we, myself and Dave Buttrick were tasked during our honors year with going to look uh, and trying to find um, uh, records of sinkholes that had developed. And we went through all the newspapers in the process of doing that. And, and what quite intrigued me about uh, this sinkhole and the one that I mentioned previously was that even though only five people died in this event, uh, a lot more attention was given to it by the newspapers. So the Sunday newspapers had massive color photographs, um, uh, double page spreads in the middle of the paper. It was quite intriguing. Um, and I assume that the reason for that um, was because people don't really expect to die in their sleep at home, uh, safely in their, their little castle, whereas it's perfectly acceptable to die at work on a mine. Um, perhaps just a, a kind of telling um, comment on the way society views uh, life and where we live and work and the dangers associated with it. But nevertheless, round about this period, uh, sorry, let me just first show you where the West Strand is and the area that was affected. So our light blue here is the Dolomite. So stretching from Runfontein, roughly over here, through past Western area, including Carltonville and Oberholse, which was here, uh, down to an area of about here. All of these areas, uh, including Fentis Post, which is, uh, Fentis Post, sorry, which is located just over there, north of Western area. These areas were all um, uh, developing sinkholes. And as a result of this, a lot of work was done by, in particular, uh, Professor Jennings and uh, Tony Brink, both of whom were at the University of the Witwatersrand at the time. And uh, they advanced a, a model, which is still pretty much in use today in terms of explaining what had happened. But an interesting aside, and I, I don't have any written record of this, but I, I have been told this um, by people who lived through that period, uh, initially, the, the mines in the state um, denied that, uh, that they had anything to do with the development of the sinkholes on the far west Rand. And it was this model that uh, Jennings and Brink developed, which is uh, showcased in and, and the, developed in Tony Brink's volume one on the engineering geology of South Africa. Um, and these pictures come from that, uh, from that uh, uh, volume. Um, they were able to show that, in fact, the lowering of the water table by the mines had triggered the sinkholes. And this was their model and their, their um, uh, idea of, of what happened. So if we look at a cross section, here's our dolomite uh, with the pinnacles going up close to surface. Uh, and the water table located uh, above the cavities. And these chimneys are choked with, uh, with residium from the weathering process and possibly with Kalahari sands we discovered in some instances and, um, and uh, 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 other um, geological um, depositions. So the water table um, forms uh, the baseline of erosion. So any water percolating down here loses its energy once it hits the, the water table and therefore is unable to erode this material into these uh, caverns down below, which are largely empty. The water table gets lowered and then any infiltration of water from surface, um, such as that from a leaking pipe here, in the case of the uh, house that was swallowed, uh, people believed that, that it was from uh, overwatering of the garden. Um, apparently, uh, the, the owner of the house uh, grew prized roses and he watered them day and night. So it was quite possible that uh, the excessive amount of water that he put onto the surface of the ground resulted in the sinkhole developing. 
So the leaking pipe is now able to erode uh, material down into the, uh, the cavity because the, the water table has been lowered. The baseline of erosion has effectively been lowered. And so uh, this cavity uh, gradually continues to develop. And as uh, Tony Brink was, was always keen to point out, in uh, large parts of, of Southern Africa, we have that pedogenic layer that I spoke of earlier, often associated with the um, uh, pebble marker, uh, which uh, is stronger than the, the underlying and overlying material. And quite often that arrests the progress of the sinkhole uh, and allows it to develop laterally for a short period. And then come the summer rains and the surface weakens and the sinkhole develops. And this then slowly widens out um, and becomes the enormous feature that was so, um, so frequently seen on the, the Far West Rand. So whilst we might not completely adhere to this model uh, anymore, it nevertheless serves, I think, as a fairly good con conceptual model for us to, to work with um, uh, going forward. And certainly, um, we still reference it a lot. All right, some definitions then. Uh, a sinkhole is a deep, steep-sided hole that develops rapidly. And when I mean rapidly, it's literally seconds. One of the stories of another person who died in a sinkhole was that uh, a gentleman sitting watching um, uh, a, uh, a tennis match um, was sitting right over a sinkhole. There was apparently a rumble, cloud of dust, and uh, when the dust cleared, the spectator had disappeared. The only humorous um, part to that uh, very sudden uh, and horrible incident was that the barman uh, watching through the window saw this happen, and he climbed into his fridge and closed the door, believing that somehow this might, uh, might save him from uh, suffering a similar fate. The other feature that we often talk about in the, um, uh, in the dolomitic areas are subsidences. These used to be known as dolines, and you'll often see them referenced as such in uh, literature that is uh, earlier than about 2000, uh, possibly even a little bit later than that. But we, we would uh, generally, generally refer to these very uh, shallow, extremely wide depressions uh, as dolines. We now call them subsidences. They usually develop uh, as a result of consolidation of WAD. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about the WAD now. As the water table lowers, the WAD, uh, the stress conditions change, the WAD um, consolidates and the surface then, then uh, settles. So just a, a quick note about WAD. It's, it's effectively our uh, completely weathered dolomite. Um, the, it, the process uh, in which, by which it gets formed is that the bulk of the solid rock gets carried away in solution, dolomite being mostly a calcium magnesium um, carbonate. That gets carried away in solution and uh, the residuum uh, that is left behind is these very fine clay-sized particles of, of quartz or silica, which are coated with manganese or iron oxides, uh, giving it this distinctive extremely dark, um, quite often black uh, soil, which we call WAD. Um, just a quick note on that. Some people have refer re believed that WAD comes from weathered, altered dolomite. It, that is a complete lot of nonsense. WAD is a mining term, um, which has been in use for, for, for a long, long time. And it simply refers to any soil that is manganese rich. Uh, and in South Africa, that is generally our wad, which develops from, from dolomite. It is ex an exceedingly low density soil. Um, it literally, if you were able to coat it in wax, you would be able to put it on water and it would float. It's um, therefore, as a result, highly compressible because it is uh, more void than solid. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about wad uh, later on. So that's an illustration of a sinkhole out on the far west rand. Um, they're nasty features, uh, very deep, very um, steep sided. They range in diameter from anything uh, between two and 30 meters. 
um, and uh, the largest uh, sinkhole was uh, close to 100 meters wide once it had uh, finished uh, developing and the sides collapsing in. So these can be extremely large features. A lot of destruction was done on the West Rand uh, through the development of uh, these uh, subsidences, these dough lines. Here you can see the cracks um, which developed across this road and railway line. The railway line you can see from the more recent aggregate that has been put in there, ballast. Um, it was continually built up. This was the main ra ra railway line between Johannesburg and uh, Kimberley. So they had to keep it functioning. Um, and the, the trains at that point uh, had to slow down to something like 15 kil kilometers an hour when traveling through this area. Um, so these subsidences developed and they continued to develop and very famously the bank uh, station you can just see the sign over there, that's the station in the background, subsided gradually and the uh, railway line continued to be built up and kept level until um, some decade or two later, the roof of the, the station was at the same level as the railway line. Um, they demolished the station um, a little bit uh, after that, uh, unfortunately, because I thought it was a fantastic illustration of, of uh, the kind of uh, damage uh, and, uh, that was wrought by subsidence in those areas. It's another picture of subsidence to give you some idea of the size of the cracks that opened up. Um, there's a sinkhole uh, just to, on the bottom edge of the, the photograph as well. These areas were devastated by uh, these sinkholes and subsidences. Whole towns, bank in particular, were, became deserted. Fenter's Post was abandoned. Uh, parts of um, Western area and parts of Coltonville were also abandoned. And those areas remain uh, largely, well, Fenter's Post and, and Bank remain ghost towns. It's possible that they'll be developed again at some point in the future. So during this period, um, once it had been established that dewatering by the mines had triggered this problem, and they dewatered because they needed to get to the gold. Um, South Africa at that time was a leading supplier of gold, uh, or the leading supplier of gold in the world. And uh, seeing as most currencies were based on the gold standard, um, it, it was an imperative uh, as a nation for the mines to continue functioning. And they were thus given permission to dewater the area because water was flowing into the mines at such uh, a rate that uh, it was costing them a huge amount of money to pump it out. So what they did was they canalized the, uh, the, the stream that runs across those compartments. I'll show it to you just now. Um, and, and in fact, some of the photographs um, uh, yeah, that is the pipeline carrying the Von der Fontein Sprite. Um, uh, so they effectively picked it up at the eye on the east side and carried the water right across the, the compartments. I'll show you the length of it just now. And then dumped it back into the stream on the west side and then pumped all the water out of these uh, dolomite groundwater compartments. And the compartments are formed by dikes that cut through the uh, dolomite, effectively forming underground uh, barriers, dam walls, if you like. Um, so uh, governance of the Far West Rand was handed over in terms of development, was handed over to this committee. And I, I wrote down the um, initials of the committee because to write down the full name <laughs> would uh, take up a whole slide on its own. It was the State Coordinating Technical Committee concerning sinkholes and subsidences on the Far West Rand. And uh, I was working at the Council for Geoscience, well, the Geological Survey in those days. Uh, in the 1980s, we used to have to make uh, presentations to the committee on any problems that we uh, found. The mines made presentations on the work that they were doing, this, the new sinkholes and subsidences that had developed. And if you wanted to do any development on the Far West Rand, then this committee had to give the OK. Um, in the early phases of, of uh, work done in terms of trying to solve the problem of dolomite, the work was done largely by geophysicists. 
And this was because we were desperately looking for some remote sensing method that would show us where the cavities were and where the sinkholes would uh, develop. Um, and, and, and an intriguing number of, of uh, uh, methods were used. Um, there was, uh, I remember a lecture given in the 80s by a gentleman who came out from uh, the UK who presented a, a um, method involving a sort of a seismic uh, uh, kind of process whereby uh, they believed they could pick up cavities. Unfortunately, it didn't work in South Africa. What the geophysicists did find were, though, was that the gravity surveys, uh, which pick up contrast between rock and, and uh, the much lower density overburden, uh, were very useful in terms of profiling the bedrock. Um, and I'll show you a gravity survey uh, just now. And, and that became um, a way of trying to predict where the sinkholes were going to de develop. And I know that um, uh, a gentleman by the name of Birkus at uh, the Council for Geoscience wrote a paper where showing that the bulk of the um, uh, sinkholes were developing on the slopes of these subsurface uh, valleys or grikes, as we call them, or call them still. Um, and so gravity surveys have pretty much become the standard uh, that we use for geophysical um, investigations. A little bit more of the history. So the last major dewatering event happened in the 1980s, and that was the Schemsbach fontaine compartment. I'll pick it out for you in the next uh, slide. Um, but extensive investigations, I was lucky enough to be involved in some of those, were conducted over this uh, Schemsbach fontaine compartment. Um, areas were identified where uh, movement might occur below roads and, um, and uh, areas where subsidences or sinkholes might develop within um, uh, small holdings, etc., were identified and uh, we were able to avoid uh, any loss of life uh, or significant damage to infrastructure. Um, so that was great. Mean, meanwhile, um, things were developing south of Tuani, and uh, and um, oh, I seem to have missed the slide showing the Far West Rand. I do apologize, but we'll pick it out in a, a later slide. So uh, things were developing south of of uh, Centurion, um, and this is a, a, a small portion of it. In the 1980s, uh, what is now Centurion was all small holdings. Um, and I remember um, uh, people had to apply in those days for a small holding to be turned into um, a new development. And that's why Centurion is full of these um, uh, uh, townhouse developments that are effectively the shape of a small holding. Um, and uh, the application would come through the Council for Geoscience. Uh, a gravity survey had been developed by, uh, had been produced by Dr. Relly um, of that whole area. And we would sit there and look at the uh, area, the small holding, look at the gravity survey, and then pronounce whether it was safe or not to, for them to go ahead. And that was in those days about the limit of the work done to determine whether or not things were safe to develop. Uh, very little detailed investigation was conducted. This area continued to develop and through the 80s and 90s, um, whilst it was still known in fact as for Wurtberg, uh, sinkholes were starting to develop and uh, we, we didn't get to see at the Council for Geoscience, we didn't get to see many of these sinkholes um, because uh, the town engineer who ran uh, for Wittberg's infrastructure, uh, would fill these sinkholes in very rapidly. He wouldn't report them as they would be done now. And, uh, and he is in fact on record, he went on record as saying that there was no such thing as a sinkhole. And the re his reason for doing that was simply that he didn't want to um, inhibit development of, of Wittberg. 
we now know that uh, that there are significant areas within um, Cent Centurion, uh, the renamed for Wurtburg, um, which which do have a lot of problems, and uh, from time to time, uh, sinkholes do develop within that area. Um, so this is the granite uh, in the halfway house dome. This is the oak tree formation, the Monte Cristo formation going up there, and all the dikes and saws that, that uh, cut through and overlie and sandwich the dolomites. Um, I'm not going to spend too much more time on that. Meanwhile, of course, in the 80s and onwards, there was pressure growing uh, to expand the East Strand and Johannesburg. And if you look at dolomite, uh, light blue, and you look at Johannesburg, Midrand, um, the East Rand here, Benoni, Boxburg, uh, and Springs, um, Fosleris and Katlahonga located over here in the uh, uh, little inlier over there. Um, and of course, Mayerton and Ferenikin down here. Um, so any new development, if you want to extend Johannesburg, Soweto, uh, or Fosleris, uh, Davyton, um, uh, uh, um, the area all along the R21, any of those areas which you will see are developing rapidly at the moment, uh, you are expanding into to, uh, uh, dolomitic areas. So there's a lot of pressure uh, from developers to move into these areas. Um, just to go back a little bit, the far west rand, which stretched from there to there, um, the the uh, Kempsbach Fontaine uh, groundwater compartment extended virtually from the e to the east of western area all the way through to Lenaza over here. It's a big sort of roughly triangular shaped um, area, and that was, as I mentioned earlier, dewatered and and uh, fairly successfully. Um, infrastructure and and loss of life was all uh, kept to a minimum damage to infrastructure, that is. Right. <coughs> Excuse me. So in the uh, Fosleris area, we were starting to pick up um, uh, sinkholes. And uh, this, this is the uh, Fosleris police station. Uh, that po portion of the police station has now been demolished uh, because of the sinkholes that, that were developing there. And what we were picking up in those days that were, was that effectively the vast majority of sinkholes and uh, subsidences were developing because of leaking sewer pipes. This in particular in the, uh, the military areas south of Chwani. Um, and yeah, this, this particular sinkhole uh, developed as a result of a leaking sewer pipe. Uh, Dave Buttrick and I actually climbed into this hole over here and found another incipient sinkhole just a bit beyond, which remained as something of a nightmare in my head. And I was convinced at one stage that I dreamt the whole thing until Dave said, said to me the other day, do you remember climbing down that sinkhole and into that one that hadn't developed uh, at Fort Lewis? So it wasn't a dream. It wasn't a nightmare. It was a reality. So there we are. Um, that's the elusive map that should have been earlier on. I've uh, pretty much discussed this. What I do want to point out, however, is this area over here, um, the springs in particular, parts of uh, Boxburg, uh, all appear to be located on non-dolomitic ground, but that is in fact uh, the younger sediments of the, um, the Karoo supergroup, which overlie the much older sediments of the Transvaal and Witwatersrand supergroups. And of course, the dolomite is sometimes very close to surface below uh, the, the, these younger form formations. Right, so how do we develop these areas now? How do we go about developing these areas? Uh, all development on dolomite, dolomite is governed by the SANS 1936, by the regulations and, and through that, the, the law that, that overrides this, uh, San, or, or within which these regu regulations, the building code that within which these regulations have been developed. SANS 1936 requires that any new development, it doesn't matter how big it is or how small it is, 
must be investigated um, uh, in, uh, if the land is regarded as dolomitic. And dolomitic land, just bearing in mind what I said about the Springs area, is regarded as any land where dolomite is uh, within 60 to 80 meters uh, of the surface, um, even if you have 50 meters of Karoo supergroup uh, and then um, dolomite or dolomitic residuum below that, then the land is regarded as dolomitic. Um, so uh, this has required a lot of work in sometimes in areas which have been historically safe, such as springs. Um, and uh, it has caused no end of, of a difficulty for some people. Um, so going about developing dolomitic areas, uh, a hazard assess assessment has to be carried out by qualified um, uh, scientists and engineers, the scientists being uh, engineering geologists for the most part, and the engineers being geotechnical engineers. Um, we'll deal with the, the hazard assessment in a bit more detail just now. And the second um, uh, thing that gets put into place with new developments is that a dolomite risk management system has to be uh, has to be put in place, and that has to be put in place at several levels. So you would have, as a house owner on Dolomite, you would have your own little risk management system, or you should have uh, any development such as a townhouse complex should have a Dolomite risk management system. Uh, the local authority, such as Ekerileni or Twani, should have a Dolomite risk management system as well. Um, and these vary in detail. Uh, uh, at the moment, Ekeruleni uh, probably has the most successful of the uh, Dolomite risk management systems. It's certainly one that I hold up as an example of what can be done or what should be done. Chwani have certainly gone a long way down that road as well. Um, but I won't speak further on that particular matter. Right, so what do we do to find out where the bad areas are? Generally, hazard assessments um, involve geophysical surveys, gravity, and drilling. Uh, those are the two items that, that are usually used. I'll talk a little bit more about some alternatives to those or some additions to those. So there's our uh, gravimeter being read. It's considerably more um, modern than the one I used to read on the far west rand in the 70s. Uh, I used to have to peer into an old warden, which was a cumbersome thing to operate. This uh, has a digital readout, which is significantly different from the little vernier that we had to read our, take our readings off. But having taken your readings and processing them, processed them, uh, a gravity uh, plan gets put together, which shows up anomalies, the, the reds being highs, the blues being uh, lows and the greens something intermediate. We then cite our boreholes according to these anomalies, drilling both the highs and the lows. Um, and we usually use uh, percussion drilling techniques um, because they are the most cost effective. And um, and we we uh, and they're considerably cheaper and faster than uh, other mes other methods such as diamond drilling. In fact, the diamond drillers generally hate drilling in uh, dolomitic areas because the chert, which uh, is in many of the formations, as, uh, which occurs in many of the formations as bands, is highly resistant to weathering. And when located as a gravel within this loose matrix uh, in the residuum, uh, it's exceedingly difficult to drill. Um, and, and so they dislike it. Uh, thoroughly. So the percussion rig is a robust and, and fairly useful tool. This is, the, these are the samples that are laid out, taken every meter. This gentleman sitting in the chair is not relaxing. I promise you, he's the hardest worker of all of these guys. Uh, he records penetration rates per meter, what kind of air and sample return they're getting. Um, he writes up labels, bags the samples. He does a heck of a lot of very useful work. And in fact, we are very, as, a, as an industry, very reliant on the interpretation that this man is making um, when he's recording the, the drilling um, response, if you like, as they drill down. 
Dave Patrick in his PhD in 1992 uh, put forward what is called the method of scenario supposition, effectively a sort of classification system or classification methodology. Um, and this was the process that he envisaged should be carried out. Uh, we've modified it slightly to include a, one more step or in addition to, to one of the steps rather. So he, it basically it's, it's conventional sort of exploration um, uh, processes where you go out to you get your desk study done, you use your remote sensing geophysical tools to zone, give you a preliminary zonation, go out and drill boreholes in your anomalies and then put it all together and evaluate the uh, area, uh, looking uh, as in particular at the nature of the the blanketing material and the, the bedrock uh, morphology. And having looked at all of that and the position of the water table, you then zone the site. I'll show you zoning just now um, and uh, produce a, 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 what would have been called a risk map or a hazard map uh, now is what we term it. And based on that hazard zonation, you then determine um, what kind of development is possible and what density of development is possible. So if you read up in uh, SANS 1936, you will see that there are tables which, um, which uh, put together these, uh, have, uh, have, a, have a matrix rather, with development type uh, going down <clears throat> uh, as, as rows in the, uh, the, the um, table and uh, the columns are assigned to um, the hazard levels and at the intersection of these two you then determine whether or not you're able to develop uh, uh, that particular type of development. So um, and his last step of course is effectively the Dolomite risk management system. <clears throat> So this is our end product, a, a hazard map with the zones showing up um, with a high hazard zone over there, which would not be allowed for development, a certain level of development within our moderate hazard here and with our intermediate uh, zone over here, a slightly different uh, level of, of, of development uh, is required. Having done that, we then go through an approval process um, which uh, is very much dependent on the local uh, authority and how they respond. But typically, if you're dealing with uh, um, Chwani or uh, Ekuraleni, you would need to take your report to the Council for Geoscience. They would uh, have a look at it and issue a letter of comment. And if it's uh, a housing development, residential development, then the NH or NHBRC, the National Home Building Regulation Council would get involved as well, and they would also vet this. Generally, if the CGS has approved this, um, then there's no further problem. They may not approve it. They may turn around and, well, in fact, approve is, is, is not quite the, the right word. They might disagree with your findings. And if they disagree, um, you may well have to go out and conduct further work um, and possibly if the hazard level is high enough um, and the, uh, the development that you requires shunts you into what is called a D4 process, then you may go through, uh, have to go through a peer review process if you want to continue developing that site. Uh, a lot of people would, if it hits the D4 level, actually back off and, and simply leave that, the land empty. Please do note that uh, the hazard, hazard um, plans will quite often define areas as being completely unsuitable for development and that some areas should be kept uh, simply for parkland um, and, and not used or perhaps at best be used for, for open uh, parking. Um, so uh, there's no guarantee that you can get work approved, um, uh, sorry, development approved uh, in, in dolomitic land. And this of course leads to, to quite a few headaches as uh, a number of us have discovered uh, when we've conducted a, an investigation and we have to go back 
to the client and say, I'm sorry, you've bought this land, but you can't actually develop it. You can't put on whatever it is that you desire to put on. Maybe it's suitable for commercial and not residential, but uh, you, you have to rethink um, your, your ideas of developing this land or abandon it altogether. And of course, a fair amount of tension develops between client and consultant at that point. It's, um, it can be quite unpleasant. Right, so can we do more um, than just the, uh, um, the, the conventional gravity survey and, and percussion drilling? And a number of us have started to look at, at alternative investigative techniques. Uh, Dion here, who's, who's uh, completed his MSc on WAD, and that's a sample of WAD over here, that very black soil, low density soil that I was talking about. Um, we, we have successfully managed to look at some areas that were previously uh, considered to be highly hazardous because of the presence of the WAD in the oak tree formation. And we've um, ha ha had a quite a lot of success in freeing them up for development because we've been able to show through auger drilling, through sampling processes, through doing uh, test process, uh, testings such as triaxial testing, we've been able to show that the WAD is actually reasonably competent, capable of supporting the structures on surface and not uh, likely to uh, be easily eroded into any underlying cavities. So um, yeah, uh, there are definitely different techniques uh, gravity surveys uh, can be tweaked. Um, you can put them in at a much closer space grid, five meters instead of the conventional 30 meters in order to um, uh, get a better definition of the uh, Grix uh, in, in shallow dolomite areas. Uh, and similarly, uh, infrared surveys, um, uh, aerial surveys may be able to pick out uh, and define areas of shallow dolomite, uh, which might be slightly easier to develop than the areas where uh, dolomite bedrock is, is deeper. So yes, <clears throat> we can do more. Um, it's often uh, uh, more expensive and, and perhaps more difficult and you need to uh, convince your client that spending the additional money uh, is worth it. Right, uh, that kind of concludes my, my uh, synopsis, very brief one of, of Dolomite and where we're at and the history of how we got there. Um, and I'm going to run you through what I consider to be a fairly amusing little case study, um, which was handed to me uh, by Harold Reber many years ago. I, had, uh, I was working for Harold Reber and Joe De Beer in the 1980s, the early 1980s, and Tony Brink had just brought out his first volume uh, on the engineering geology of Southern Africa. And this is the, the cover of that uh, book, the front and back uh, uh, of the, the, the book. It's a soft cover, which is why it's got, it looks a bit damaged. I'm afraid it's been well used over the years. But uh, Harold walked into my office one day while this was uh, lying on my desk and he looked at the, the picture and he said, oh, that's Weber's Folly. And I said to him, why are you calling it Weber's Folly? And he said, well, I was commissioned to go and uh, do uh, an investigation of the site and put in a foundation design for a radio tower. It was quite a large structure. And uh, so he drilled some holes and he found that when he was drilling in between the pinnacles that you can see here, uh, and they've been exposed here. You can see them far better than he could have seen them at that stage. But he was drilling in between the pinnacles and on the pinnacles and close to the pinnacles. And his boreholes gave him this completely random set of results. Some of them going down and finding bedrock at 20 to 30 meters, encountering cavities, etc. He said he went back to the uh, client and said, look, I'm getting very variable results. I need to drill a few more holes. Um, and so the client gave him a bit more money and he went back and he drilled a few more holes and he was uh, equally per perplexed by the results that he got from those. And he said, embarrassingly, he had to go back and ask for more money. 
And uh, the client at this stage got a little bit annoyed and uh, appointed Tony Brink to investigate the site. And Tony, he says, arrived on site, took one look at it, hired these three laborers, sorry, four laborers, paid them in those days £1.50 each to do the work. And he then got them to expose these pinnacles by hand. And uh, Tony Brink then mapped these pinnacles and proposed a, a solution which involved uh, putting ground beams across, spanning from pinnacle to pinnacle. And the uh, tower was then built on, on top of those ground beams. The solution that had been proposed prior to Tony Brink's very simple ground beam solution was putting down very complex piles, um, large diameter piles, which would have been drilled down in between these pinnacles. Um, they would have had to uh, uh, advance them through very difficult ground, uh, reaching bedrock. They would have then had to go into the bottom of the, the, uh, the, the boring and drill further to prove that they were on bedrock and not sitting on a floater of uh, boulder of, of dolomite. So the, <laughs> the difference uh, in the two solutions and the one that was finally used with the ground beams was quite astronomical, both in terms of difficulty and in terms of cost. And uh, Harold, uh, much to his credit, saw that as a learning experience and passed it on to me and others. That case study is written up. Harold's name, I see, is very sweetly not mentioned by uh, Tony Brink. But if you look in volume one, uh, the, the one that I have pictured, you will find the case study on page 237. And you can see the um, detailed drawings that show uh, the drilling. I think something like uh, 48 boreholes were drilled on that site prior to Tony Brink hiring these um, uh, uh, four laborers to expose the pinnacles and provide a far simpler foundation solution. Um, so yeah, uh, that's uh, that pretty much concludes. Uh, the, well, what I did just want to point out is that there's a substantive difference between an engineering approach and a geological approach. And this is the reason why geologists uh, are so fundamentally useful to the world of um, civil engineering is that we take a look at things like this and we see the pinnacles, we envisage that three-dimensional um, uh, bedrock profile because that's what we're trained to do. So uh, that for me was a, a really fantastic illustration of, of the contribution that geology makes to the world of civil engineering and how we can come up with different solutions to quite complex and difficult problems. So that's me standing on the left there, scratching my beard back when I was 30 odd years old, uh, standing next to the famous Tony Brink and Dave Buttrick's off to the right here, uh, as young as me, and we're looking at a, a sinkhole. And I am probably as nearly puzzled by dolomite and how to deal with it now as I was then. Um, so it is a complex, difficult subject. Uh, to deal with. Um, if I were to try and train somebody to uh, investigate um, uh, dolomitic areas, I would probably uh, need two weeks of lecturing to, to get across all of this experience, uh, all the different techniques, the approaches that work, the different kind of ter terrain, the different sorts of techniques um, that, that one can apply. So, right, that concludes my presentation. If there are any questions, then um, I'm quite happy to, to take them, or comments for that matter. Tony, thank you very much for this. Um, a very interesting presentation. I'll open the floor uh, to questions. Uh, I'm sure there will be some. I'm very pleased to hear that geologists are useful occasionally. So thank you for that. I, I, I use every opportunity that I can to disengineers. I, I love them; they're wonderful people. But uh, you know, they, they 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 sometimes believe they're the be and be be all and end all, and uh, uh, they are the rare chaps like um, 
the PD day, uh, we acknowledge that we are a useful bunch, um, but it's nice to be able to see, particularly in this area, I, I think um, in Dolomites, that uh, geologists make a, a really significant contribution. All right, I'll open the floor to questions for this talk, for Tony specifically first, and then uh, for any of the other speakers as well, if you've got any. Um, maybe I can open with a question of my own. Uh, I'm not very familiar with the, with the dolomite stratigraphy, uh, but my understanding is that the dolomite units are fairly thick units. Are they, can they be differentiated into, into um, members that maybe are more or less prone to sinkhole formation? Or is that uh, not a possibility? Um, uh, for a long, long time, the, uh, many of us have held that the basal unit, the oak tree formation uh, is, is in fact, uh, has a lot fewer sinkholes uh, within it. And certainly the research that Dion and myself and um, Peter Day have been conducting uh, within the oak tree formation is tending to show that it has far, far fewer sinkholes and that it, it because it's a church free um, uh, uh, formation uh, and possibly also because it's right at the bottom of all the, the, uh, uh, the, the heap of dolomite it, uh, it, it, it seems to be a lot safer. We, we don't see many sinkholes, in fact, very, very few within the oak tree formation. But it is the only one of the, the formations that I would single out as being uh, relatively free of, of sinkholes. It does contain very thick um, layers of wad. Uh, and we've, uh, for, for quite some time, uh, been uh, trying to show that wad on its own is not necessarily a big problem. Um, and that it's once we get the chert, chert rich uh, residuum um, that we start to get sinkholes developing. I mentioned in that uh, earlier picture of a, of a sinkhole, I, I, I don't know if you remember it, but there was no wad visible in those side walls. And uh, even, even in the one that I showed, uh, of uh, myself and Tony Brink and Dave Patrick standing on the edge of the uh, sinkhole. There's no wad visible there, but there is a great deal of chert gravel intermingled with red, uh, quite clay soils, which you would expect to be fairly um, impermeable, but the gravel uh, added in seems to increase the impermeability quite substantially and therefore possibly its erodibility. So our theory uh, is that the oak tree formation is relatively safe um, and better to develop on and that the, uh, the uh, formations above which are generally uh, uh, chert have, have many chert bands within them are, are um, more prone to having sinkholes develop. Yeah that's an important consideration. Fiona you've got your hand up. Yeah um uh, Tony, I have a question about the water table in areas where development ha has already been established. Presumably, it becomes important to monitor um, underground water use in the development areas on known dolomites already. Is that in place? Is that, is that a correct assumption? And is it in place? Uh, sorry, you say the last sentence again, Fiona? Um, my question is, in areas where there's already development on top of dolomites, presumably the water table is quite an important factor. So is that being monitored in areas where there is development already over the dolomites? Yeah, it, it, it's a highly contentious issue. Um, it, it, the, as I mentioned right at the beginning, the water table is the base level of erosion. So when we're doing our analysis, if the water table is above uh, bedrock uh, and above your cavities, therefore, um, it effectively inhibits the development of sinkholes. So areas where we have a shallow water table, um, for example, springs, um, portions of uh, the... Um, uh, 
the inlier in which uh, Phosphorus is, is located. Um, those areas uh, often don't have sinkholes developed. But were we to draw the water table down, they would be, we would have a, a catastrophe. So it is an exceedingly important to monitor the water table and all, all new investigations tend to, tend to, to, to state that it must be monitored if, if it's present. Um, and, and in fact, all of our investigations, hazard investigations have to consider two scenarios. The first scenario is what happens if we simply have a leaking water pipe under current conditions? Um, and then what happens if the water table gets drawn down, if it gets pulled down? And usually we'll find that if the water table is above bedrock, the hazard level increases substantially. Um, so quite often, and this, this is the problem in the Springs area, is that quite often within areas that have, that have been developed for decades, um, which have housing and, and uh, uh, commercial developments on them, the dewatering scenario uh, indicates that it's highly hazardous um, and that development can't be allowed. What, and and the, the big difficulty was with this, and, and, and I was discussing this with uh, um, Sifiso and Gubalanga from the CGS uh, just yesterday, was is, is that we can monitor the water table. The local authority can monitor the water table, but they're not in a position to prevent or regulate the extraction of water. Um, and this, for example, triggered the major sinkholes in the Buxfontein area. In fact, one of the uh, photographs, I don't know if anyone noticed it at the top of Peter Day's presentation, uh, is, is a photograph of a massive sinkhole, which we all refer to as the Buxfontein sinkhole. Um, and that was triggered by a local farmer pumping excessively uh, from the, the, the dolomite groundwater and, and this huge sinkhole developed. Luckily, no loss of life. Um, the, the, it was about 50 meters from a small informal settlement. So it was uh, quite quite fortuitous that the settlement hadn't been a little bit, little bit further east across the road, quite literally. But, um, but yes, uh, to answer your question, exceedingly important to monitor the, the groundwater table, but the regulation of how to, uh, of, of who is allowed to abstract water and how much they're allowed to abstract rests at the moment with the Department of Water Affairs. And they're in, if anybody has uh, had anything to do with the uh, water affairs, they are notoriously in a bad place. They are not really able to monitor and prevent abstraction of, of groundwater. In fact, they uh, have lost huge numbers of their monitoring boreholes within the dolomitic areas. Um, and it's now largely the, uh, local authorities and individual developers and developments that monitor the groundwater table. So some developers like uh, M&T development, for example, have something like 40 or 50 boreholes within their areas that they develop or have developed, which they monitor on a monthly basis. But that is not going anywhere. It, it's not going to any authority who's um, then putting together the bigger picture and saying, oh, heck, we've got drawdown over here. We need to go and find out what's happening and, and can we stop it. So it's, it's a very complicated um, issue at the moment. And, uh, and uh, yeah, at the moment, no solution in sight, um, but yeah, oh, monitoring the groundwater table, establishing where it is and what it's doing is absolutely fundamental to the st stability of these dolomitic areas where, where the water table is above the dolomite bedrock. Thanks, Are there Tony. any other? If it, sorry, Craig, if I, if I may just quickly comment. That I really appreciate that answer, and it's something I'm interested in myself because there's been such. It appears to me that in recent years, a lot of people are choosing to extract their own water, especially in rural areas um, where there's a lack of supply of water for one or other reason. The dams are drying up, or something's happened. 
And I just wondered what the, the sort of regulation around that was. So I really appreciate the answer, thanks. Yeah. So, so the, the municipalities like Twani and uh, I think Ikarileni as well, try to prevent uh, people from putting boreholes in. Um, I know we're dealing with uh, Serengeti uh, estate at the moment, and they have now written into the, um, what would you call it, the, uh, the regulations that govern the estate, that nobody may put in uh, boreholes and, and pump from them. What we have found, though, geohydrologists that I've spoken to have said, look, the, 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 the average small uh, homeowner located within a suburb doesn't abstract a, a huge amount of water and, in fact, um, is not likely to have a massive impact on, on, a, on a dolomite groundwater table. What we have found, though, is that uh, golf courses, for example, driving ranges, people who abstract large quantities of water uh, over very short periods, they, we've seen quite significant drawdown, uh, 10, 15 meters sometimes um, as a result of them pumping. So, what, yeah, it, it is, it's a big problem. Um, and, and Chwani itself abstracts quite a lot of water from the uh, Dolomite aquifers uh, to the south of, of Chwani. And they do monitor those wells and they do uh, contain them as far as possible. Are there any other questions or comments? Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Tony. How are you? Uh, it's Olympus again. I think uh, I did mention the, or uh, try to ask the question in the beginning of the of the of the, of the workshop, and you said uh, we can you can come up uh, we can you can come to it uh, at a later stage uh, during this time, uh, I suppose. Uh, what I wanted to ask is. Uh, I saw on the last uh, pages of your presentation that you showed something of interest uh, where you were investigating a site where there were some uh, pinnacles. Uh, so I wanted to know uh, if uh, you have a site and uh, it's, it's something like that, there's, there's a bedrock on the site, but on the other portion of the site, there's no, there's nothing actually. So you can't see anything uh, with, with, you, with, your, with, your, with your eyes on surface. So, uh, what we actually did is that we drilled where the bedrock is going down for, uh, for where the dolomite bedrock is going down for approximately 28 meters. And we drilled where we, could, we couldn't see the, at the bedrock for 60 meters. And we found the, it was dolomite on the first pole, it was dolomite up until uh, 28 meters. So that's where we, we stopped. And we also drilled where we couldn't see the bedrock up to we uh, there were there was the profile the profile school that's in like they were a uh, dolomite sodium up for of eight meters from uh, the surface and uh, from eight meters up until 60 meters it was all a uh, dolomite so what i wanted to find from you is uh, do you think that will be sufficient information to treat the site uh, in terms of dolomite stability investigation that's first and uh, uh, which foundations? Uh, I think uh, you just slept my it slept my mind where you were speaking about these things uh, on the, on your last slide. Uh, which type of foundations is this suitable for this kind of uh, environment, at least for a double story or single story uh, uh, structures? Um, okay, first, your first question: the number of boreholes is that sufficient? Uh, that depends entirely on how. Uh, large the area is, and if you look at Sands 1936, it has a, um, a, a table which uh, gives you an, an indication of how many boreholes per hectare you should be drilling, um, uh, yeah. which varies yeah. depending Tony? on the, the size of the of the borehole. Sorry to cut you short. The the size of the of the of the of the, of the site was. Uh, 1,500 square meters. Okay, so it's very small. And, uh, so, yeah, and the proposed development is a residential uh, house. Okay, so two boreholes would usually be sufficient for that. And then depending on how you've characterized the overburden and whether you've concluded that it's a high risk of sinkholes developing and what size of sinkhole, um, you would then determine what kind of foundation to use. And it would probably be a, a reinforced concrete raft foundation of some kind. 
um, but you you would need to uh, get that passed by the Council for Geoscience and the NHBRC as well. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Zan. Okay, so usually what is stipulated is if you determine that you have a potential sinkhole size of uh, five meters, then you would uh, uh, instruct your engineers to design a reinforced concrete raft that is capable of spanning a five meter loss of support um, or possibly a little bit larger to give you a, a, a factor of safety. Um, and uh, they would then design accordingly. Um, I'd, I'd like to thank our speakers for putting out a, a really good show today. Um, the idea was to get geologists, um, traditional geologists exposed to engineering geology, which is, which is definitely a growth area in the, on the entire planet, I think. Um, a few points came out to me during the course of the day. I wasn't in every meeting, every, every talk, but one of the things that came through to me very clearly was the cross-disciplinary nature of, of this sort of work. Um, and it's only, it's only getting more cross-disciplinary. And it also includes interaction with the regulatory authorities. So there's issues of whether the regulatory authorities have the competence to do what they're supposed to do, whether the professional community has all the competencies and so forth. Um, so that's, that's a very, very important point that came out to me. There was uh, some discussion around professional registrations and the uh, confused nature of some of that. Maybe some of these um, registration parameters or requirements need to change. And maybe that means some of the, um, the way that this stuff is taught in universities needs to be changed a little bit too. A third point that came out for me was the effects of climate change. And that's very possibly a factor in the collapse of the Miami building uh, two or three weeks ago, which we've all been watching on television. Uh, and finally, I was, I was really impressed. Uh, there's, there's geotech instrumentation and technology that's becoming more and more sophisticated and presumably more available. So I think that's only a good thing. Those are the um, key points that came out to me. I'm sure there's plenty more. Um, I would like to, before we close, thank our sponsors for these, these series of events. We have um, three annual sponsors, UCP Africa, Geo Explorasaur, and Max Geo. And for this particular event, um, I'd also like to thank Knight Pizzol, um for sponsorship support and, and also support of the speakers who um, um, participated in this. So thank you very much. Um, I'll leave the meeting open for a couple of minutes uh, if people want to network uh, and, and speak to one another and I'll, I'll shut the meeting down in about five. So thank you very much. Good night all.